to the future. And this is a really neat opportunity because, you know, as America's data agency, we are committed to and justice program that we have been leading on. Really concerned about it is just making sure that our data and real sec private sector innovators, which Dana Boyd obviously has innovators, to help us. In a humble way, we have said we cannot do everything. We don't know the user groups. We don't have the ability to go and scope every, every solution, but you do. So help and be more proud. Help take it open and public good. Just so others who aren't with Kaggle, where they will be putting commerce data sets before a data science community of 700,000 data scientists. Ephesoft uh, is a small company machine learning data that the unstructured use wise and cut the data very, very quickly. These are the kinds of things that we're trying to take that data the last mile and make usable projects and products by leveraging expertise that we don't have. Uh, Data.world is doing a very similar thing, and I will talk about that later. And we even had uh, Wolfram and Stephen Wolfram coming to the floor, being willing to put our data up on his platform and hosting an open coding session to start solving our problems. And there are more. Over the next couple of months, you will see one after another companies stepping forward as you get the flywheel turning and they see the opportunity to help to really leverage their expertise to get the, uh, the multiplier effect. Uh, we're really proud about where that's taking us. Um, our efforts are starting to really get recognized. FedScoop awarded um, uh, our team, including Jeff Chen, uh, the award for federal leadership. Uh, the academy that we run had Fed Program of the Year. The Commerce Data Usability Project won Innovation of the Year. Jeff himself was, uh, was uh, named as one of our next generation leaders. I think there's a fancier title, uh, Ellen, you can tell us. But, uh, it gives you a sense that our program uh, really has been led by visionaries like Ian and Jeff and others who have elevated our program and taken it up to another level. Uh, we have also really relied on our outside advisors, our outside board of advisors like our, uh, uh, our CDAC. Inside the Commerce Department, we have uh, begun a data e uh, executive council which is career level leadership all across the day regularly with is what we've been doing trying to share what we want to share how you can do it from an operational and from an advocacy perspective we want to share what worked and what didn't and center by doing that uh, the last thing I'll cover at a very high level, and I'll tell you, I feel very good about that. First of all, my deputy, uh, Brad Burke, our deputy undersecretary, uh, who's sitting at the back of the room, is a terrific leader, completely, uh, completely uh, part, my partner uh, on being a strategic leader on the issues of data, and he is going to be a terrific leader for our data pillar in transition and getting our new teams up to speed. Jeff Chen, who had been our chief data scientist, is now our deputy chief data officer and will be the leader of our uh, commerce data service again in transition because uh, Ian and I are both political appointees. Uh, we have focused on um, projects and dollars, making sure that we have the funding, uh, and we have um, So, um, I, I'm looking forward later on today to share the things we're worried about, our, our risks of execution, our risks on hiring, uh, and to get input from you on where we are on institutionalization. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is just briefly introduce um, Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker. Uh, Penny, uh, from our perspective especially, 
your focus on uh, having data be part of your core strategic pillar has been a really strong driver uh, of where we are today. Um, Secretary Pritzker had the vision to make this one of our focuses to really drive us to innovate, to push, to use uh, some of the tools that the president has given us in hiring authorities to leverage uh, issues around the government. Uh, one of my favorite uh, commencement speeches uh, was one in which the speaker stood up and said, uh, in total for the speech, <laughs> down. Thank you for, uh, first of all, coming to the fifth meeting of the Commerce Data Advisory Council, but more importantly, thank you for your guidance has been invaluable. And if you come away with nothing else you have done, to help ideas have helped to make us a stronger to all of us. Uh, you've really just made a measure in that has value extraordinary to the value of this tool. But I was very excited about it. In fact, I wanted I was fooling around with the whole thing. Uh, but it's a tool that basically takes census data in a completely by gender, people inside uh, of our and um, uh, without this kind of uh, skills, we're not giving people. Fit Journalists, programmers, students, and businesses to explore what commerce data reveals. Uh, Washington Hackathon. One participant used this tool to investigate what happens to local schools when neighborhoods gentrify early voting. robust open data infrastructure through partnerships, something that you all recommended that we really uh, focus our efforts on. And partnerships not only across government, but also across the private sector. Um, so this uh, BEAR library, B-E-A-R, uh, <laughs> we are the And, it, you know, it, the Opportunity Project, by leading the Opportunity Project, Commerce is bringing local governments and businesses like Zillow and Redfin uh, together to integrate open data sets uh, and create tools that increase economic mobility. Philadelphia Opportunity Project is providing within their communities. You also recommended that we make our commerce data more accessible. So the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has been a leader in this regard by making its 225 years of data easy project called Patent Bureau's Institutional Muscle Memory. Uh, and we're making progress on this. Uh, today, you'll hear about the search string analysis product and how it enables our patent examiners to use a more powerful Google-like search tool um, and go to administration's government and better visualize where federal grant dollars are going and the impact that they're having on communities. I could keep going for a very <laughs> long time, but I won't do this. But what I want of how you've helped us and our team uh, at Commerce dramatically modernize and expand access to our data. Um, what's critical is we institutionalize the CDAC um, to ensure that this innovation doesn't stop. And uh, 
that it continues well into future administrations. And so today, I know that we're gonna consider, and I would ask you to think about how could CDAC uh, be, strength, you know, be strengthened going forward? For example, what skill sets should we be looking for in future applicants to the committee? You know, how can we make the best use of your talents and experience? What are process improvements that we might make? And what are the challenges? There's lots of work to do. I mean, I think we should feel really good about the progress, but we know we're really only at this sort of first or second inning of, uh, so up in my conversation right now. But the point being that for all that we've accomplished so far, there's just a lot more that can be done. And every uh, as uh, your role as chief of staff. And I want to because uh, you know, it takes a village for us to do what we've done, uh, but you've helped parts of our Thanks so much and getting the pre-briefs as well. Uh, but Daniel, I thought maybe you could lead us in a conversation around some of the recommendations that uh, your colleagues have made. You know, I think you know, the first step was, you know, as you mentioned, Austin, you know, really helping lead this effort and, and you know, bringing together the CDAC itself. Um, but it was, you know, the, the data pillar, I think, first got everyone here interested in asking, you know, what you know, how, how did this get so high up in, in this government agency? What are they doing? This sounds really interesting and different than everyone else. We want to be a part of that. And then, you know, we got here in that first meeting, and, um, you know, there were a number of meetings. We tried to refine how we do them. We tried to provide, um, I think, very uh, direct and specific feedback on certain programs um, that we don't need to get into now. But we've also had some very consistent large themes about how do we make this work um, and how do we, how do we, um, how do we really change you know, the future of this agency and department. So the first recommendation that we had, we, we sat down to, to put together a, a briefing here, was institutionalizing the data initiative. And, and this is a theme that's come up a lot today. Uh, and this was a theme that I think came up even on that first day, where we said, you know, we don't, uh, we want to see this happen, but we also want to make sure it doesn't end, end here. And so there's a lot that we can talk about here. Um, I think as we're talking about, you know, where we are right now in, in terms of the transition, one of the big questions is how do we how do we just make sure everyone knows about you know the, the kind of the genius that's happened here? How do we make sure that um, this is well recognized not only within the department itself but across federal agencies, um, across um, you know members of Congress throughout the administration, um, and even just more broadly in the public? And so you know we've we've had some conversations about that, but I'd like that to be one of our our kind of um, key discussion points as we move forward here. Um, the second recommendation we have is, is around evolving the commerce data service itself. I remember that second meeting when Ian came and um, said I have some big news here and <laughs> he, he started walking us through what had been done since that last meeting with the commerce data service. We were all very excited about that initiative and had a lot of feedback even then and it's been great to see how it's evolved uh, with Jeff coming on and, um, and the other Jeff as well um, and, and just the whole team that we met um, at the last meeting. Uh, there's been a number of really good projects coming out of that. Um, but consistently, I think we've, we've asked to see a few things. One, um, we said, you know, let's, let's start small, let's, let's do some pilots, let's experiment. Um, but we also said we need to have some moonshots here. We need to think about how do we really show impact. And I think that's something we also might want to spend a little bit of time talking about right now is, is what might those moonshots look like and how can we, um, you know, how can we really help raise the visibility of this project um, through those types of initiatives. Um, and the Data Academy, specifically, is something that I think um, all of us have been very excited about. Workforce issues have come up uh, quite frequently. And you know, we've seen the Data Academy as something that could be modeled across the rest of federal government. And we'd like to um, recommend that, that that really be a, a key um, part of the Commerce Data Service. Uh, beyond that, um, again, going back to even that first meeting, there was this question about, are we using data to measure what we're doing within the, the data service? So there were questions about what kind of metrics are we using? Do we really know the customer? How do we engage with users, whether they're business users um, or individual citizens? 
um, or other partners. And we've seen some evolution there, and I think that's going to continue to be an area of focus in our meetings where we're, we're asking questions about how we can do that better, how we can bring the lessons from the private sector to bear here. Um, in your remarks this morning, you talked a lot about some of the partnerships. Um, there's been great ones with pretty much uh, every company in this room, I think. Um, and, and that's, I think, been one of the biggest um, successes of you know the CDAC itself, and the, um, but also just you know the future of, of how this could work. Um, you know the Commerce Department has clearly said we're open for business when it comes to data. Um, come partner with us. And just recently, with um, you know the the, the new um, joint uh, research initiatives, the, the Creda's, you know all of those really interesting, innovative uh, approaches to partnering with the private sector, I think have opened new opportunities. We've we've discussed that quite a bit here as well. Um, and finally, there's the CDAC itself and, and the role of the CDAC going forward and how we can continue to be useful. Um, I think in this area, uh, we certainly have some suggestions. We've tried to, and I think everyone in this room has seen how we've evolved the agenda and um, iterated each time, trying to really be able to dig in much more deeper on certain projects now that we have more knowledge. Um, but we're also open to suggestions on, on how we can be more effective. But we do think that it is um, a valuable tool for continuing to bring in new outside insights here. Um, so. Uh, let me stop there because this is a very talkative group and we want to make sure everyone can uh, weigh in. Um, but those, were the, those are our main recommendations here. Um, I think various people might want to weigh in on some specifics. So if you want to go ahead and put your tent up, we'll jump into that discussion. Either one. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so glad commerce is taking data so seriously, and I think it's fantastic. And one of the things that I go with, um, we've been struggling with security issues for a very, very long time. And I know that they're part of your conversation um, and trying to think through, because even, even as good work is being done, there's a lot more to be done for each and every one of us. But there's another threat that I think is coming that I don't think we're paying enough attention to, and I think that the industry's struggling with it, and I'm... I want to raise it as, a, as something I think you need to start struggling with as well, which is the degree to which data is starting to get manipulated. Once, once data is taken seriously, once it has the level of power and the level of opportunity and businesses depend on it, we see a moment where people are starting to manipulate it for a variety of different reasons, economic, political, social. And one of the challenges is that I don't think that we have the structures in place to even know when these systems are being manipulated. And I don't know that we ha have the mindset to think through why somebody would try to manipulate NOAA data. Um, we can look at the political reasons for manipulating census, but some of these things are going to be <coughs> invisible for us. So one of the things I'm curious, from your perspective, what do you think commerce is and can do to start preparing, not just for the security risks, which in some ways are obvious and challenging, but for the manipulation risks? Um, why don't I, you know, given that we run a lot of statistical agencies, why don't I turn this over to that question to Justin? So first, uh, Dana, I think it's a great question, and it's one that we actually focus on all across our agency. Uh, when you run statistical agencies and scientific agencies with real questions that we have to be able to answer at any time around scientific integrity, statistical integrity. There are many, many processes, checks, outside researchers that are really looking at our data that give us a lot of confidence in it. That doesn't mean we're sanguine about it. And um, we obviously understand that there's risks and people who might want to manipulate or get into the system. But let me, let me give you an example. On the, on the statistical front alone, um, we have career long-term statisticians that work on our efforts to generate our core economic statistics. It's insulated in many, many different ways from any political interference. Uh, even the, um, when we calculate GDP, uh, for example, the calculations are compartmentalized so that each person, each group in BEA has their view of their line, but it comes together only at the very end in a way that the career team uh, leads that and has led it for uh, a long time. And they get visibility into what the number is only at the last minute. And political leadership, for example, on that number only gets it right before it's uh, publicly released, but we actually get it after it's gone to journalists. 
They do a lot to make sure that the statistical processes that we use are publicly known, well available, and can't be changed unless you give notice three times before the release so that you get comment and insight. And we have all, including the Secretary, has really made this clear. If you see a problem, if you see something where somebody is trying to game the system, let us know. We have an Inspector General who is very um, aware of things like this, and there are lots of different outlets where you can raise your hand. I can tell you NOAA, having worked with NOAA, and Ed Kearns is here, one of our leaders on big data, takes the issue of scientific integrity incredibly seriously, including having uh, our leadership at NOAA stand up when there was some suggestion of getting into information that might chill own honest and open conversation and sharing of information. Uh, you've seen leadership across the department being willing to stand up and say, no, we're, we're gonna take those bullets. You need to be able to, as scientists, share openly what you need to do to get your job done. And if there's somebody who's uh, challenging our process, our leadership at NOAA and here at the department have been willing to stand up. Um, I also think one last thing is on a lot of our products, we are hoping and challenging the private sector to let us know if we got it wrong. I mean, one of the things about our core statistical products that you all know is this presents some challenges when we're looking to the goal of trying to use private data sources, and we can talk about that later. But on our own statistical products, we open up the underlying analysis and we invite under researchers, come and test it, make sure we got it right. And you'll see the same uh, on the scientific front. When you see, uh, you, you'll see outside experts that our team engages with in an open way, in a scientifically uh, integrated uh, sound way to make sure that, hey, we're, there's nothing, look at the underlying data, look at our analysis, question it, use the scientific method. Um, so we're trying, we've built in a lot of protections, we have a very career driven line with a lot of protections. Uh, I understand in the macro there's still things we need to be looking for and we're hoping that the outside experts who come in and test our analysis point it out when we're missing something. Export what you've learned over many years of doing this because I think the industry is struggling with it in ways that could actually learn a lot from what you have done, what has worked and what has not. That's great, I'm, and we're happy That's to. That's a big idea. It is. Actually, for, for us to take the lessons learned over time about integrity of data and what processes we use to ensure that. We're always looking, we're not, uh, we're always open to improving ourselves as well, but we've learned a lot because there's so much relies upon what we do. Right, right. That's a great point. I think it's Colin. Colin. Yep. Uh, Yes, uh, I think uh, Dana raises a great point, but I also think the Commerce Department may be at the core of solving the problem. As we open many of these new interfaces, if we can apply some of the deep learning techniques that exist out there and tie some of those to a variety of sources of data, I can actually determine manipulation because I can use other data sources to correlate against anything someone says. You know, it could be census data, pattern data, commerce data, and the correlation of those could actually show that this data was manipulated. This data is divergent. I think they're looking at these things that occur, because I have no doubt that data is correct, it will occur, and if we could be the ones not only using the expertise, but using our data sets to begin to do that using deep learning or reinforced learning, I think we could, we could provide another sort of bastion of strength for the world delivered from the government here at the Commerce Department. Something to think about. One of the big benefits that we have is, you know, as we're trying to modernize as well as acquire, you know, new technology, technological capabilities, is with NTIS we have the opportunity to partner uh, with different organizations. So if you, as you're thinking about foundations for us, and that, and we're also, you know, these including AI, opening our data, we're also very conscious of put, making sure the protections are in place to make sure it's done right. So de-identification, the fact that at Census, John and his team have one of the leading experts on de I mean, it's, it really speaks volumes for the leadership that this, and really doing. So uh, there's a data cabinet that exists created by the White House, and obviously there's opportunities on that cabinet, uh, EPA, DOL, 
you know, Department of Labor and uh, others. Um, and what we're trying to do is have better collaboration. But this is where you could make recommendations as to going forward, you know, how do we play a greater interagency leadership role on, in the data cabinet? And so that's things for maybe you to help us think about what we ought to be focused on in that respect. But first, we had to get our house more in order, and <laughs> I think uh, uh, I think we've done a lot of that. But you know, thank you, Katya. Moonshots, and I know USPTO was involved in uh, making a difference for the cancer moonshot. And I wonder what other um, moonshots might be uh, relevant for bundling some of the good forces which have been summited here. Um, one that comes to mind is jobs. I think it's very, very important to train the next generation and the existing generation to uh, fulfill all these um, data science and other um, high-tech jobs. And I think uh, it's not just uh, academic settings that are always interested to hire the best um, programmers and not always succeeding if they are competing with Amazon and Google and others, but uh, it's also companies which need more and more well-trained um, workforce. And of course, it's also government which have to fill these important roles um, that, that you need for the CDAC effort, for instance. Um, as you might realize, there are other agencies here in town, like uh, yesterday I attended an NSF um, workshop on uh, graduate uh, student education investments and STEM career experience and outcomes, and there's a major interest to showcase in a data-driven way what these um, investments result in, anything, but also, also not just um, professional success. Much of the data that's needed to uh, really make a difference um, is in the uh, Census Bureau, it's in the Department of Labor, and it's also in some of the companies which are here and, and others which are not here around the table. So I think that could be a very, very uh, valuable effort, especially if you can communicate the results of these analysis to everyone outside of this building um, so that they can plan their lives and their trajectories um, more uh, intelligently in a smart way using uh, brick and mortar universities um, like Indiana University where I work and many others, but also using the many online resources and using, of course, also the Commerce Data Academy and, and other uh, opportunities that now exist. And so I think that would be a very, very valuable um, moonshot um, to discuss. I would just say a couple of things. Places where we've used our data is, for example, we had a hackathon called Hack the Pay Gap that created tools to help um, both individuals and organizations understand the uh, 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 disparities within their own organizations as uh, uh, pay, as well as helping uh, tools got created that help uh, one advocate for more equal pay. There were a number of tools created that were really valuable. Um, in terms of moonshot ideas, I think, you know, we, we're always looking for uh, 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 new projects and new thoughts as to where data could help uh, uh, with great insights. Um, the Opportunity Project is obviously serving uh, in some respects to help us there, but, you know, we need help. Uh, doing two things, really. One, um, as it relates to workforce training and education, uh, clarifying what is that, both content-wise, and then how do we get the word out. And then in general, we need help amplifying what we're doing. Sure. Yes, um, in the weather community, sometimes we hear voices in Congress and elsewhere saying, um, why isn't NOAA or the Weather Service charging companies for the data that um, the people pay to produce? Um, so, so my question is, do you anticipate the pressure to monetize uh, commerce data? Do you anticipate that that will grow? And what's your response to that? Um, you have to anticipate the pressure as federal dollars are scarce. And, um, and uh, the question I would put back to this group is, you know, we're, what we're trying to do is take a public good and make it more available today. 
the question becomes, are there service models or fee-for-service models that make sense? And how do they make sense in the context of the fact um, that there are some public goods that we need to make sure are available and affordable, like the weather, which is absolutely critical, not just so that we know what to, you know, whether we need a jacket or not, but frankly for protecting lives and property because we have many severe weather events that cause billions and billions of dollars of damage as well as uh, unfortunately uh, at times take lives. And so we need to have that balance of our, of our uh, roles, if you will. But I think that's something that merits a con you know, more conversation among this group. Because I think we can't, you know, there will be a limit. There's a limit to our resources uh, as to what we can do. Uh, uh, I think what we're trying to demonstrate to everyone is what's possible, but we'll only be able to sort of be on the surface with the resources that we have. I don't know if you think about it differently. No, no, honestly, we're, we're, we are, we're, we think about um, the issues around and pressure we may get to, to charge. And I think we're trying to prove out that the multiplier effect from getting the data out will grow the economy, will multiply and save lives in a way that um, proves it up. Um, but, but I think it'll be an issue. I'm gonna have to go in a few minutes. Sure. Um, so I want to make sure, I just wanted to respond, if you don't mind, to your recommendations, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Um, you know, first of all, uh, if I can just take a minute to do that, you know, institutionalizing our data efforts is absolutely a priority, and um, we're trying to make sure that the Commerce Data Service has sufficient funding infrastructure and um, concrete bureau-driven projects so that uh, we go forward. We also need to focus on uh, not only supporting our current team, but also continuing to add talent uh, and then uh, making sure that we get our product out. A place where we're, we've made progress, but there's much more work to be done, I think, is marketing and branding our work. And so uh, it's critical for our long-term success that this effort is amplified. And so thoughts and ideas about how to do that would be useful. Um, you know, uh, we've created three uh, organizations internally that will transcend administration's first department. Um, then we have the Economic Statistics Improvement Board, which is where BEA and census directors meet to discuss ways to better collaborate and improve our statistical products. And third is the Commerce Data Service, which is this new, it's now permanent and supported by ESA. Um, you know, those are, obviously there's more that we can do, but these are major steps we've taken towards institutionalization. As it relates to the Commerce Data Service, you know, we're very proud of, of, of uh, the service. It's nimble, it's a startup. Um, uh, that hasn't been easy to get up and going. And uh, um, we're proud of, frankly, the team there and the volume of work that they produced with, frankly, a limited number of folks. Uh, it's really extraordinary. That's permanent. We need, we now have funding from the bureaus uh, and offices across the department that recognize the value of the Commerce Data Service and said they're willing to, we have a political chief data officer and a career deputy chief data officer um, and uh, they have a great team. So that helps uh, uh, and their team of, you know, data scientists, engineers and coders is critical, but to be honest, uh, and we also have back office support uh, with ESA's assistance, but hiring is a real challenge. We need, um, you know, we have a, year, uh, a senior data science lead. Uh, we're looking for folks who would commit like one to three years uh, appointments, and we'd like to see a steady stream of folks coming. You could help us get the word out. Frankly, you see the exciting product that comes out of this 
small but mighty organization and the exciting work that they can do and the partnerships that exist within the department as well as externally. So I hope you'll help us get that word out about the opportunity. You know, my dream is ultimately there's a flow of people both in the digital and in the data world that are coming from the private sector or nonprofits into government for a few years and going out um, and that companies and other organizations view that as valuable uh, to have this kind of um, uh, interface with their talented uh, people because uh, frankly it, it will always be hard for the government to compete with the private sector in the most cutting edge uh, areas and so we look for your support of that kind of, uh, uh, of frankly people coming from your organizations and others to do stints in the government to help us you know, not just do it here at Commerce, but frankly help lead the rest of, of federal government. Um, in terms of better measuring uh, customer metrics, uh, developing customer metrics, we're continuing to look at options. Um, many of our data sets are available in bulk, and we don't have <coughs> visibility into how the data is being used after it's accessed. Um, we've asked our leadership to focus on measurement of, uh, of usage of our data in the coming months, we don't have a solution for that. Uh, and so if you have thought, you proposed a labs concept. Um, uh, right now our work is very <coughs> much driven by the demand of the bureaus because they're our funders. Um, but we will be doing its own research. Uh, uh, the ability for NTIS to do these partnerships is an opportunity maybe to do some of the research that you would like to see us do in your labs concept. Uh, concept. Uh, finally, um, you know, ha seeing the CDAC grow and continue is um, uh, absolutely critical. And so your willingness either to serve or to make, to tell others that this is a valuable way to spend time uh, for a couple of years, it will be very helpful to us. You've been a tremendous resource. And I commit that our team, uh, Justin, Burton, Jeff, Austin, uh, 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 and others will continue to work with you. I wanna close by saying though, the person who actually makes this happen every, you know, every time you meet is Tanya White. And I don't, where's Tanya? <laughs> <laughs> We need, you know, Tanya is, is, is really the glue that pulls these meetings together that supports um, not only the Commerce Data Service but the CDAC. And so thank you, Tanya, for all of your great work. Uh, with that, you're in great hands with the team. I really appreciate everything that you've done. Um, you've really helped us put Commerce's data um, front and center in the open data initiative. So, and our efforts front and center. So thank you very much. Secretary, thank, thank you very you. much. We're gonna take a short break now. We'll be reconvene about 10, 10.05.
Jeff, hey, Jeff, can you guys just give us just a, a little bit of room there? Thanks. Thank you.
Uh, let's come back to the table, please. We need to get rolling. We're a little bit late now. Sweating a bit last night because the table was all Jeff. Yeah, Jeff is gonna. Ah, we're quiet. Excellent. Okay, that's good. We've got the lightning rounds coming up. Um, these are short sessions, six short session sessions that we um, are gonna really have to push through quickly. So the speakers need to to cover their stuff uh, in a short period of time, and we're not gonna have a whole lot of time for discussion. But the idea is that we show some of the breadth of the work both with the Commerce Data Service and what's going on in, in uh, PTO and NOAA. But let me first turn it over to Justin. Um, thanks again, Burton. Um, I, I wanted to just um, make one point before we go into the lightning rounds. And first, um, you all may know this, but um, Ian Kalen has actually been on personal leave since the last um, uh, CDAC meeting. And um, so I want to give him a chance to talk to the group for a minute or so, uh, if you wouldn't mind. But I also wanted to recognize as well Jeff Chen and Jeff Meisel, who both, and we'll talk about them later, but who really uh, have been leading the, the Commerce Data Service while uh, Ian has been on leave. So, um, but Ian, thank you for everything you've done. You've obviously been the visionary behind a lot of what we're talking about here today. And I wanted to give you a chance to, to talk to the group, notwithstanding that we'll forgive you since you've been out the last couple of months. <laughs> Again, it's good to see you all. Um, I, when you say personal leave, I'll call it baby leave, uh, and taking that uh, essential family time for uh, my, my baby girl. Uh, very excited to be uh, back here at Commerce, only back for a few days. So of course, like many other extended periods of leave, I have a lot to catch up on, and I'm learning quite a bit. Um, I will just say very briefly how excited I am that so much of the work that you all have guided us on and, and spurred us to create uh, will continue uh, throughout anyone, individual's uh, time away. And a lot of that is because of the principles of leadership that you all have celebrated. You know, one of the best ways to lead change in any large organization is to find the internal champions, the folks that have been focused on this long before any of us showed up. And it's with uh, tremendous pride, uh, 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 great gratitude, um, just a, a, a real deep connection that I want to say a few very special thank yous, not just to the folks that made this possible, but those that will continue on uh, through the transition. I'll start with uh, Austin, uh, a good friend who interviewed me on day one, brought me in and helped me uh, not get my head chopped off as I was navigating this building. Uh, Burton Rice is, uh, just has so much deep expertise and has been leading uh, the real connections between the agencies. Uh, Tanja White, we've talked about, is the glue that holds us together and makes sure that everyone gets paid and shows up on time to get find a way. Uh, and John Thompson, the leader of the Census Bureau, your support both uh, in spirit, in financial support, uh, and in data has been absolutely invaluable. We wouldn't be here without you. Uh, members of the team, uh, we have Natasha, there's uh, Tom Beach, who we'll be hearing from in a second, uh, Gerardo behind me, really the folks that uh, are just the, the foundation of this data thing, regardless of the political leadership. Uh, Lisa Wolfish, I see as well, is one of our first, actually one of, probably one of the first uh, members uh, to the Commerce Data Service. Uh, Ed Kearns, uh, helping us to really understand the fantastic connections between the department and NOAA. And I can go on, I'm probably missing some folks just from line of sight. Um, but I, again, I just wanna say, these are the folks that made all this possible. I'm very grateful for all of you uh, to uh, take this uh, uh, fantastic initiative in my absence, and I'm very grateful as well for your continued leadership as it continues on into the future. Uh, so the, I guess the last person I'll thank, uh, perhaps uh, in many other ways, the, the most important uh, person in your life is your partner, uh, my partner, Jeff Chen, uh, the deputy uh, who will be leading this on in my absence. Uh, Jeff, you know, when we first got introduced to the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, I'd heard about your work and your uh, scientific brilliance was already legendary, so I was a little nervous when I first met you, uh, but I'm so glad that your technical brilliance is now gonna be translated to organizational brilliance as you take this fantastic initiative into the future. So a special, special thanks to Jeff. Um, 
All right, so with that, we're gonna go to the lightning presentations. Uh, Daniel, would you like to introduce or shall I? Okay, great. So um, we're, we're trying to do short 15 minute presentations uh, just so everybody uh, is level set. We have, uh, we have pre-briefed one or two members of the CDAC so that you have a deeper dive. These are only 15 minutes long. We wanted to give the rest of the members a sense of what's going on on some of our specific work that we mentioned this morning. This is not the last time that you can give us feedback. Obviously, if there are other inputs or you want more, we can set up additional briefings so don't feel like you're limited to 15 minutes. The first one is actually two separate projects that I mentioned this morning that we are very, very proud about, driven by BEA and the Commerce Data Service. I have our two leaders here. Jeff, um, Sally, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Justin. Just trying to see how, okay, cool. Um, well, thank you for ha having us uh, present. I'm joined here by um, Sally Thompson, Deputy Director of the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, and we're, we'd like to give you a little overview of two products that are, uh, one is in currently in devel development, one has already been released, and they're both fo focused on economic data. And I'll turn it over to Sally over here to just kick us off. Sure, thank you, and I'm really happy to be here in such an impressive group. I'm a big fan of all your resumes. Uh, <laughs> uh, just want to say briefly a little bit about BEA. You know, we are the agency that produces a lot of economic statistical data. For instance, this morning we released at 8.30 the advanced GDP release for the third quarter. And right now those data are in our API. And right now those data are available uh, through the BEAR system. That's available that Jeff will demonstrate in a minute. But uh, yeah. we've got 12 APIs, new, um, I mean, a, a long standing uh, data interface where you can pull out pieces of data. We've got all sorts of other ways of serving up data. But now, with the API and now the R tools, we have even more. So it's our ongoing commitment to make data available to new users, existing users. Um, I'll tell you when we start. Admit, Look at my hair. This is not something that, that I've been using every day, but I called my 29-year-old son, who's an assistant professor at University of Florida, and said, well, is this something good? He said, oh, yeah, you need, you need, to, you need to work on that. And so he and other analysts in academia, in uh, the private sector, in government, increasingly are going to be looking for new tools, the tools they use, the open source platforms that they've become used to, and, and we're gonna meet that. So this is just an example of that. Really appreciate the Commerce Data Service and uh, ESA providing a little nudge to us in that area, but uh, I think we've really um, caught on and are, are partnering happily. Okay, so uh, the BAR, library or bear, some people like to call it. Um, I'm not, we, we, we happen to say BEA just naturally, but anyway, uh, pulls from our APIs and um, is available on GitHub. What's available there now are all our national income and product account data and detail, uh, and if you wanna know more about that, I can answer, and our regional data. So, um, like I said, the data released this morning are available right now through this system. Jeff? And I think the nifty thing is that uh, we've been seeing an emerging um, demand segment that's really using open source tools. If you look at under, undergraduates and graduate students across the country, they're, they're turning to open source tools for, uh, to, to do their analyses. So whether there's a time series forecast visualization, you can probably um, find someone using uh, open source. Um, data journalists are very much using this, and we had an awesome conversation with 538 last week um, where they were really interested in using R to get at the data. But the thing is, if you think about the BA API uh, or any API, you might have to take a little time to get used to it and really understand what's in it. And so I, this, this uh, library is really designed to lower the bar so that with just a little bit of code, you can get right into the data and then you start building your, your products. So I'm gonna go to do a little demo. Um, and this work, um, you can see this is a R console with the R script on the left. And you know, there are not that many lines of code here. And so all I have to do is, um, so I just open up the library, 
Unfortunately, my API key is showing. Uh, I'm going to throw this one away after this. <laughs> um, um, so that was a little bit of oversight on my part. Uh, and then you can start searching. You search, search the API, and it'll kick back a result, kind of crazy initially, but what if I just want to see a nice convenient version of it? So I can run a BA search query uh, where I specify HTML is true, and they'll kick back a JavaScript integrated table with the results. And then if you want to do further subsetting of this, um, and by just certain keywords, you can search around the table and get confirmation. And the cool thing is that you only need a few pieces of information to be able to extract um, a data set from the API, it just it makes them easy. So you specify a list of uh, features. Some of these things can actually be turned into default uh, in later versions. Uh, and then, so we run this, and then if I just want the data, uh, we can hit the API, and then we have a payload. Now payload will come back with data that kind of looks like when you, you're going through the I tables, you can see the results going across, the, the, time, the time variable going across the top, but we can reshape the data in any number of ways so that it's in long format. So if you were to look at BA long, you can, we have an, a nice clean set of data that can be readily used. Um, and then if we really, really want to get um, a little bit more ambitious, we have a little um, uh, experimental visualization uh, library that will take the data and it'll, let, it'll visualize it for you. And so for those who are not entirely acquainted with the data and they really want to know what's in that data, you can start to explore um, the information in a more um, usable, simple way. So that addresses some of the demand segments, but we figure we can extend this beyond just um, the initial um, BA, R, uh, BA uh, API. And so we have this um, EU-US Transatlantic Open Data Partnership. And it's an effort between uh, Commerce BA on one side of the pond and uh, European Commission and Eurostat um, and DG Connect on the other side of the, com uh, the pond. And the effort is really focused on understanding how to develop a harmonized prototype of EU-US data. And it really started off with uh, Sally and BA economists having really nice in-depth conversations with uh, Eurostat economists to figure out where was the common ground in the economic data. And once we figured out what that, uh, that common ground is, to show, to show the thing, um, as we like to use that term, um, we are currently building on our library to, using linked open data technologies um, with a front end to query against um, the data from both APIs so that we can have a harmonized view of a, a curate, initial curated set of data. And, and that library will include data on the state and metropolitan basis GDP, personal income data on that level, and uh, comparable levels in the, from the European community, which they call NUTS 2 and NUTS 3, and NUTS stands for Notional Units of Territorial something. But anyway, but it means that that's a common terminology um, in Europe, and we've got uh, things worked out in terms of making sure we have comparable data. I think researchers, there'll be lots of documentation about how the data presented are derived and source data and what have you, but we'll save researchers a lot of work who want to do comparisons of, say, state economies in the U.S. or metropolitan economies in the U.S. with similar economies in Europe. Good for providing information on looking at new business opportunities, new expansion, new investment, and we think there's going to be good use of, of this new library. And together, uh, together with all these different pieces. Um, the hope is that we can foster uh, great cooperation and better understanding when we're going into um, just even like research or uh, economic talks so that everyone's looking at similar information. Um, so there's a lot of uh, power and potential from just building uh, our library because it, it's a little bit farther upstream, but it can help influence a lot of things downstream. Thank you. Can do it very quickly, and I get, of course, I, there may be time for more discussion. I really like to see the 12 APIs from BEA. Very, very good. Congratulations to those. And I especially like to see that you're now collaborating with other um, countries, in this case, the um, European 
uh, Commission and uh, really interlinking Eurostat data and US data because ultimately science, technology, and innovation is a global um, e effort. And um, as you know, there are global brain circulations going on and it's extremely important to understand where these brains go, where um, industries go, how trade flows happen, et cetera. And it's, it's only possible if you connect these different data silos that you get a more holistic understanding of this. Ultimately, I already mentioned this, you might like to um, make um, also collaborations with OECD and some other larger organizations which already have 34 plus member of countries. But I think this is a wonderful first step. And uh, maybe one more comment is to really uh, bring these new data sets to the Commerce Data Academy. Uh, from teachers, not only in government, but also in the academic setting, mm -hmm. and get uh, researchers uh, interested, in addition to getting uh, industry interested, because then these teachers can teach the next generation that this is now all available can, and can be used. And um, this way, when students go out into industry, they already know that this exists, and they don't have to replicate this effort, but um, they can now use all these new interlinked data sources. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I just will comment that our some of our early testers have been academic mm -hmm. users, and, and so we've modified our instructions and what have you to make it as, as user-friendly as possible. Very good. Yeah. Um, I, I, am, I know we're short on time, Burton's, uh, but <laughs> does anybody want to have a stand? Yep. Yeah, uh, I think this looks great. I would suggest, it looks like on the bear, on the GitHub page, you access, uh, you reference the API page, which is great. It looks like the API page doesn't yet reference the bear um, package, so you might want to do that so that people know if they want to use the API, there's an R tool already written for it. Also, it looks like um, the package is not on CRAN or it was removed from CRAN, <coughs> so. Uh, that's, um, that's in the process. Okay, um, yeah, you definitely want it on CRAN, obviously, or people aren't gonna find it. Um, and then, um, it sounded like part of the EU partnership was also a search capability, is that right? So that you could find um, search, you could find data sets more easily, is that right? Uh, that's the, the goal. Okay, so would that look a lot like data.gov search functionality, or what? Uh, it would be an in-console experience uh, for our, our, our users, um, but, oh. but initially to um, a curated set of um, uh, comparable data sets. Okay, so it's in-console and R, so it's not a user, it's not, a, it's not web. Uh, not, not, not quite. Okay, great. Hey, and, and maybe I could just put a topper on this one from my perspective, which is um, this, the, the, this is one of those stories that you could tell that really brand, tells the story of our entire data effort because it started as a project that one of our team members who went through the academy, Andrea Jolka, worked directly with our, at BEA, uh, worked directly with our team at CDS. They drove it from the bureaus. It seeded it, BEA owned it and really made it part of their core mission on open data. It's open source, it's seed. So we start with something and once it's out, we're looking for the community to build functionality, which is exciting. Jeff, um, and when we've presented it to editorial boards and the folks who need to visualize quickly when they see that and we're gonna look to drive usage of it, you see lights going off because that's exactly what they need to be able to use and visualize our data over the longer term. And I love the fact that our team is willing to put something out there that has glitches, right? That you gotta start, release the product, and get some feedback. That's really important. The EU-US project shows what you can do when you turn the data pillar towards to align it with our policy goals. And I, I met, because I'd been leading some international dialogues um, with the European Commission, I met with the head of DG Connect, Roberto Viola. We agreed to try to get this done just this summer. So just think about that. It was something like June or July. We asked our teams to get together and see what you could accomplish on an open source, open data project. So June, July to November to release the alpha version in open source uh, with the idea of open data. That's something that you, you know, a couple years ago, you, none of us would have thought was possible, but it's due to, you know, folks like Sally and Jeff who are really putting their leaning in shoulders in to get something like this done. So I'm proud of it, but it also shows policy alignment uh, with our data pillar. So great job. Thank you all. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the short time, but we'll move on to our second. Our second is uh, Jeff again to discuss search string uh, analysis. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a bit of a theme um, here, Jeff. 
bit of a, a triathlon for me for presentations, but you know, double header is not so bad. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me pull up the other presentation. Um, all right. So the second pre uh, presentation uh, focuses on a search stream project uh, that was developed by um, a data scientist starting on uh, my team. And it was uh, done in conjunction with the US uh, Patent and Trademark, Trademark Office. Um, and uh, Tom Beach has been a tremendous supporter of our work. So every day, uh, thousands of, of uh, patenting examples, which architecture you're talking about. But what if one of those pieces were missing? You connect all the standard to non-standard terms so that you have consistent search. And there, there are a lot of different things that happen um, in search that may or may not uh, work perfectly. Um, but with the Patent Office, they're working on the next generation search engine. Uh, it's, it's a really quite an, a magnific magnificent piece of work. Um, and for their adaptive search, they're using solar. Um, but to get beyond that, you need to have a good search, uh, synonym engine. If you don't have a synonym engine, you, you kind of run into some issues. So if your record has certain tags on it, uh, it might it might not get updated all the time, so then that record is only good as the tags. And if you don't have the synonym engine to connect all the different terms, well, there's an issue there. Uh, Star calls, says that there's a thing called the WIDA problem, or what is this acronym? And essentially, with add a synonym engine, you can't really qu quite figure out what an acronym is effectively. Um, terminology evol evolves like Pokemon. Um, <laughs> Whether it's the terminology in the actual documentation, um, the actual articles or entries in your, your index, or the terms that are entered in via uh, the uh, patent examiners. And so if you don't have it, you can't catch them all, or match them all, really. And then lastly, like, there's the disambiguation problem. Uh, the word, the word Christmas tree, in, for many people, means you know, the Christmas tree uh, on the left. Uh, but in the oil and uh, energy industry, it means something very different. So, as part of uh, PTO's uh, Greater Technology Roadmap, uh, the data service worked with PTO to develop a new ranking engine for uh, recommended terms. And essentially, this way we can solve the disambiguation problem, the WIDA problem, the Pokemon problem, you, you, you name it, uh, we we're working towards it. And so, to get at this, uh, PTO provided us with um, just over one year's worth of search logs, about 80 mil million search log records, which um, it might be a bit for government, uh, it might not be that much for industry, but it's a good start. And from the logs, we can have this rich history of all the patent examiners' um, uh, search terms that they put in in the past. And this way you can get, like, you have this collective knowledge of what is a consistent term, what isn't. And so as part of the solution, um, Star developed this uh, parallelizable Python program that essentially does all the ETL on the, the uh, search logs so that we can understand what are the, the words that are related. And then we estimate the, the ranked linear conditional probability estimates by art area. So this way you have a really honed in uh, set of recommended, re recommended terms per art area. And this, this effort is really meant to fit into something like this. So when uh, PTO uh, rolls out its next generation search, it will have the capability of recommending all the other terms that you should probably put in to your search so that you can get to the right piece of prior art more consistently. And it's part of this overall um, theme of uh, consistent search and consistent um, uh, examination. The implication is that this one little piece, this little effort, th this one synonym engine will be able to reach uh, over 8,000 USPTO examiners, hit 600,000 applications. Each application takes about five hours on average, and it facilitates a more consistent way of um, doing office actions behind the scenes. It's pretty fun uh, to see how this stuff evolves. Um, it's, it's our little part in helping the PTO, and. I think it's really just the beginning. Thank you. That, that was terrific. And Vadim and Colin are discussants on this one. So what I, from my perspective, what I really like in this particular example is they start with a search. And 
for a lot of people search was, it's a done deal, it was solved 10 years ago. But this particular type of search is very, very different than what everybody else think of the search. And what Python Office problem is, is very different than when you go to Google and try to search for Christmas trees, because it's very well defined within what Python Office is. So they start looking into the problem and they identify the problem, identify that solar, what solar can and cannot do, solar is open source search engine which have its limitations and it was very nicely, it's defined, it was built for something else but it's very good application for Python Office. So the team went ahead and built a particular type of solution which can work together with solar or technology which was picked but it solves the problem which Python Office has. And the solution which they created is not one term, one time solution, oh let's go through, let's create this uh, whatever model, put it out there and run it. But they build it in the way that it will be updated and if tomorrow Christmas tree will start to be used by some other industry, I don't know, uh, ocean shining industry, they will pick it up, not right away, but they should be able to pick it up and it will continue modifying and going through. So it's, hopefully it's a project which they build it once and it will run for a number of years and update itself and will be internal part of what uh, Python Office will go forward. Yeah, um, I thought it was an excellent piece of work, so I'll, I'll take it in a slightly different direction. Because what, what, what I think you've created is an ontology for another industry. So for instance, I'm in the industrial industry and so when I look at Christmas trees, they tie to oil, oil and gas for sure. In aircrafts, when you talk about a shroud, it's not something you cover over a body, it's something that wraps around a plane engine. In the industrial industries right now, having that database in which you are learning new terms and connecting the new terms together is vastly important. In fact, the reason why Watson did so well was they had Wikipedia, which was an English database. This is one you're creating for an industry, so the oil and gas industry would appreciate it, the aircraft industry would appreciate it because you're going through all the patterns. So once you lay that ontology out, I think you make that, you expose that to the rest of the companies and say you have an ontology of all these terms that were related to the patterns, they would love that because we can't find that right now. So I think this is a, a huge thing just apart from what you're doing to get search better. So I agree entirely with Vadim, but I think there's a bigger base here for what you have. Excellent work. Thank you both. Others that would like to comment um, on the or feedback? For, for, for us, I, I agree with both of the discussants. I also think for us and the CDS, it's a perfect way to brand and explain what our data scientists can do, really. And STAR's efforts were terrific together in a partnership with um, our career leader, Tom Beach at PTO, Michelle Lee, our undersecretary there has really been driving an open data movement um, with, uh, with uh, Tom, but to partner in that way allowed us to show other bureaus what data science can bring to your work, right, and how it can make it more efficient, which for us scoping the next round of work has been absolutely critical. Great, Jeff, I think you're, you get off the podium for a few minutes. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Stephen Devine from the Economic uh, Development Administration, and Stephen, um, was one of our uh, initial uh, participants in the Data Academy and then was an apprentice um, detailee into the, the CDS. And uh, we're gonna talk about uh, one of the projects that has been driven by a need at EDA that Stephen uh, and our CDS team really uh, worked on. Thanks, Justin. Uh, well, hello, my name is Stephen Devine. Uh, I'm a program analyst with the Economic Development Administration, uh, or EDA, which is a uh, bureau here at Department of Commerce. And I was fortunate enough to be able to participate in the Commerce Data Academy, um, which I have to say was an amazing learning opportunity. Um, thankful to Commerce Data Service for providing it. And so my project there uh, was called the EDA Grants Viewer, um, and it was intended to solve a challenge we had at EDA. So our challenge at EDA was basically um, that we have two distinct databases for grant administration and performance data. Uh, and the reason for that is we're currently transitioning out of a legacy database called OPCS, that's the acronym, it stands for Operational Planning and Control System. 
and that dates back from the 1990s, and we're transitioning our programs into a new uh, database called Grants Online, acronym GOL up there. Uh, and so there's no consolidated um, place where all the data is mapped up. Uh, the, the fields were different between the two databases, and that hasn't occurred yet. So uh, another issue was that OPCS is not the most user-friendly system in terms of query capabilities. Uh, it's based on um, the Boolean query syntax, which you have to know a little bit about to use properly. And in part, as a result of that difficulty, a lot of our staff was not uh, having access. They didn't even have accounts to the OPCS database. So if they could not directly pull the data themselves, they would have to reach out to a colleague, ask for an email, et cetera. Um, and then Grants Online also has a fairly limited query capability for you know, uh, user facing. Um, outside of a few canned queries, uh, if you want to pull like a, a, a tailored query from there, you have, you have to send the email to the Grants Online help desk and they will pull the data for you and then email it back to you. So that takes a fair amount of time. Um, and then lastly, neither database had much in the way of visualization capabilities. So that was our challenge that we were going to try and address. And, we figured since it was fairly time consuming and frustrating for the staff to use the data now, if we were to change that, you know, they would potentially use the data more than they currently are to help drive decisions. So here's just uh, screenshots. On the left is uh, the old OPCS uh, query interface using the, the Boolean syntax. And then on the right uh, is a collection of different screenshots from the new EDA grants viewer. And it might be hard to see, but the, the goal was to just have a simpler, more user-friendly query interface, and then some added visualization capabilities. So the approach uh, for us was just to increase the data usability across EDA. And we did that um, by trying to merge as best we could the data fields from uh, the OPCS and Grants Online databases. So we'd have it kind of one integrated data set. And then um, we laid on top of that a user interface that staff could interact with. Uh, we did this using open source program software R and Shiny, um, in part because our initial attempt at this was a more in-house for our performance team. And as we realized that other staff in the agency could benefit from it, we kind of scaled up from that initial base in R. Um, but it is based on modern JavaScript libraries. And uh, we were taught and tried to implement the agile development and uh, user-centered design methodologies. So the new functionality that the EDA Grants Viewer brings, uh, you can search and download from the combined OPCS and Grants Online data. Uh, you can build and share custom queries, and you can visualize the data with interactive maps, charts, and tables, and we could also keep track on usage, usage metrics. So overall, the, the Bureau Impact, um, it's helped our staff have greater access to the data. So for instance, our project officers who sit on uh, investment review committees, um, and EDA's investments, by the way, are uh, economic development awards for things like um, public works, of, you know, roads, sewers, uh, water lines, um, workforce training programs, uh, business incubators, um, assorted uh, feasibility studies and such. When they're on these investment review committees deciding what uh, grants to award, they can pull up the map and see to make sure that the historical distribution has been equitable. Um, also, our communication staff can, uh, you know, self-serve uh, the data themselves when they get uh, congressional or OMB data requests instead of having to reach out to colleagues and wait for, um, for the data to be returned to them. I'm not sure what happened there. Also, uh, our executive leadership team, they travel often around the country to meet with you know, state, city officials. So uh, this allows them to directly access the data and find out you know, what applications and awards these folks have applied for so they could address their concerns in detail. Um, and as well, uh, our managers can have better visibility on the grant workflow. For instance, you know, identifying quickly you know, what uh, public works grants are still pending or what performance outcomes have been achieved in terms of jobs created or private investment. Uh, so there's been rapid adoption at EDA overall. We've got about 50 users, uh, and the feedback's been positive. They're saying it's easier to use than the, the previous OPCS system. And uh, we've, we've tried to achieve the goal that um, providing data access to a broader audience. So a lot of folks who did not previously have an account or the ability to directly pull the data you know, now have this uh, EDA Grants Bureau were installed and can access the data, including two of our Deputy Assistant Secretaries. 
So our next steps, uh, basically we're gonna continue refining the grants viewer, uh, adding more documentation, and implementing some uh, updates that have been recommended. Uh, we've provided training to staff through agency webinars. We're gonna continue that process, and we're gonna finish uh, transitioning it, the application to JavaScript and HTML, and look into uh, hosting it on EDA's public-facing website. Um, and then also we've talked with a couple other uh, bureaus who also seem to have a similar issue transitioning out of legacy databases to grants online, so they um, might look into similar options. But that concludes my brief, pending any questions. That's great, and Karen, uh, I know you're the discussant on this, and Stephen, if you wouldn't mind putting back to the slide that had the before and after as we talk, I think that's really <laughs> meaningful. Anyway, Karen, go ahead. You said that, because I was just gonna ask him to do that. Because that is really a dramatic thing. If you, I have been, and Stephen, thank you so much for your briefing and, and, and for the work that you've done with this, because I have been on the receiving side of that old side, right? And that, that's not what a program officer that you want to be managing your portfolio should have to look at or have to try and navigate. And so I think it's really, I mean, it's a tremendous advancement to go from that old to the new. And one one of the one of the things I mentioned that you that you said just during your during your comments was staff use data less. Well, who would want to use that old thing, right? Staff use data less. We want staff to use data more. And if you give them the kind of tools that that this um, that that this gives them, they can do a lot more with you know with the energy that they have for the for the work that they need to do instead of fighting with instead of fighting with that old. So I, I really appreciate the, the the effort that's gone into this and also just being able, I, I don't know, you might be able to say a few words about what it took for you to be able to do that because I think a lot of times in our bigger agencies, there's a whole, you know, it's difficult to make a change from the left to the right. And like, did, did you, what kind of challenges did you have to face to do that? Yeah, um, uh, I guess for one was getting the training in the data management, and so Commerce Data Academy was really instrumental in that, um, as well as kind of the res residency uh, phase of that program allowed us to have the free time really to focus on, you know, writing the code to do it. Um, and my, my leadership was in support of it. You know, they saw kind of the, where the Commerce State Academy was looking to go with it. Um, and so, you know, that was a major enabler. Um, and then just, you know, learning about kind of the methodologies, like getting the beta testers and collecting feedback and building out, you know, iteratively um, helped make it more manageable. So it wasn't just, you know, climbing the mountain uh, right out of the gate. Um, and then, also, again, the Commerce Data Service helped us get R installed, even. Um, Ian, you know, yeah, so, uh, you know, we had a, a long fight with OCIO, and um, it just took a long time, but when they came in, they kind of helped uh, um, educate folks that these were useful tools, and, and that got us through the gate. Who's OCIO? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I'll just put a yeah. little editorial on that. I wouldn't say the Office of the Chief Information Officer that we fought with them as much as uh, partnered with them and collaborated with them. Is that with uh, is that, is, is that with the, with the commerce? Yeah, no, well, no, no, not here. Uh, That's no, what she said. Yeah, Steve Cooper, who presented to you all at, I'm gonna say the third CBAC meeting, he, he, his vision for empowering the department with infrastructure has been a great support, but yeah, R was outlawed, GitHub was outlawed, video chat was outlawed, AWS was outlawed, Socrata wasn't allowed. A lot of these things, uh, for, for, yeah, that was fair. Yeah, they, it not allowed to be used, blocked. A blocked firewall. Let's say but technically it was firewall. Um, that has a, has a large part changed, but just giving a sale within government, give us R, obviously failed. Saying Stephen needs help and can't do his job, cannot empower the American people with this essential information unless you just approve this, which by the way, all these other agencies have approved. Here's the ATO, here's the the security assessments already uh, uh, performed. That is a much easier conversation, and I'm very grateful. I don't even know if any folks from OCIO are here, um, but all of these tools are first time in the department in just the past year. Alex? Uh, oh, everything's great. It's amazing. Always amazing to see a, a, a tool which looks like that replaced by pretty much anything else, but certainly by something that looks great. Um, so uh, the uh, 
the, the quick question I had was, it'd be great, and I think it's worthwhile for all the projects you actually undertake, I mean, throughout the, the department, is to talk about if it's, pos if it's possible to measure the impact on the recipients of the grants or whatever, you know, whatever your specific goals are for your organization. Um, because these kinds of tools are super valuable, um, but if you've got an idea, specific ideas of like what numbers you're trying to move in terms of grants closing or the time to close a grant, I, again, I don't know what your KPIs actually are, that could probably encourage you to create, say, the right default graphs or the right uh, sort of like easily accessible tools for the, the people who are actually doing the work. <clears throat> because this still requires, I bet, a certain amount of, you know, self-direction and you have to know how to use the tool and so forth. Um, anyway, my, my, my big point is if you can understand like what you're trying to drive for the recipients of the grants, then you can build that back into the design of the application uh, in a way which makes it even more valuable uh, for the actual business of the department. I know we're short on time, Stephen. I, I'll just put, again, one more topper on this. For my, I, Stephen's always very modest in this presentation, but the idea that we moved from the left to the right in basically three or four months, and it was driven, as Alan was saying, directly by the Bureau to solve a problem. The reaction from the leadership of the Bureau uh, and from the team has been tremendous because look at the difference. And the ability to actually use the data to drive your decisions and to be able to respond quickly when they need to has been really, really well received. And you have to have leaders like Jay Williams, who's leading EDA, support the effort to put their team members into the apprenticeship program and have it driven out like this and have Stephen be now you know, so aware and be able to drive change all over the agency has been tremendous. So, Stephen, thank you very much, and, and obviously the CDS team for, for being your partner. Thank you. All right, great. And do you have some? No, we'll, we'll get this. Move on to Carl. <clears throat> by the way, I was supposed to start at some point by telling you the hashtag for the meeting, oh, if you're tweeting, <laughs> is CDAC meeting. It's at the bottom of it, so right. um, I know we're up. It's pretty fun to be at a meeting where we're talking about our shiny Python um, and having our team members around here talk th talk about agile development through alpha and beta testing. You know, it's it's a nice place to be. And a word to those who are, are following us online, that hashtag um, is live. We're watching it very closely. When we get to the public comment period, if you have questions, if you have comments, we will pull from that to, to help and interject them into the discussion room. It's open to the people online through Twitter. And here we have another presentation from one of our team members at PTO. Uh, Carl's going to talk through cluster maps of uh, patent applications. Carl? Good morning. Um, my name is Carl Skarbenek. I'm a supervisory patent examiner at the Patent and Trademark Office. And what I'm going to tell you about is a little exploration of um, our patent data that we've got. And um, roughly every year, the office receives about a half a million patent applications. And the way we deal with those is each patent application gets a, a classification so that we know where it should go. That list, those applications are put on a list and sent to an ex um, examiner, a supervisor like me, um, where I then manually assign those cases. Um, we've been doing that by USPC, and one problem is that we've stopped using USPC for classification back in 2012. Uh, we've changed over to, to CPC, which is now stands for the Cooperative Patent Classification System that's shared by the major patent offices in the world. Um, but this process where I have to manually sign is slow and inaccurate and inefficient. So to talk about the exploration is where I'm gonna go next. So to start this, I'm showing you a, a million patents issued in the last three years by their CPC classification and to which working group issued them. And what I want you to take home from it is it's massively interconnected. So how do we make sense of that? And I'm gonna drill in closer to the classification for semiconductor manufacture. And, and even that is spread across the office. That, the map 
has different areas of the office. Down in the lower right-hand corner are the biological biotech areas. Up at the top are the uh, electrical engineering, and on the right or left side are the mechanical um, areas. So I, I can't be satisfied with that. I have to keep drilling into it. Um, oh, went too far. No, okay, there, there's a slide hidden here that shouldn't be hidden, um, which shows the interconnections between the patents that cite this classification and the other classifications that are issued onto that, that, uh, that patent. And what the, the big take home is that every patent or application that comes in gets a series of these CPC classifications um, that we can use to identify what subject is discussed in that application. So the idea came up is can we look at it and use that information as a proxy for our examiner's experience? And what, the way this works is we take all the applications that have been examined, generate a fingerprint for every examiner, and one way it could work, um, and then look at incoming applications with the CPC classifications and match them up to make a recommendation for which examiner would be the most appropriate one for that incoming application. Okay, so what it, this slide here shows the contrast between what we're currently doing with just a, an Excel sheet coming in with a list of applications, which I have to go through manually and say, okay, this examiner, um, you, you're doing all the, the applications that end in zero, here you go. You do the ones that are end in one and, and go through. So I'm not really using the expertise that I've got behind you know, in my group. However, on the right-hand side is a map that shows someone's expertise, how it's linked together between different classifications. So if I use that, I can hone in on who should be, who I, you know, hone in on that recommendation. So the result of this is that we could automate the process a lot more. Um, we're using this expertise proxy, so you know, we're using the, the management, or knowledge, the knowledge management. And that's gonna help us drive our quality of products, the, the actual patents, up, because we're gonna find the most appropriate examiner. And hopefully, they'll be more effective. And that's, thank you. Oh, that's terrific, and CJ and Colin, you're leading this one. CJ? Um, so first, as a uh, patent holder and reoccurring applicant, I'd like to thank you, Carl, for your work in this space. Um, I couldn't help but uh, notice in uh, a tie between one of the previous discussions, mm -hmm. uh, the search string analysis that Jeff and team were working on, yes. that the classification connections that you have could actually go back to supporting their categorizations. So I think there's a synergy that could be had um, based upon the analysis that you're able to do mm -hmm pushing back to making sure you have good categorizations to be able to cross-search them. Um, so that's one thing that, that uh, working together with, with that team may uh, provide some value. Um, and then just uh, one question. I couldn't help but, uh, but hear that it's uh, a, a lot of the terms could be, um, if, w if we were to, mm -hmm. um, where are, you know, what's the uh, possibilities of uh, seeing this implemented? And I don't know if this is a question for you or for Tom, but essentially, uh, well, what, do, what do you need to all to move <laughs> us forward and, or move that forward in right. that space? Yeah, well, we are currently working on how to implement this. Um, yeah, that uh, looks like an excellent um, proof of concept. And that's, yeah, and, and that's, that's and, what it is. And that's, oh, that's, and that's great. I think that's one of the things that getting those proof of concepts, a lot of times you have this chasm between a proof of concept to actually getting it implemented. And I think that goes back to uh, our number one recommendation of mm -hmm. institutionalization, and that is make sure we make that jump from there okay. and potentially uh, tying uh, some of the work to the search string mm -hmm. analysis and bundling some of these things together so that the PTO has a whole suite of tools that then become um, that capability right. to actually streamline the entire mm -hmm. process um, from beginning to end uh, and create that automation. So, 
you know, when I put it together, I had my eye on implementation. So everything that I've written, I think can be easily implemented um, by the right folks. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I fully agree with, with CG. I, I mean, what would possibly stop you? <laughs> Going from <laughs> zeros and ones to this, that's great. I, I also look at it and I, I see something um, a lot larger here, right? So what, what I understand you said is that what we do is we characterize, we've got a fingerprint of the patent and a fingerprint of the examiner and we match it. Correct. Yep. So now if I have a fingerprint of the patent, I could also have a fingerprint of maybe a problem I'm solving and yes. I can match that too. Or I can have a fingerprint of the skills I need, mm -hmm. and I can match that to hiring. Uh, and so I think this is a huge capability you have in which what you've done is characterize the patent and yeah. now afforded us on a, on a platform to match nearly anything that someone could think of. Yeah, thank so you. that's why I, I fully agree with CJ. Let's just, I mean, let's do it yeah. and put it out there, and <laughs> everybody will yeah, they'll, they'll and, give you new ways. In presenting this to, to various people, this, this, these same themes come up. Oh, you could use it this way. Yeah, you could use it that way. You, know, you could use it to drive hiring. You could use it to decide where do we need more training. Sure. Um, the the application, it, it is a wide, <coughs> excuse me, a, a wide ranging project. So. Great job. Let's do it. Thank you. We, uh, um, let me just say to, to the point you just made, Colin, part of, this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the first round, even the first round of uh, folks who were detailed into the CDS to work on projects. I, you, we could do an hour and have been doing hour-long presentations where we just bring seven or eight of the 15. Some, I will tell you, they didn't all work out perfectly and we are okay with that. You gotta, you can't have, we're not gonna show you every single one and go through them, but I'm telling you, not all of them work perfectly. We're showing you some of the ones that were really successful, but a lot of them were successful. And what the team is doing to try and scale, right, to institutionalize and scale is, we have a group of some of our, and Carl is one of them, Steven's one of them, there are others, who we are doing road shows. We go around to the departments, to the OCIO council, to the leadership councils, to the departmental lead councils, into the bureaus, and we show them, this is what we can do for you, right? These are the different products, these are ones that are scalable, these are more customized. But that's what's driven the workload that we have now scoped out for the next year, and we'll talk about this later, but you'll see we have a lot of work kind of committed for next year. We have to build capacity and execute. That's our big challenge, uh, but we're proud of this, and we're trying to show it everywhere we can, and we need your help to amplify, really, you know? So, and with that, maybe I could go two more, Heather and um, Kati. So this is fantastic, and I, I can't help um, but draw the correlation directly between I work in research and have been a journal editor and publisher. And the one-to-one -one match between patent examiner and uh, um, uh, uh, the patent, map, it looks like it maps almost exactly to potential peer reviewer and article. And I wonder if you've thought about talking at all with the scientific publishing community, because certainly one of the, 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 the thorny problems that we deal with is the time to get ideas to market in terms of the time it takes to locate and match up good matches in peer review. I, I have not. <laughs> We'd love to talk to you. <laughs> um, I, I know there's some colleagues at, at the, the patent office that have used similar things in their previous careers um, to match grant reviewers with incoming grants. This is um, head and shoulders above, sort of a step above what we're, what we're dealing with now. So um, you might, might want to reach out or we'll reach <laughs> out to you. Sure. Yeah. Basically the same comment, so mm -hmm. the assignment of reviewers to whatever you care about, mm -hmm. be it papers or be it grant proposals, has been done. And I think you might like to uh, look at uh, some of the other teams and how they have designed interfaces that are easy to use, mm -hmm. how they go about updating the fingerprints, um, how they go about using some of the more advanced mechanisms to actually uh, do the lexical and, and linguistic analysis. So um, I'm happy to connect you there. Oh, sure, so. sure. Thank that you. was terrific. Um, when we go on to our next presenter, Tom Beach from PTO. Um, I, I just tried out and uh, 
thank uh, CDAC and uh, everyone here for the opportunity. Um, I feel like it's almost been pre-planned here to tee this one up, but uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to say was, um, for those who know I've spoke before at CDAC a couple times, um, I'm hoping that just by what is happening today represents the cultural revolution that's going on at the USPTO. If you remember way back, my first presentation was a roadmap, um, and uh, that was a small, small team, um, and I'd be remiss to say that there's a large team. I think it's a great, great thing. One of the things I was telling uh, Ian was that we just hired our first data scientist, full-time government, you know, we're looking to hire our second. So um, we are we are truly on a journey, <clears throat> and I would like to thank you all for that uh, opportunity. So um, with that, I wanted to uh, move into two topics, um, one that you may or may not have heard about, um, the USPTO Cancer Moonshot. How did we play a role with the Vice President's Cancer Moonshot uh, Task Force? And so um, while you might not think the USPTO is uh, innately this is really a program because we're talking about a lot of um, data that's driven on um, cancer treatments and the patient care is saying, look, the USPTO is a leading indicator of technology based on our patent filings. So what you see being filed is an indicator of what is going to come to market. And so as part of the task force team on data, we looked at an effort to leverage two things that we've never done before. One was a challenge.gov effort. Um, we have grant authority at the USPTO, as well as taking a team approach. Um, we looked at working with our chief economist office, our chief uh, communications office, as well as our OGC general counsel um, to allow us to sort of stay within the path of, of a vision. And our vision was to take what you've probably seen in developer hub, is that concept where you can take it, use it, it's portable, and um, it can be leveraged in many unique ways. And this was a great opportunity for us to flex that muscle of being able to say, we're doing platform work and not in the technical sense. Lots of technical things going on behind the scenes, but tech, you know, as a platform, we're able to do something like this, where in about four weeks, we put out a challenge.gov statement. We got 19 submissions in four weeks. Um, uh, for a very nominal prize money, I might add. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so, what did it look like? This is. So the result sets that we got. Um, we we were challenging folks to say, how would you act if you were the head of a government agency and had to make a data-driven policy decision about where to spend right resources? Where are six, where where would you spend money in the in the world of cancer treatment? And so that was the challenge, right? And what was really interesting was to see how they could take our curated data set, and Carl touched a little bit on the importance of curation, right? We use a classification system, but on top of that, we have institutional knowledge, which was demonstrated by this thesaurus, this is the project that Star worked on um, with the USPTO. And so, you know, what's important is a hybrid. So for the first time, we did a curated data set converted it onto an API, threw it up and on developer hub, having ways of taking clinical trial data, mortality rates from patent to product. It sees it in the prescriptions um, and the medications that are done. So within the short time frame, they were able to actually build fun fully functioning models that can be used to make these decisions. You know, should we fund at median levels that were established, right, above or below for an audience that is, um, you know, dealing with cancer. So it was a really fascinating attempt to, to, to really put it out there, you know, have them crowd and source our data beyond what we um, have normally thought. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that um, on the opening remarks from Secretary Pritzker about, you know, unleashing and on working work coming up with very strange terms, so you have to forgive me. But basically, when we looked at having a curated data set, so instead of just opening data, and yet we really want constructive and useful data, sometimes folks come in either whether it's within the institution or they come with them come, curate through our search systems, and then basically toast it into an API and go back home with it. So that's something we're looking at working on as a new deliverable in the open data space. It's just sort of the self-serve API development. Um, it goes to that effect of looking at not only just creating and being prescriptive on APIs, but also letting them come and create their own. And so 
Why do we do all this? The, the, the big theme for us on opening data is allowing us to have better applicants, and better applicants are, are folks that better understand the patent system. And it's a, it's a feedback loop system, and I think we're seeing it in real time as more and more folks understand what patents are, what role they play, um, we're gonna see better quality applications. So with that, I'm gonna I'll pivot to something on our, our what's coming, what's new and exciting that I really am excited about. Um, and it, okay, I'll be go quick on this. So um, on this side of the house, this, we're looking at a platform called Sigma++, and a couple of the questions came up earlier, how can we integrate different things into our search system? We're looking at a big data analytics search system, and I'm gonna go ahead and skip to the UI just to start backwards. But remember that this is a big data approach where knowledge management is key. We're looking at a UI that looks basically like this, um, is leveraging AI algorithms, uh, WordNet, any sort of stemming, lemming uh, processes, but this is tunable and usable by the examiner. So what you look at is, they're sorting nine million patents, but it's like a card deck, you're shuffling the deck to have the most relevant art at the top. So it just continuously recycles and reshuffles. The word cloud is a, is a sort of a quality check. If you see the important words that pertain to the things that you're looking for, you'll see them in their change in value, language, and parts of the application. Looking at its capability of providing feedback, we're able to take apart the idea of searching and, and get away from just BRS type searching. Um, and do shingles and engrams and sort of pull apart the now. What is our patent examiner gonna look like? What are they gonna wanna use and sit down? Functionality is where you'll show up and see the Christmas tree issue with work that Carl's to come together two and a half years ago enough to offer opportunity to be disrupted. That one I'll turn it over to Kevin. Kudos to you and your roadmap not that long ago and you, and you are executing against the roadmap quite well. Um, in one of the presentations earlier today, I think this, the statistics that Jeff shared are <coughs> somewhere between a half a million and 600,000 applications per year, five hours per application, has the opportunity to either re reduce, can we as industry expect patents to make it through the patent application process faster? Mm. There's a lot of talk in the, um, the automotive industry of the chauffeur versus make the highest be made. So our goal is not to sit here and go, how much faster can we go? Our goal is to raise the bar of quality. So in order to do that, that's um, a reasonable subject matter. So um, I don't think that will be an issue. It's not our, it's not our mission. But on the, <coughs> on the UI front, um, yes, this form modular and will change over time. And when I mention things like platform and functionality, we're really trying to look at the UI. Uh, one, you can look at that as a family of patterns, mm -hmm. like you do in emails when you're threads. It's also here and for, uh, 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 for anybody looking at that, it would be great. It would be great for the public when we search for our patterns, not to have to go through 50 patterns trying to figure out which one is which. But amount of work which goes and which went on behind, and it's probably kind of summarizing the previous slide yeah. of some, some of the technologies is great. And thinking that it was just started off as a roadmap two years ago, and actually it moved through in two years ago. For I can say that for a lot of companies, that also would be wow. Uh, to move in that, and uh, I think it's a great work which was done, and uh, if you can make showcase out of it, and show it to other departments and careers with. Following up on Kevin's question, I guess I was assuming this was about efficiency, but I think you said it was about quality, not mm -hmm. efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is quality in your context? Is it that you would not issue a patent that actually, in fact, had prior art? Is that what how you would define that? Yeah, so um, we officially define quality as, as our, our code 35 USC. Um, so legally speaking, it's defined as using our manual for a patent examination procedure. But quality means a couple of different things. It can mean different things to depending on the process, whether you're a patent holder, a litigator. Um, it, it, it actually can, it's sort of like art. You almost kind of, if you like it, you don't. But the reality of quality in this sense is what we want is precision to occur. <laughs> So if we're gonna examine a limited amount of time, time should be on the analysis and, and use of the able fully understanding uh, what is in the actual patent. But, you know, I, I to really, you know, challenge words. Uh, in a sophisticated way about the trade-offs that we are making. Mm -hmm. So I wanna commend you for that because I think that this is really important. And I think it's something to keep in mind on everything that we do here, which is that many of the technologies that many of us are in love with can push us to efficiency but they can't push us to quality. And if we don't actually hold on to that,
agency with agency for, the, for our users. We need it. Thank you very much. Okay. Tom, right. now we have Ed, um, Officer at NOAA. So, NOAA? Thank you very Ed. much. Uh, about to you all on this. So I won't spend a lot of time. Um, uh, experiment. Okay, this we're not talking made available on Amazon's uh, uh, web platform. And uh, in this graph, who is the NOAA for the, the volume of data from the weather radar uh, being accessed uh, in total. You see that red line where the uh, Amazon Web Service was announced in October of 2015, almost exactly a year ago. And uh, you'll see in the green those, those volumes that you see there's, there's been data. 80% um, uh, of, the, of the orders for the next round of data that NOAA is receiving right now is being served through AWS, not uh, about six form. So the AWS you come in and use it then are leaving them in place. Um, of course, we have a single point of access now for real-time or historical data. That wasn't uh, true before. Uh, the speed with which people can do work uh, is now uh, greatly increased. Um, uh, Climate Corp was one of the um, uh, partners of Amazon going into this, uh, into this project, and they were able to do in a, in a, in a few days that, that had taken no years to actually process that much data. So it was a very, uh, very big. We've done the analysis. And then on NOAA's archive systems are down over 50%. Um, so that's, again, measurable. And, and over time, that could become um, a, a cost avoidance thing for NOAA. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then there's also new science that's come up. So there's been bird migration and insect studies that have popped up that are novel applications that just weren't possible before. And of course, all this has been done at no net cost to the U.S. taxpayer. So um, there is a paper soon. In about working with the collaborators is the geostationary satellite um, that's about to go up um, uh, next month. Um, uh, fisheries catch data, numerical weather prediction data has been uh, discussed since day one of this project. Uh, various climate data uh, that are available and other products across NOAA. So what we're running fast now is trying to bring these projects to maturity. We have a year and a half left in the initial creative period with uh, these five uh, collaborators. Data, trying to uh, document those and really start to be planning now for what's going to come after this experimental phase and what we're calling the post creative future. So, uh, these are the things we'd like to talk about and talking with Heather and Bill earlier uh, about this is what we wanted to really focus on about what we've learned now, open and freely, if you know where to go and who to ask, right? So, um, but even those data that are available right now that are, that are, um, on public facing web services, they're not always moving. Why aren't they moving? Uh, well, first you have to understand them. Discussion with the no experts is, is the, within the Crossfire case, it was Climate Corp that got that initial push over. And once that began, a lot of other people came to the Amazon platform and this whole ecosystem of users grew around the data set that was now available. But Climate Corp was the one who initiated that. Uh, and part of that is because you need to be able to bring a business model, bring their own money in the game and they want to make sure before they start to invest a lot of time and resources into the data set that they know how it's, they're going to be able to recover their costs. And that's fair. So uh, how can those new users and markets be identified? How can we bring those third parties in the conversation? Um, that's a big challenge. Uh, NOAA serves its existing communities that it knows about, like the Weather Enterprise, is already serving that well. But uh, for other uses, it has been a challenge. Very happy to hear D Dana talking about that earlier today. Data quality is, is a big issue for NOAA. Uh, as you heard, yes, we, we do care about our data quality, data integrity. And uh, once the data leaves the NOAA system, does that responsibility for ensuring the data quality end? Right? So that liability ends, but we still are, our, our skin is still in the game on this. And we still want to ensure the data quality. And even beyond, uh, I think we were talking more about willful manipulation earlier before. Um, but just going from uh, a file format that we can verify to, say, an analytical tool that is beyond our ability to, you know, control. And the example I'll use will be Google. So Google took a lot of climate data and put it into BigQuery as part of the climate prep project that was just announced by the White House. For environmental information, we're able to verify the transfer of the data, that they're valid and high quality into Google. But once they load it into BigQuery, okay, then how do we do that? Because they've just changed, the, they've, they've changed the, the format of the data. They haven't necessarily change the data, but how do we verify that with them as partners? Uh, because again, it may not be willful manipulation, it just is the fact maybe they put it in wrong or got, you know, the, the, the reference got messed up or something like that. We have to find ways and explore ways that we can, we can ensure the quality throughout the quality chain of the value. 
of the data. Um, how can NOAA's expertise be best leveraged? We have a lot, of, that, that's, that's the real asset that, that NOAA holds. It's not just the 16 petabytes of, of data for observations, the other 100 petabytes of model results that we have. Yes, that's a resource, but the real resource I've been saying within NOAA are the experts that understand that data, can explain it to others so the data can be used. Uh, excuse me? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and this is my, I believe my, this is my last slide. Uh, yes, and my last bullet on my last slide, so I'm right on time. Um, I did this talk in three minutes at the, uh, at the conference center the other week, so I, I could go faster if you want. <laughs> but when you say you do a lightning talk and no, you have to be careful because you think I'm talking about lightning. So yeah, all right. No lightning this time. Um, and then really that, plat that platforms versus portals approach. Um, and, we're, and we're seeing it some in, in, with the NEXRAD data, uh, the weather radar data on Amazon, but it, is it really making the data more usable or not? Um, I, I've been saying that, that the weather radar data is probably a lower bound on the possibilities. It's, it's a very obscure format unless you're very familiar with it and part of the expert community, it's, it's hard to use. And we don't have visibility into that next step beyond the interpretive layer that's grown around Amazon. We don't know the users beyond that, that those intermediaries are carrying on the message that's, in, that's the value that's in the next rad data, the weather radar data onto the community beyond that. We don't have a good insight into that yet, but happy to take your questions. Uh, Ed, that was terrific. Um, and why don't I turn it over to Bill and Heather? Yeah, uh, so thanks for that. Um, I, w I really want to commend Noah on, I think, a couple of key things here. One is sort of the sandbox approach that you've taken to explore a business problem where you didn't know the answer. And so you went in through an unstructured project that was structured to get you to whatever answer emerged. And I, I think you've done that well. And the second is to build on the ecosystem of other partners that are needed to get uh, data out into the world. And both of those things have emerged, I think, as success stories of, of what you've done. Um, but I was hoping you could maybe expand on that and talk about how those success stories within NOAA might transfer or not transfer to other parts of commerce. Uh, to other parts, yes. So um, you know, we're, we're building bridges between NOAA and, and commerce, particularly through the commerce data service and a lot of the activities you've heard about today. Um, the, the idea of, of having these, these partnerships that are not um, just straight up contracts and you know, it's a, a fee for service kind of thing, um, I think um, that realization is already spreading across commerce. The fact that yes, we are, we are partners with industry in so many different ways. Um, so I think the the, the outcomes of, of this project with the, uh, the highly technical data about how that works or not. Organization that advocates uh, for open data and support for open data projects, you, you've given us this beautiful success story that allows us to use the words leverage the taxpayer investment in, in research in a beautiful way. Um, we talked a little bit uh, uh, about the applicability of this project uh, across you know, just a variety of different sectors, which I think is really important. And one of the questions that we as a committee keep asking ourselves is, what can we do? How can, how can we as a committee help you to leverage this success story and, and kind of uh, um, maybe amplify uh, how it can be used across different sectors? Yeah, w one thing I would be very happy to, to hear the, the committee's advice on is how to bring more of the uh, maybe general analytics uh, capabilities that are, are present now in the marketplace um, to the problem. So the, the collaborators that we have, yes, they have analytical com uh, abilities uh, and tools available on their platforms, but we've been really focused on sort of the, the very basic, almost like infrastructure as a service approach to this kind of thing. But the value chain, of course, we know um, goes through a lot of these analytical and new AI tools and stuff like that. Um, and we haven't had a lot of success in plugging those into the business models right now. We uh, welcome. Also, uh, advice on how to build even a business model around a big data approach. Because it, as you'll notice what, what I mentioned, a lot of these data sets we're working on are like single large valuable data sets, not actually an aggregation of a bunch of smaller data sets, which is really closer to what big data really is in these kind of approaches. So as we found, it's very hard going to our collaborators and trying to construct a business case for something that might be. Like, well, if we bring these data sets together, we might see some cool results. Um, so if, if you've got any advice for how we can kind of bridge that gap 
um, to, to be able to say what these possible applications could be, especially with these modern tools, would be very much appreciated. you ensure quality down the line. I think the frame that I find most useful is work done by Anne Washington where she argues that we should be thinking about these as data supply chains. And I think that that's a really interesting juxtaposition against the open data rhetoric that we often lead because often what it means is we made it open. Have fun with it. Whatever happens is fine. Whereas actually I think that your point and I think is to really think about how do we ensure quality across the entire supply chain of data all of the different ways in which it may get used so that we can actually enable the kind of commercial awesomeness that we might imagine. And I would say that this has been a challenge in manufacturing where one of the things that came to being was everybody realized, actually we need to make certain that the supply chain is responsible, materials, that we're getting, that the labor is acceptable, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a unique opportunity, especially considering how far ahead you are for thinking about data as a commercial tool, to really think about it in those supply chain metaphors in a way of pushing everybody else to to be responsible about the whole chain. And, uh, thank you, and, and I do think there's an opportunity here to, to combine both the quality uh, that's implicit in the supply chain, the value that you know having your data traceable to, let's say, a NOAA standard, you know, could be for, for a, a consumer further down the road. But also, uh, as Secretary Pritzker mentioned, I think earlier about the, the need of the federal agencies to know where the data are going. So once they've left the federal system, gone in um, to some collaborators' uh, toolbox and further down the supply chain, how do we know? And, uh, and be very open, I'd be very open to your advice too on how we would construct these kinds of open registries. You know, we're considering things like blockchain and other technologies that we could use to provide it open so people that are using the data can let us know they're using the data and they can know where the data came from. And if we can build some data security into that at the same time, not, and this is not system security that has been a, a challenge, right, for a lot, a lot of things, but this is data security just to ensure that the data throughout the supply chain are still as valid at the end of the supply chain as they were at the beginning, I think would be a, a very viable thing. And if you get any ideas, we're, <laughs> we're very open to suggestions. We know this is a research activity, yeah. Anybody else? Stan? It, uh, it seems like I can see your problem with the integrity up to you know, Amazon or Google where you're partnering with them to provide the data to end users and you'd want to make sure, but that does seem like more like a unit test. I'm sure you have unit tests when it leaves your organization yeah. and it seems like you just need to have the capability to then recheck it once it's been reformatted. In the example you gave on Google's platform, you would just recheck some basic mm -hmm. kind of, you know, 20 to 100 metrics and make sure they kind of, you could compute them the same way, I guess. Would, so that seems kind of solvable. The, the question I had, a, a deeper question was, um, the, some of the things you described about kind of making business cases for things, for the data, is that because, I mean, um, and also the need for analytic capabilities on top of just the data provisioning that you're already doing. I assume these, all these users, the 64% of users that are taking the data off Amazon and then and re, that there's more of that that needs to go on and you need to do some proof of concepts about this is how you could use the data or what, yeah. what, what is that about? Yeah, no, exactly. To, because uh, if we understood that um, some of these data sets that we've proposed and, and talked about with our collaborators, if we understood how they could be employed by those others, so with, with, with the weather radar, we were able to say, because there's an active community, that tried to, for many years, download the entire data set from NOAA and were unable to do so. We were able to say, if you do this, these people will come. And some of them spoke up and said, yes, we'll use this platform, and off they went. Um, but for other data sets, it's not quite as apparent, particularly for the, uh, the other communities that may want to use the data in new novel ways. Um, and you know, to, to actually get the data out there onto the platform is the first necessary step. And that's where we're struggling with the business case, because in order to enable that investment of, of resources and labor to do that on the collaborator side, they have to have a clearer picture of, of what those, those possible uses are. And right now, it's just proven to be a, a challenge to do that. And just so I'm clear, is because it, 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 your chart where you showed AWS versus NOAA usage, it, it led me to believe that the data set I could retrieve off of the, the NOAA archive was similar to what I could retrieve off of AWS. Is that in fact true? It's exact, yeah, exactly the same. So they've all been verified. So it's the exact same data. And in fact, uh, you know, anecdotally, you know, one of, the <laughs> one of the measures of success too is are NOAA's own scientists going to get the data from Amazon or, you know? And, and yeah, anecdotally, I can tell you, you know, I'm from the Asheville, from the archive, the, there's scientists in the building literally sitting on the archive within the building because they know it's exactly the same data and it's faster. 
it's yeah. fast. Okay, yeah. so that it's faster. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And if I can just give a capstone piece of perspective on this fantastic work, but also connected to the supply chain concept. In our very first meeting, we talked about a digital watermark. How do we understand downstream consumption so that we can optimize the entire supply chain? In general, with open data, there is no branding tracker down. And I think that that is still perspective. Here's the business opportunity. It's a Netflix or Amazon. If you like this data, you'll also like this data. We don't have that because we don't actually know what folks are necessarily using. From a patent examiner's perspective, if you're looking at this application, you probably should also look at this one. But if we can't track it, we can't invent it, right? This is that, that systemic gap that I think really challenges the entire sector. And I think a lot of what uh, this fantastic experiment has tried to create is at least some degree of traceability. Not just from a business perspective, uh, but also, okay, well, if we partner with other folks, can they help us figure out uh, not just new use cases, but how well it's being used so that we can circle back on this data and find more effective ways of delivering it out to the, to the right customers in the right way. So, I, I, again, it's examples of opportunities we have uh, as a department, as a sector, and as a council. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sharing today. <laughs> So uh, I think there, in, in terms of the very first question you had there about uh, demand uh, and about uh, uh, building new uses in new markets. So I guess I would say that there are kind of three ways to, to attract those new users. So the first one is to make the data visible. In other words, this data exists. Let it in something is that there are people out there who have a particular problem to solve and they need to be able to find you when they're looking for the thing which is necessary. So this is a, I've identified a demand already in the system, and I need to be able to do it. The third one is actually generating or identifying demand, then getting it in front of the people who would actually try to solve that demand. And this might be a place where you actually could do more. So um, I'm sure, I, I assume, that Noah gets a bunch of requests from people in the world saying, hey, do you have X? And your answer might be, we don't really have X or FP systems. So basically, people would sort of reach out to you and say, hey, I'm trying to solve whatever. And then the idea is you need to be able to push that demand back into a marketplace of potential users of the data. So I have to think more about what that would exactly look like. But the main thing is to identify demand signals because people will invest depending on the business. Yes, yeah, and that, that's a great point. And, and that, that process does exist in, Noah, in, in many of the places in NOAA because it is a very much a customer facing service organization mm -hmm. uh, that are gathered from that user community come in and inform NOAA and for future investment and stuff yep. like that. There's not a um, probably an effective communication right now of those requirements to the commercial sector yep. right now. So it is kind of a, it, it comes into NOAA and gets cooked down in NOAA but doesn't maybe get shared effectively right now. Right. Uh, with uh, with the commercial side. So there's just just really quick follow up on it. There's a th there are some organizations that exist out there wh which specialize in identifying potential participants. Um, spent some time last week working on an X Prize definition, and X Prize is really good at identifying the entrepreneurs who might actually be interested in taking advantage of something. In that in their case, if a prize is actually available to do it, and the way they do that is they build groups of people, uh, networks of people to go out and who are who are plugged in, I mean, you'd be a great example, who are plugged into the, that environment, and then take advantage of that, and then they basically, if you said, we have demand for these three things, they could do the distribution for you. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great point, and uh, on, on the slides you saw, I, I didn't mention it in my comments, but that the ocean data have been much harder to move than the uh, meteorological data, for example, because of the market or whatever. Yeah. Um, but at the Marine Alliance meeting that's coming up in San Diego next month, there is indeed an X-Prize that's being announced. Yeah. On, it, yeah. on uh, use of ocean data, yes, exactly. So it's a great idea. And Alan, um, I might add, one of the, I was the things we've been thinking about with all of our senior career leadership is exactly what you have been just saying. And we're going to talk about it this afternoon. I was looking at my colleague, Laura McGorman, who together with Nancy Potok, the de deputy director at Census, is going to be leading a working group going forward on issues like that. How do you engage? Uh, director of the census who, John Thompson, who's also been very supportive of this kind of engagement is here today. So I'm, I welcome that comment uh, really because we're thinking hard about it. We look forward to getting more specific and down in the weeds on that very issue. Um, I also wanted to, to I, I know I talked about this at the top of the meeting, but part of our institutionalization goal is to have a lot of this work 
that the leadership in the bureau, like Ed, like in our bureaus and around the department, like Ed and others, are really carrying the torch forward. And that we, we've created this data uh, internally at Commerce really have meaningful coordination at the career level going forward. And they're going to come up with the governance structure driven by our own leadership rather than some top-down approach. And I'm, I really appreciate Ed and Tom both leading that. We have a working group, as I mentioned, led by Laura McGorman, Jeff Chen, um, and Nancy Potok that's thinking about the big issues. And that's a lot of really interesting work there. And on the technology acquisition, which we spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, especially through this new opportunity on the joint venture process. We have uh, Avi Bender, Sham Sunder, and our uh, deputy undersecretary here, Brad Burke, who's in, been an absolutely critical member of our leadership team, are gonna be leading that working group as well. So uh, I appreciate, Ed, your not only work on this, but on an inter-bureau uh, vision of how we all work together going forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the lightning round talks. Uh, we are going, can I just have a quick round of <laughs> um, Thank you all very much. I'm going to, I'm going to take just a minute before we go into the, the Data Academy, Natasha, just one minute. Uh, I noticed that Natalie Evans Harris, I'm sure she's going to be excited that I'm just going to call you up here, but Natalie is, um, are one of the leaders in the White House is a senior policy advisor for open data and has been leading the uh, data cabinet efforts and also is one of the main uh, forces behind the Opportunity Project. And since we have her here, uh, I'm just gonna call you up, Natalie, if you don't mind saying a few words. I do think it's important because we've had questions, you may have missed it, from our uh, data uh, advisory council on how we're interacting with uh, the data cabinet, how, how, well, just a minute or so to introduce yourself and talk about those two efforts. And obviously our, our members would be happy to ask you questions. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Natalie Evans Harris and OSTP. As you know, the um, administration has been very focused on opening up data and getting government to maximize the value of the data. So starting at the beginning of this year, we created a data cabinet, which is a community of practice focused around identifying strategies, best practices, key tips, tricks, and tools in order to be able to help agencies to do just that figure out how to build their data capacity and what can be done in order to advance whole of government, the way that we're using data, both within our agencies and across the federal government against our, nation, our, against our national priorities. So we started with about 20 CDOs at the beginning of this year. Ian was one of them. And we've now grown to about 200 or so individuals that meet on a monthly basis to discuss these challenges. The three key challenges that were identified and we created working groups around were data talent, with which Natasha has been a, a leader, lies the role of the CDO, and how do we um, create pathways to understanding what data talent can and should be doing in the federal government. Second working group is around data resource management, so that data life cycle and how do we make sure that we're responsibly leveraging data, so not just opening it up, but making sure that we're actually collecting and managing and protecting it properly. Uh, and then the third working group is around um, what we're calling data policy. So what they did was they created this, that, um, this maturity model which defines federal data capacity across three lane, across six different lanes. So not taking it out of just the IT conversation and actually talking about the governance of it, the analytics capabilities, the talent, <laughs> the systems, technologies, and all those different things. And they created a self-assessment tool for data leadership to be able to assess where they are capacity-wise and then look towards where they want to go in the future and how to We've identified these three tools. Happy to share them with the group if you're interested. And in addition to doing that, um, we also created a data science subcommittee under our National Science and Technology Council. And so that group is chartered through next year and it's all of the senior data leaders that have responsibilities across the enterprise of their organization. So Ed Kearns is one of the CDOs that's a part of that group in addition to additional department leaders. And that group is responsible for making sure that data influences the national science and technology investments that we make across the administration. So working closely with 
with the NIDR-D folks, um, informing the decisions that are made across the administration. They're actually working on just the side, and that will be published to the community in order to inform the investment decisions, not only within the agencies, but private sector and academia as well. So it's almost setting a data agenda. So that should be out in December. We're going to have a huge event because you know how the White House does. Um, <laughs> and we'll use that as an opportunity to engage with the private sector and academia to talk about solutions to these challenges. So as we produce that report and when pages are available, happy to share that with the group and get your thoughts on things that could be done, say, in the first 100 days of the next administration to really advance those challenges. Um, oh, and then we've also identified in particular agencies identify, identify missions that as an opportunity and, um, and Austin and now Bruce. Uh, so we're working out that we already have a new. <laughs> but um, I want to give an opportunity. I was also struck when I've gone through, uh, connectivity from our, our missions with yours has been terrific. But um, I don't know if you want to comment on that or if anybody questions for. Uh, presents information. Get it all out to you. Okay. It won the awards from, um, from, um, uh, what was it? The Fed Scoop. Fed Scoop. I apologize. There's yeah. a slide about it. Don't program worry. <laughs> program of the year. So Natasha has really been leading that effort, and uh, Academy. Great. So just give you a little bit of background about where we came from, and um, okay. So the three some completely products and services. We also applied to the commerce interested in in watching those videos, hearing we got we way. So, so those were in person and about 250 online via WebEx for live streaming. So we live, uh, live courses are a very important part of our program, ask questions. And then our in-residence program, we just, as I mentioned earlier, we had 13 people graduate from the program and they finished their details with us in September of this year. So segment of in training them in principles of data science and use cases and building teams and tools and methods and also data product Im implementation. So we had a good so far too. Um, we also encourage all of our students to continually learn after they finish working with us or even after they've had a course, we always point them to all sorts of online resources that they can back. Mostly been doing skills in depth for people. Um, we are really making sure that we modulate staff to affect the best way to, to launch the next round of the in-residence program, which won't happen until after the new year. But, um, but again, that's, that, that was a huge success. From FedScoop. <laughs> when people who are brand new at coding get going on their sort of, you know, dual expectations we, at the we same time. We didn't recognize the first time around how much um, mentorship was, was, was needed and helpful for the, for the detailees coming in. And so what we want to do now is structure that mentorship so that it's worked in more effectively to the expectations of the staff on the CDS team so that they're not just all of a sudden to do 10 more hours or whatever. Interested in, so I hope that we'll be able to talk about the need to um, uh, market and brand the outputs of uh, the, the work that, that you all are doing. And it struck me that, just as you said, that you couldn't have a better advertisement for the success of the Academy than some of the speakers that we had here. I was thinking little video of just how incredibly effective the program that you're building is, and I would suggest. Definitely, and we've all already made plans <coughs> to release blogs from each one, and I know Katya's gonna ask about some of the resources and where they're available, so I'll stop. Back to Cesar, you're using open um, sites such as uh, CodePen.io that you mentioned, but also some others. As you know, many, many industries, they have extensive days at Boeing has a massive set of uh, 1,200 courses and they still can't train enough, uh, fast enough ultimately because technology is progressing so quickly and so uh, for major companies. And so I think you will also get to the point that you um, will be partnering more and more with uh, to get really all the courses you need. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, training trainers or teaching teachers is a very good idea, and I think what you're doing is uh, to train the first generation, which then trains the second generation in their own home uh, departments within the Bureau. Um, and I also really like the idea to uh, feature those which uh, did that extra um, effort and how much uh, 
faster and better they can do their job and potentially also how much now. That's, Great. That's a terrific point, Patsy, and uh, Alan, and then Dana. Um, so it's just building on the, the, the question of how this would interact with um, resources that exist on the net for training. Th there are a lot of training courses out there for some of the things you're doing, mm -hmm. but some of the training you're doing undoubtedly is unique. Maybe it's unique to the commerce data or wh whatever it might be. Um, so have you considered taking your courses and putting them on edX or putting them on, uh, it's a, I like the idea that it's like the crown jewel for uh, data, for the data, pro uh, data effort here. But in terms of getting the word out that commerce actually does this and commerce has all these great data sets and so forth, being sort of broadly recognized as a teacher in this area will go a long way towards getting people involved in using the data after they, they get it out. So I would love to have on edX, like one of the top three to five courses in the world of data <coughs> science comes from the Commerce Department. Yes, and we're actually working on all of the courses that we've recorded. We're <coughs> closed captioning right now, so they'll be 508 compliant. And then, uh, yeah, we definitely would like to move forward. Even some of the MOOCs that Kati told me about, the massive open online courses, we want to we want to get into that uh, community as well. And 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 it's a great marketing tool for our staff. I mean. The, these same staff that were expected to mentor and do their own jobs are also teaching our classes, and so we want to give them visibility and, and have them see the benefit of that uh, professionally as well. So, so it, I mean, it really serves a lot of different purposes, all for good. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what kind of um, <coughs> alumni-type programs you're thinking about for your um, graduates, and, you know, if you've thought, you know, just kind of even both short term and long term, you know, what kind of structure you want to put in place there, because that's often very important in developing um, both kind of impact and culture and keeping the networks alive, but also just, you know, keeping people remembering that, yeah, they, they started there, even if they go somewhere else and keeping. And I mean, we, we only have a few alumni yet, <laughs> but um, we, d we have a Slack channel for them specifically. Um, <laughs> and we're also, I don't know, we're open to suggestions on that. I, that's a new thing, because we only just graduated them in September. But um, I think the key thing is, is giving them opportunities and giving them support in their bureaus to continue developing their skills, because these skills, if you don't use them, you lose them very quickly. So, so that would be one thing we'd be looking to find some ways of getting them support ongoing. Um, they're not going to be able to continue at the, the pace they've been going because they're doing their other jobs now. But, but thinking about that, I, I think it's a good thing to uh, start a conversation around. Um, I don't know, what other kinds of alumni networks could we, does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Or? That's a very good point. Daniel, we're thinking not only at the strategic level about the alumni, alumni network for the detailees, but also for the cohort of, of tech, you know, um, folks who actually come through CDS, mm -hmm. right? So we're the goal is we're going to have, and we're, and we're implementing this, we're going to have some members of our overall data team that are going to be long-term employees, and we're going to have folks that come in for one year and three years, and we're, we're happy with that, right? We're happy with the idea that we're going to have cohorts. And I know it's on our leadership, or, you know, especially Jeff, uh, Jeff's um, radar to think about that. Jeff Chen and Jeff Meisel have been thinking about that. How do we capture the spirit of the cohorts and to keep that network going as we go out? Um, and it'll be part of our long-term plan on that side too. Are you doing micro-credentials for this? Sorry, Mark. Are you doing micro-credentials micro or micro-degrees for this? Oh, it, oh, like certificates. Yeah, or, but, but I mean, something like that so but, that they but have... But specifically things which then can be picked up and sort of transferred to other departments within commerce or other departments within the government. It would be great if the outcome of this would stick with the employee who took the thing and, and follow them around. Oh, I see. Yeah, like those little... Kind of like the program management. Yeah. I think you brought that. That's a great suggestion. We'll look into yeah, that. definitely. Great. Okay, so... May I? Yeah. So we're only a few minutes late, um, which is cool. Uh, we have a, a working lunch set up with the CDAC and members of our executive data executive council. Um, we'll be escorted to that in the back of the room. 
so, so that's sort of the next step. We're going to read a journey. So we're adjourning for lunch, and we're going to reconvene here at about 1220. So um, what's that? 120, 120. 1220 would be a little, <laughs> little fast. Hey, we're so fishing, yeah, so let's gather fishing. in the back, and, and people will escort us forward. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in a few. Can we leave stuff here? Sure. Yes. Yeah, you can leave stuff here. prepare them adequately and that they needed to that's that's a nice too quick
Okay.
Probably not. Let's just go two slides. Okay. It gets, gets a little bit towards the, the top. Okay. Um, we're know. still talking. Just yeah. get up and go. <laughs> just let you know that I know. There's always, I found at the end of the meeting, toward the end of the meeting, there's always a few people left to get up and leave. That's fine. Just put some stuff outside so there is a little bit of star light on the. Just I understand. Pretend. That's fine. <laughs> you don't have to apologize. That's great. <laughs> Send you the link, Jeff. We'll be calling to order in a couple minutes, so uh, be prepared for that. We're gonna wait a minute to see if they can. Okay. Are you ready, Jeff? My name. Jeff's gonna have to go join us, so link is up. Is it up? Is it? Well, will you text me when it's actually up? Because I want to say something. Okay. Oh, should I? Is there? Where do I find the? I will. Um, 
No, no, send me an email. I'll send you an email. Okay. Okay. Is that what she had in mind for that? Oh, it was perfect. Yeah. Didn't you enjoy it? Yeah. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it looked like everybody was talking, and I, and I thought, okay, I see data people talking to CDAC member there, and That's I see exactly it happening there, hoping, and I see it in there. Yeah, great. No, it was good. We'll get started in about one minute. All right, let's come back together and get started again. I'll let Justin take it from here. We move into a discussion with Dana Boyd. <coughs> All right, uh, why don't we have everybody uh, reconvene here. And I always know that right after lunch, people uh, can come in a little sleepy-eyed. And so we wanted to wake everybody up, and we thought one of the best ways to do that would be to have Dana Boyd lead our next session. <laughs> um, I, I want me to talk <laughs> like this. Exactly, Dana, exactly. <laughs> I, um, I have obviously really benefited from uh, a number of uh, meetings and discussions with Dana as we've been thinking about our broader policy uh, and thought leadership on this area. Um, for the last couple of months, we have been really speaking about the idea of data inequality. How do you make sure that the data we have is getting to all parts of society so that they can use it? Who should be using it? Um, are charities, nonprofits, small and medium-sized entities really enabled to use and drive growth or solutions through our data? Or you know, candidly, is it going, by opening up our data and building these tools, is the data then going to the same consumers that are already using it? It's kind of a, an analog the way we've been talking about uh, income inequality. This income inequality uh, as a social and economic issue is something here at Commerce we've been very worried about, the President's been very worried about, and we saw the potential for the same kind of concerns around data, if you think about it as an asset. Are we really making sure that we're setting it up so that everybody can use it, benefit, grow, address public problems? Dana is obviously a thought leader on this issue, and so I'm gonna turn it over for what I'm sure will be a, an interesting, <laughs> challenging discussion. He puts it in such nice political terms. He basically told me that to be provocative, which is fun. Um, and my goal today is really to talk about some of the challenges that we face and to, in return, challenge some of our really basic assumptions, the things that we hold dear. Because many of us share this sort of belief in uh, data and technology as being an amazing opportunity. And I do too, but I want to undermine some of that um, by giving some examples and some ways of challenging our thinking. Um, we are here because we see the potential. We imagine the potential. We don't necessarily always think about the adversaries. We think about all of the opportunities in which we can use technology to make society better. But what if our passion project, our commitment to thinking about data, will actually start to hurt the people that we're trying to help? What if we are actually building a project that will increase inequality? That's the fundamental question that I want to ask today and I want to play with. So how many of you think discrimination is a bad thing? Got it. Good. That's good. <laughs> you know, the silence there is meant to guilt you into answering it the way that I want you to, but in some ways, I actually just gave you a complete trick question. Because it all depends on how we actually define discrimination. When I say discrimination, most of us think about the unjust uh, and prejudicial treatment uh, based on protected categories that we often talk about in terms of social issues. But discrimination actually has a mathematical and economic root. Um, it's really much core to a lot of what we do when we do data science. Um, the practices of uh, data cleaning, clustering data, running statistical correlations, et cetera, are all practices that are about using information to discern one set of information from another. The big question presented by data these data practices is who gets to choose what are the acceptable boundaries we operate with? 
Who gets to decide the values and trade-offs of a given priority? Who gets to make the decisions that actually do the analysis that segment data? And when we segment data, we end up segmenting people in interesting ways. Now, I would argue there is nothing about doing data analysis that is at all neutral. What and how data is collected, how the data is cleaned and stored, what models are constructed, and what questions are asked, all of this is a deeply political project. And more often than not, when we talk in technical terms, we like to pretend that the political aspect of it is not actually playing out, that we can get away from the political. We don't have to think about the political. But I want to push back and say that we cannot punt this down the line. We have to acknowledge the political at every turn if we're going to do data science and data projects right. We have to acknowledge where this can actually turn in unexpected ways and account for it in our design, our development, and our deployment. So I'm going to give a couple of different examples of where this plays out at different parts of the process. Um, and I'm going to begin by actually talking about where open data can play out into a project that we didn't necessarily hope for. Hope for. And this concerns what is the role of open data? So most of us really have a belief that open data is good. And a lot of where that belief comes from is a belief in informing the public getting people engaged, that knowledge will be empowering, that knowledge will lead us to a socially good place. But what if that's not actually what happens? So in the New York City, um, there's a uh, Department of Education opened up data about schools um, through its school performance dashboard. Some of you may be familiar with dashboards like this. Um, if you don't actually like their interface, you can actually use other services like Inside Schools, which is also powered by the New York City Department of Education data. The purpose of these systems is exactly like what we imagine whenever we build an open data project. Let's empower people. And in this case, let's empower parents and families to make the best choices around school for them and their children and their families and their community. But um, school choice is an extremely political matter. Um, and the value uh, of the data that the Department of Education collects runs straight into the fraught nature of the value of education. What makes a school good? Is it about test scores, student makeup, parent ratings? Different families have different values, so they read the data in different ways. And this is often considered a feature, not a bug, because we want people to choose the school that's best for them. And we take it from this very individual-centric perspective, that if we actually empower each family to have all of the information that they could possibly get their hands on, they will make an informed and meaningful choice, and it will be good. Unfortunately, a school choice um, uh, based on data presents a series of challenges. First are the challenges that we normally think about. This is about the fact that we deal with populations who don't necessarily know how to read statistics, right? The general population doesn't know how to read statistics. And let's be honest, in New York City, we're dealing with a lot of families who don't even know how to read English. Um, and so this is where we see this moment where we're not necessarily even coming to the table evenly. Second, school ranking, which is what the, the action you can take uh, when you have school choice, is actually dependent on geography. So making information available about all of these different communities, you can find out that there are phenomenal schools in Manhattan, and if you live in Queens, there is nothing you can do about that. Your choices are really constrained by a whole set of other decisions. So the fact that you have this information makes you feel more um, disconnected from the ability to do something, whereas the people who have the economic power can simply get up and move. And guess what? Wealthy families do that all the time in New York. Third, some families have a lot more time to devote to trying to make sense of that dashboard, trying to think through what it means, to try to think through what it means for them. And if they don't have time, they can outsource it. There are tons of organizations in New York City that you can actually pay to walk through all of this data for you to survey you and figure out what the right school choice is. Again, an economic uh, division that's happening. You get the idea, right? These are the kinds of classic unevennesses where we're reminded that openness doesn't necessarily uh, achieve the inequality gap. Um, but that's actually not even the biggest problem for this kind of open data project. Um, what's not discussed in all this process um, is how public good and individual desire are often in conflict. And nowhere is that more critical than when we think about the project of education. What is the project of education? Are we really working on skill development of individuals, or is there a more community project uh, component to it all? 
Mazarin Banaji is a phenomenal researcher at Harvard who has done fantastic work looking at how hard diversity is in the workforce. Many of you know the basic story, the more diverse the workforce is, um, the more successful it is in a whole set of different measures. But what Mazarin has shown consistently is that the more diverse a workforce is, the less happy people think they are and the lower they think their performance is. Their perception of performance is not actually connected to actual measures. They're connected to feel the feelings, the emotional aspects of it. Guess what? School choice prompt, uh, prompts the same sort of emotional reactions. And um, we see the kinds of self-segregation um, that we would see in any other workforce unless you make a committed effort to actually trying to get people to engage across difference. In New York City, black families choose to uh, schools that are predominantly black, white families choose schools that are predominantly white, and New York City has the highest rate of self-segregation of any city in the country. And the more that we have opened up data, the more that we have self-segregated. It's an interesting challenge to our basic assumption that this data would actually be good, because we want it to be good, but we're grappling with the very real and raw emotions and dynamics. And what is the question that we often ask about what does it mean to make individual choices in light of very collective processes? So when we open up data, are we empowering people to come together or to come apart? Are we giving them the tools to make choices for themselves at the expenses of the collection? And who gets to determine the values and the trade-offs that are going on there? Because in some ways, we're actually coming into a basic notion of what is our democracy and what is populism as it relates to our democracy. It isn't clear even what we want out of these projects. And so when we open up data and we don't know what the clear agenda is, who actually is getting to make these decisions? And that's where there's a lot of power vacuums that get filled by people who are often looking to reify existing structural dynamics. And some of those may not be the kinds of political work that we want to see done. So let's talk a little bit about equity. I put equity at the front and center of any equation that I care about when I think about data. And I acknowledge that this is a deeply political commitment. It suggests that the social good matters more than the individual equality issues, and it is something that is actually controversial within this, in this cultural environment. And part of the problem is, is that data actually forces us to contend with moments when equality and equity are in contradiction. So unless you're a statistician, you probably haven't been following the debates over North Point's Compass, um, which is an algorithmic tool that's used to assess whether or not somebody who has been arrested deserves to receive bail. I know most of you don't follow criminal justice in detail, um, but bail is actually a really significant process in the US system because it is determining of a whole set of things and a whole set of outcomes that we care about. If you get bail, you are more likely to keep your job, your house, your children, your spouse, et cetera. If you don't get bail, you're more likely to plead guilty even when you're not. Um, and due to the longevity in which people often sit in jail, many people plead guilty even when they are innocent just to get back to actually having a job. And so you know, keep in mind 93% of all cases in the United States are plead out. So how does a judge fairly determine if someone deserves bail? Because that is at the front of this process. We, if we assume innocence before proven um, guilty, we assume somebody is innocent. How do we determine whether they're free as they stand and wait for trial or whether they, whether they are to be uh, incarcerated? The idea is that we will, we will jail people, we will keep them incarcerated, we will keep them um, uh, from freedom in order to protect the safety of the public. But who gets to make that decision? Now, historically, what we know is that judicial decisions have been extraordinarily, extraordinarily biased, if not just frankly racist. Um, and so what's come into play is the idea of we should just use more data to try to figure this out. And risk assessment tools have been developed and deployed, and it's a big thing right now in criminal justice. It's how do we empower judges to be able to make meaningful decisions about whether or not somebody is a risk? And so what's happened is these tools have been developed to neutralize that analysis to, make, to help judges make better decisions. They do not do the work of judges, but they inform judges. And the idea is that they are quote unquote neutral third parties. Of course, the reality is, is that if a judge is given that information and they don't follow for it, they're in a lot more trouble than if they actually did abide by it and they were wrong. So a few months ago, ProPublica produced a controversial article um, based on the notion of equity, challenging Broward County's uh, process and arguing that it was a racist process. Um, conflict of interest note, uh, one of my fellows was deeply involved in that work and did a lot of the technical analysis. 
the findings that ProPublica came up with showed that um, blacks who had never reoffended, which is one of the cornerstones of the algorithm, were twice as likely to be classified as medium or high risk and therefore be denied bail than whites. Right? In other words, they were more likely to suffer the consequences of bail, even though they were not going to reoffend. Now, North Point retorted, um, reporting that um, they had designed the system so that blacks and whites are equally likely to reoffend based on their scores. And mind you, this analysis actually plays out across different racial spectrum, but the most clearly visible is, is the tension between black and whites. Um, and uh, what, what was at stake is actually a really interesting tension, one that we know statistically. It's a question of false positives versus false negatives, and it's not resolvable. It's a question of which one is fair. A quality of likelihood versus equity of outcomes. Um, a knowledge ahead of time in terms of trying to uh, make the data proportional versus what actually happens on the outside. Now, the reason for this is really obvious. Black and brown people in the United States are more likely to be arrested for the same activities as whites, and that is only getting worse. They're more likely to be charged harshly, they're more likely to be punished, they're more likely to enter into the criminal justice system vortex where they're more likely to get into trouble in the future because their opportunities are so limited. In other words, North Point isn't actually assessing whether or not people are engaging in criminal activity, but whether or not they're likely to be arrested, charged, and convicted. They're relying on biased data, and they're predicting outcomes that reinforce an already biased system. They're reifying the structure because that's the data that's available to them. And when that's the data that's available to them, that's what they are using. And the question is not whether or not this is good data. The question is whether or not we can, we can actually do the work that we want to do. So this is a problem we're also seeing in predictive policing. Sociological work is very clear on this. Uh, whites are more likely to use and sell drugs than any other population. Not just marijuana, but everything from coke to heroin. Yet in the United States, blacks are more likely to be arrested, charged, and convicted of drug-related crimes. And thus, when we feed this back into the system, we predict that black and brown individuals are the ones who are going to engage in criminal justice activities that involve drugs. And indeed, with predictive policing techniques, we send cops to do drug arrests to low-income communities of color predominantly. We don't send them to the frat parties, that, for which I can promise you there are a lot of whites engaging in illicit drug practices. So folks are using data, um, not, often not knowing that they're prioritizing equality over equity. What many fail to realize is that they're not even achieving equality because they don't know that they're lacking the data to do so. They don't know who is not in the system. They're only looking at who is in the system. And when the systematic data collection process is biased, we create feedback loops that are fundamentally biased. And we bias the system the whole way through. We lose the ability to course correct, to be able to figure out what's going on. This is how we cement the status quo. And the question is, how do we keep from doing that in the things that we care about the most? So many of you might be familiar with Latanya Sweeney's um, a startling experiment, but if you aren't, I want to share it with you. As a computer scientist and the former cha um, chief technologist of the FTC, Latanya has a good sense of machine learning um, and uh, how they work as systems. So one day, she was doing what many of us search, uh, do, do, and she did an ego search on Google. She wanted to see what would happen if she searched for her own name. Um, and when she searched for her name, she noticed something funny which is that she kept getting products which were criminal justice related products. Questions about Latanya, you know, Latanya arrested. And she was just like, Mur? right? She has no arrest record. She didn't understand why this could possibly coming up. And so she decided as a computer scientist that she would actually try to figure this out. So she captured um, baby names in the United States um, and the correlation between baby names and race over a 20 year period. Um, and she threw them at Google just to see what kind of ads that would, uh, she would receive in return. Not surprisingly, the names that were um, black baby names were far more likely to receive criminal justice related products than the names that were white baby names. Now, she knows that Google is not selling information based on the race of a name. She knows that. But what she does know is that the way that their ad infrastructure works is that it really depends on who clicks on what ads. And it trains the data. And that, it basically evolves because, of course, Google wants to make certain that ads are um, put in a position where people are more likely to click on it. That's how money is made. And so what happened is, is that the population as a whole, the people who are using Google, when they search for people with predominantly black names, were far more likely to click on criminal justice related products than when they search for white names. In other words, 
they trained Google how to be racist in America, right? And Google was able to feed that right back at them. All of this is done not because Google designed it to be that way, but because Google decided, designed it to learn from the feedback loops. And when we design to learn from the feedback loops, we learn societal prejudice as part of it. And that is that process that we start to see, and we don't have a way of necessarily accounting for it. Now, part of it is, is that categorization in America is extremely fraught. Um, no one knows this better than census, um, and it's always delightful to see census work so hard to figure out these different dynamics. Because um, there's a long history of trying to figure out how to categorize people, and I actually love it. The, you know, the, it's one of my favorite things is to see the history of census and trying to figure out race in America. Um, of course, this is not something that's unique to the United States. Um, and in fact, you know, a book that I really recommend for anybody who does data science work is a book called Sorting Things Out by Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr. And it's about the process and politics of trying to categorize. Um, and it's about apartheid South Africa and the ripple effects of what happened when we tried to categorize people. And it went terribly awry, as you can imagine, where families were split apart when they had children that were darker than themselves. Um, and it, it, it shaped everything from housing policy, et cetera. And we can look at apartheid South Africa and be like, that was a horrible situation, and it's really glad we're done with it. At the same time, keep in mind that that's the reality of American systems as well. So families have been split apart in the United States for a long time because of how we deal with racial categorization. And anti-miscegenation laws in the US were based on very much the same set of logic. Um, the categories that census used this day actually shape a lot of politics and policies about how we even think about race. It also affects economic decisions um, uh, and a way that politics try to think about gerrymandering, not to mention the illegal practices of redlining that still go on. Dana, I, I don't want to yeah. force you, but, but we have about 15 minutes for discussion, so okay. I just want to make sure we have it. Sure. Get to Got it. Um, so well, keep in mind that in the United States, um, how Native American tribes receive fiscal support is dependent on how people categorize them as Indians in the census. Now, the problem with contemporary data analytics, um, or I should say, finally, one of the things about the census is that they've done a really good job of trying to battle these things through. But at the same time, in industry, we run into it all the time. We categorize people, and we don't think about the ripple effects of it. And when we think about combining data from industry with co combining data with political data, we have to think about how this has been a very fraught process. Now, contemporary data analytics, um, you know, basically, often uh, get away from being able to think about machine-readable uh, descriptors. One of the things that was fascinating was the Federal Trade Commission uh, was actually investigating data brokers and found some foolish data brokers who actually labeled people with things like thrifty elders and urban scramble. But most data analysis doesn't work this way. It's not as explicitly prejudicial. Most data analysis makes prejudicial decision as part of its clustering uh, without having any understanding of the people and the properties that they're using. It's simply math. But that math and the decisions that are made by that math have serious ramifications. So let's talk about what's happening right now in the jobs ecosystem. If you want to get a job at a company like Walmart, your resume will be filtered through third-party uh, application tracking systems, where it will be analyzed to assume how resumes are matching um, against others who have succeeded at that job. As we've talked about before, this is matching to already problematic data. Um, but it also means that what has happened in, in these kinds of things is that we decide we're going to remove categories that are protected categories, race, gender, et cetera. But the systems relearn it. And one of the things that we're consistently seeing in these kinds of uh, systems is that they basically build new proxies for it. Now, here's where I think that there's something beautiful going on, because there's a way of actually remedying this, technical remedies for this. So Sorel Friedler and her colleagues have proposed ways to mathematically renormalize training data sets as a way of getting around this, which I think is a pretty phenomenal intervention. It's not necessarily a way of perfectly dealing with bias, but it's a way of starting to go after it. So I really recommend paying attention to a whole community of people called Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning and Computer Science, because they're looking for technical interventions to this. But as they're looking for these interventions, we're also seeing how these problems have been uh, come up over and over again. I want to conclude by giving a few moments on accountability, because as we move towards open data and the more sophisticated algorithms, we need to start explicitly stating our values and grappling with holding those things accountable. Accountability isn't simple. In fact, one of the biggest problems right now is that we don't know how to have the tools to do accountability well. And this is where I sort of laugh whenever um, folks in commerce are asking for us, the, us, us in industry to do things well, because there are so many gaps of what we're doing in industry around these issues. We're not there yet. We don't actually even know how to check on, around what these systems. Google didn't design for prejudice. 
they know they're being used as such, but they don't always know how to fix it. Facebook didn't design for conspiracy theorists to manipulate their algorithms, but they're getting used that way, and they're trying to struggle with it. Walmart didn't design for third-party vendors to be engaged in these kinds of practices, but they're getting used that way. And the government is in a different position um, than most corporations. If you get a ridiculous advertisement, you'll laugh. It's funny. I love being labeled as a trucker. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, but it's not so funny when people are incarcerated. It's not so funny when people, um, their, their um, ability to actually uh, have freedom and flexibility, their ability to get a job is curtailed. That's what the government is here to protect, to make certain that we actually address these biases in a critical way. And here's where I want to tell you the work of Madeline Ellish for a second. She was studying the history of autopilot in aviation, right? autonomous systems. And the FAA had a whole set of uh, conversations in the 1970s around this about how important it was to keep a human in a loop in case of an emergency. Now, most of you fly on a regular basis, and you probably know, even if you don't want to think about it, that your flight is by and large not actually flown by a pilot anymore. It is fly flown by an autonomous system. That that pilot's job is to step in in case of emergency. But what it means is that we have somebody who's sitting in a cockpit who has been systematically de-skilled on the job, hasn't really flown a plane in quite a long time, who is supposed to step in in the hardest part of the problem. Right? That's a scary situation. And what that means is that that per person's real purpose is to be a liability sponge. They are there to suck up the liability when everything goes awry. And Madeline refers to this as the moral crumple zone, the moment in which we're keeping humans in the loop just so that they can play the role of a crumple zone. Think about your car, right? And what does it mean when we're thinking about things in this way, where we're not really thinking about the ethics of long-term complex systems? And that's where I would argue we need to conclude as we think about accountability. We need to think about accountability in terms of the interactions of large-scale systems. It's not about individual actors. It's about understanding the interplay between them, the resistance, the manipulation, the games that are being played, the political agendas, the issues of inequality that come into being. And as we think about that, we take accountability seriously, which is one of the things that I think that the government can do, we can come up with a better way to actually make certain that we deal with our digital future. Thank you. Wow, you didn't, uh, there were I'll no stop. issues at all baked into... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you've definitely seeded a really interesting conversation. I love the fact that there's so many folks at this table that can react to the issues that you brought up. So who's going to jump in first? Come on, guys. You are not that quiet. Okay. Nice. Um, first, thanks. I think that's a, a great um, intro to an interesting conversation. I guess I'm wondering if you can, um, maybe two things here. One, you know, based on the conversation we've had today, you know, bring some of that discussion. How do you, I mean, how would you, I guess, first start thinking about advising commerce on how they can actually take these ideas and turn them into some kind of action within the commerce data service. Um, and two, I mean, as you were talking, I'm, I'm constantly coming back to this idea of, um, you know, you have segmentation in government historically, right? Everyone has their role. Um, sometimes that was a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. But, you know, should we think about commerce data or any kind of data service as being somewhat distinct? So, you know, they have a goal and their mission is to make the data public or make the APIs work well. And, you know, as much as we care about these other issues, you know, do we say, well, you know, the ultimate purpose of whatever data service is still not to necessarily achieve these different outcomes. We have policy folks working on that end. So on the education example, you know, if we're, if we're not happy with school choice, we change education policy, we don't change transparency in schools. So how do we kind of reconcile those two ideas? Right. So f to your first question, I think one of the things that's not always visible to, uh, about industry to those outside of it is how many different groups of people exist to try to break the system. Whether we're talking hackers in a security sense, we're talking about people who are actually thinking about adversaries, that that logic has to be baked into the process. And I think that one of the challenges is that we make visible the process of like all the awesome imaginations. But there's structures that have to be put into place to actually think about where everything can go wrong. And what's interesting is it's often not the same people, because it's very hard to hold those people in the same position, which is that 
the folks who are the imaginations, the big eyes, right, the Ians, like they have to be like, ooh, let's do what this cool thing's over here, that's great. And it's like, please go ahead, kumbaya, that's fabulous. But you need other structures that are your backbone. And nowhere is that more important than in a government agency. You need a hacker mindset to be existing alongside the person building security. And the same is true for these kinds of social issues. In terms of transparency, I think part of it is, is that we really have to contend with what is the outcomes of transparency that we're uh, uh, hoping to achieve. And realizing that transparency sitting alone, data access, open data alone, may actually work against the goals that we're trying to get there. And so a lot of it is thinking about rollout. When you're rolling out the process of making data available, how are you also making certain that everything from the policies to the skills to be able to use that data to the dynamics, uh, you know, bureaucratically and politically around it are aligned in a way where it's not going to be misused. And realizing that, well, so one of the things that's funny about, about industry is that little startups can do things and play with data with an audience of 50 people and no one cares, right? Because they're off in their la la land and they're experimenting and then they grow up and become big companies and they think of themselves as still a startup and that's where all sorts of fraught issues happen. Companies, like the big companies that are sitting around this table, we can't roll something out and just hope it will be used well because things go terribly awry when you start with scale. The government starts with scale. You don't, you don't get the privilege of just doing a little experiment over here. You have the media in your face. You have adversaries in your face. And so the result is, is you have to think through things rather than being able to move at the speed that a startup can think like. And I, this is one of the things I struggle with when everybody's like, think like a startup. I'm like, no, don't, because they break systems and it's okay when it all fails. It is not okay when commerce fails. And so I think a lot of it is understanding what is the risk that you are willing to take and what is the failure that you're willing to accept. And if that failure means people going to jail, that's not okay. If that failure means you know, businesses collapsing, people dying due to weather data experiments, that is not okay. And so that's where it's like understanding what the dynamics there are are so critical to this process. Um, and so it's the, the idea and the fetishization with moving fast may not be good enough. So we have, I think we're gonna go Stan, Bill, Allen. Yeah, Stan, Colin, Bill, Allen. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Stan, thanks, that was really thought provoking. Um, on several fronts, so and kudos for getting in in that amount of time, touching on so many points. Um, I guess I heard, I ultimately interpret kind of largely what you described. Uh, there were parts of it early on where I was hearing, and maybe in your remarks just now, a little bit of open data is potentially dangerous, which I concede it is. But also it seems like um, what I ultimately took away was the thinking, it's important to think about open data is a journey, not as a destination. But that doesn't mean that it's still, it's a good journey. And the fact that you can't get it right on the first iteration, we should be vigilant to the downfalls of that, or the pitfalls of not getting it right on the first iteration. But um, that feels like that's still okay. That at least the, 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 the what motivates, I think, open data initiatives is the fact that there, there is a truth out there and it will get to that truth faster through transparency. And you're right that like in, in your school example, we may make initial you know, you know, things where we're looking at just school rankings explicitly and then we don't factor in the fact that those rankings are just a factor of who lives in that area and that's not a good way to judge it. But then the next iteration is something that looks at the value add of the school and maybe that's not perfect either but it feels like then it sets in place this iteration cycle where we eventually end up in a better place. And uh, yeah. So, and, and then I would think that like, it, it creates a marketplace of ideas where then ProPublica can come back and say, hey, you've created this, this predictive algorithm which actually is relearning a bias because the training set you gave it was biased. Um, but that, that, that in, ends up, sounds like creating a good iteration where you then figure out how do you, you know, reweight that data set or in the Walmart example where you can reweight it in order to end up with a, a less a racial and ethnically biased predictive model. So first off, let's be clear, ProPublica reverse engineered it um, because it's Compass is by no means public and, or, or open. And one of the biggest problems in criminal justice is that none of the um, algorithmic, there's no algorithmic transparency at all. 
But in terms of in terms of some of these aspects, it's like the question is what is the iteration cycle? We know that the technical iteration cycle is faster than the political iteration cycle. That is part of our process. And so what do we need to make certain that we don't screw up because the political iteration cycle is going to be much, so much slower? So a good example, we'll just mention housing, right? What's happening in housing is that open data movements have been used far more by developers than they have been by advocates who are trying to make certain that housing is fair. The result is we're seeing a huge rise in inequality in terms of a lot of housing in major urban environments. I am watching in the highest of ends the way in which a lot of open data that you guys have been providing has actually made it so that major landlords are actually going after and using that data to really push people past the point of economic brink. So how do we make certain that we, and the, the answer of course is that we should be iterating, we should be providing protections. And that of course is political, right? The goal is to think about protections in housing that actually can really make certain that people are okay. But the gap in between can be so costly. And who, who are we willing to actually let suffer in that process? And maybe in housing it's acceptable, in criminal justice it's not. But part of it is that that's a set of moral decisions and ethical decisions that I think that we need to work out. Because otherwise we're paying the cost of inequality downstream um, because we're hoping that, the exp that we're going to trigger an experimental process, that it's not clear we're going to move it at the speed that is acceptable for actually achieving our goals. But I guess like in, in the example you just gave, it feels like open data is moving us. You're right that the recourse, like a lot of our data gets used for arguments about affordable housing and rental housing where we do a lot of work and provide, I don't know how many municipalities with data about the lack of affordable rental housing and what you should do about it. Um, but you're right, the, the recourse for that is often political, whereas the first cycle that gets moved is the commercial one um, and those move at different paces. But I would say that having the data out there does ultimately, you know, while the first trigger is the commercial one and it takes longer for the political actors to then say, well, okay, in order to combat this affordable housing crisis, I want to give more LIHTC funding, low income housing tax credit funding, or more housing vouchers. Um, it ends, I guess my feeling is that having that data out there will end, ultimately will end up in a better place. It, what you're saying is that getting there can be maybe messy, which is true, but it does feel like we would ultimately end up in a better place than if we didn't have any of that data at all. And this is where I think we're in hypothesis land, to be honest with you. I think we hope that we will get to a better place. And I think the reason why the education data to me is so disturbing is that we're 10 to 15 years into it and things are actually continuing to get worse rather than better. And I don't know, I want to believe you. I want to believe that we'll get to a better place, that we can empower people to find ways of evenness. But we're going to grow a lot of inequality to get there. And the question is, can we stomach it? And who pays the costs? And this is one of the reasons I see it as a moral trade-off. Um, and I think that it's the moment where there's certain areas where I think we can do a lot more experimentation without serious social costs than in others. And I think we don't have even the processes to have that conversation holistically. But in the education example, do you feel that it's the data that's gotten us to a worse place or the fact that the data has revealed their problems and the political process has not caught up and fixed the problems? So the data has reified existing problems. People had always used gossip to figure out what, how to negotiate these same sorts of things. The data and um, the use of the data by communities has actually made things worse. And that's what I struggle with. Uh, I thought it was a extraordinary presentation. So I. And I'm one of these guys who are, I'm focused on the yeah, yeah, yeah part of it. So Dana's is right about me. So this was a mind opener for me because what, what worries me even more is the fact that the data decision processes are going to be even faster because I'm building AI systems that make it even faster. So these prejudices are going to have prejudice derivatives that we may not see until the last minute. And I won't even know it's a third level derivative of the prejudice because the system moves at a faster rate. So I think we have to think about this now. So uh, I don't know what to do, but this normalization begins, the perspective begins, but I think it's a very interesting point. I was looking at security at one dimension. I know you can play with manipulation, but the machines being prejudiced to multiple degrees are something that we need to take on at a different level. This may be a real great way to have that discussion starting here. I think it's a tremendous presentation. When I talked to Dana before about some this and related issues, it's thought provoking. So for me, I, you know, my background was I did a lot of pro bono criminal defense. So a lot of the things that when you hit criminal justice, it happens to hit an issue that I care a lot about. I could add others to your list. For example, when somebody is 
in jail on bail, uh, with not on bail, um, most of the time when they have a conversation, in fact, virtually all the time, every conversation is recorded. And you would be shocked about, even if you know that it's recorded and can be used in court against you, how many people say things that are innocuous but that sound really not innocuous when that happens, right? So that's a fundamental asymmetrical consequence of not getting bail that is really not very well known, and it comes back to result in some convictions that I'm not sure that would have happened had they not been locked up. But when you get into the criminal justice system, the admissibility of any data or statistics or when a judge is going to consider that is really a whole other ball of wax. So it raises some really interesting issues for me. When I think, and I want to make sure our, our experts are really talking, but when we look at open data, a lot of the, uh, the reason I like this conversation, and I think it's really important, is a lot of what we've seen on the policy side is the open data movement is about transparency, sunlight, openness, the FOIA movement, the idea of trying to automate the FOIA movement so that one comes in, you got to get the data out. We get requests and we try and make them available. Once we've de-identified data, there's like a goal of trying to drive openness and use of it. And I think Dana's asking some really interesting questions that I'm glad we're actually, we're actually considering. So why don't we go to Bill? Dana, I want to ask you about, um, I think, a, a closely related but sort of different problem that um, we might call, um, should we trust people with data? And I have a, a real world example. So. Um, a few years ago, the NOAA administrator was testifying in Congress um, and the topic of tornado, lead, tornado warning lead times came up and typically tornado warning lead times are sort of 10 to 20 minutes and so she was asked, well, if we could extend these to 60 minutes, would that be a good thing? And she gave um, a very intelligent but nuanced answer, which is that um, after some time period, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, people no longer think it's imminent, so they they hear the warning, they go back to playing their video game, and they say, you know, I can respond later, and so therefore, you have to be able to give information to people in a way that they take the right action on it. And she got her head torn off by one of the um, uh, congressmen who said, you mean you don't trust people with information? And there's a real dilemma here because at some level he's right and at some level he's wrong, that you have to deliver information to people in a way that they make use of it. And it, is that the same as not trusting people with information? I mean, I think, I think you're totally right. And I think, I think weather is a beautiful example in this. Like, we'll just talk about hurricanes, right? You know better than anybody that we can have prediction of hurricanes you know, many, many days out, but it's huge variance, right? And so the question is, is it, you know, the closer you get to the event, the more, you know, your probabilistic models are closer to reality. But how do you inform it? You know, six days in advance, people are like, the hurricane's gonna come and it's gonna hit. And the media's like, you know, so we get what, we had what, full 24 seven hurricane news this season, right? And it's this moment where every little deviation is like, see, the, the experts don't know what they're talking about. It's actually, no, the experts are working with probabilistic systems. And it's exactly that moment where we can make this data available, and in fact, NOAA does, but it quickly gets politicized. It quickly gets, you know, turned into a money-making narrative, to a political agenda narrative, when at the end of the day, NOAA's trying to make a da data available to save lives, to save property, to make certain things work well. And so the question is, what is the purpose of that data availability and how do we navigate it? I think this is where we struggle with, you know, we now live in an environment where we can actually access tons of information but we ha actually don't have the skills to make sense of all of that information. And I, and I say that at every level, right? I don't have the sense to figure out how to make sense of my healthcare package. And they throw me with tons of information. And the more information, I just sit there being like, please let me know that this healthcare protects me, right? And so we, how do we deal with the information skill sets that people have and we know where we're going to see them being used. But I think you're right and I think health, uh, I think um, weather is one of those places where because we have these models so in advance, we put them out there and we 
it ends up actually not serving the purpose that we're trying to do, which is to protect people and to protect, lo or protect lives and protect property. So should we not put that information out if we have a reasonable expectation that it will make the problem worse? I think at the end of the day, this is a hard political decision. I don't think that it is a decision that I can make. I think that what we need to be doing is meaningfully weighing the trade-offs of all of this. And I think that that's actually one of the parts of this process that's so hard. We can't be binary. And the kinds of data sets we're working with are not binary. So a lot of it is how do we enable people to be making informed decisions about what is the right time for their communities, uh, for the population as a whole, so that information can be consumed in the way that it really is needed to be consumed. But it's not going to be an easy answer, and it's not going to be even like, you know, here's the policy for every situation. You're never going to reach that. Uh, Alan, you'll have a last question on this or comment. We've got to wrap up and move to the next session. Um, so uh, hopefully I can articulate this. Uh, Clearly, um, so in my own professional experience, professional experience at LinkedIn and so forth, I'm sure this is actually true of a lot of people around the table in, in our various capacities. Um, we have found ourselves in exactly the same trap that uh, Google finds itself in, which is to say there's a certain number of things that are easy to measure, a certain number of things which you're not measuring. You base your features on what you can measure. You build optimization functions which are around what you can measure. and you don't measure the other things. And this is one of the things that open data also provides a lot of opportunity for, because it's like, oh, it's this data. I'm gonna do what I can with this data. Even if this set is biased or incomplete or whatever, uh, this is the data I've got. Um, that's this sort of very, um, I guess I would say, sort of uh, inductive way of doing work. Mm -hmm. There is another way to do it, which has been very useful for us at LinkedIn, which is to be extremely goal-driven in terms of the things you actually wanna do. So at LinkedIn, the whole goal is to create economic opportunity for everyone who works. And when you put it that way, what you end up doing is you end up collecting different sorts of data than you would collect, than you would get easily. Mm -hmm. Which means that you're telling a higher picture and your optimization function is based on the good you want to achieve, not on what you can achieve based on the data you actually have. Mm -hmm. So one way out of this might be to cut laterally across it and say, Actually, it's not a matter of watching the systems we've got to see if they're doing good or bad, but rather having a goal that is good, that we agree is good, that would be a, that, that's a political decision in terms of what that actually is, and making progress towards it, including throwing out data which doesn't work, not informing people when the hurricane is on the way, if in fact our goal is to reduce the loss of life and property in hurricanes, for instance, um, uh, there's something about that goal definition, that goal direction, which allows you to not be limited, not have your imagination limited and your bias is confirmed by the data set that's actually in front of you. And I think the one challenge there is that that actually is where we rub up against this open data aspect of things. Yeah. Because the motivations that you have are different than the motivations other actors have. And those motivations, when they come into conflict over the same data source, can be hugely challenging. And it's always fascinating to me to see what happens with a data set being out there where it's read for fundamentally different political reasons and, and all sorts of different ways because it's a question of whether or not you're going to be willing to acknowledge the data that's missing. Um, and it has a lot to do with what you're trying to move forward. So maybe it's part of a standard which, say, commerce could adopt. I mean, I don't know what this would mean, but a standard commerce could adopt having um, basically, uh, before releasing a piece of data openly, um, at least done substantial work in trying to evaluate other uses to which it could be put, or making sure that you're working through, as Census does, working through to remove the biases from the data so that when it's picked up, it's hard to use mm -hmm. in unpredictable ways. Yeah, oh, and I think, that, and I think there's, that's one of the things I also think there's a lot to be learned from the Commerce Department back to us in industry. Um, because I actually think that there are certain areas where they've struggled with this for decades, right? Trying to figure out how to clean data responsibly, trying to figure out how to make certain that data is foolproof, realizing that the sensors in NOAA are imperfect, but trying to really understand scientifically what that means, like all of that work. And I have a feeling that, frankly, we're not as good an industry as they are. On that note, I think we need to move to the next uh, session. <coughs> and, and if I may, um, Really, thank you to Dana. I think this has uh, got to be part of our long-term conversation, and we have to have it 
we have to think about the issues that you raised and how we do uh, around our data set. So I, I really appreciate it, and also for somehow speaking for 30 minutes without breathing at the beginning of the session, which is really, really a challenge. <laughs> All right, uh, Dana, thanks, and thanks to everybody who participated in that, um, that, that uh, presentation, really. Um, okay, so our next um, session, and are, are, are we able to get Jeff Meisel in too, or is he participating? I, I can't remember. You should be able to get him on the screen. Wow. Should be up there any minute now. Well, how about that? So let me let me say uh, just a word or two before I turn it over to Daniel um, uh, to recognize Jeff. I know I'm now doing this regularly, but I, I really want to make sure the credit goes where it's due. We have a leaders in Jeff Chen and Jeff Meisel who have really stepped up, uh, you know, and curated and driven our work in really terrific ways. And one of the ways that we have institutionalized or really worked to institutionalize this and where I feel very comfortable is having uh, Jeff really, Jeff Chen will be taking over, as I said, as Deputy Chief, uh, is Deputy Chief Data Officer, but will soon be Acting Chief Data Officer through the transition. And Brad Burke, uh, who at Commerce will be leading the Economic and Statistics Administration in transition, that, that gives me a lot of comfort, really. But when we were looking to make sure that we are institutionalizing what we're doing here, you have to start with making sure there's a good pipeline of work for our team, because that drives the dollars, which allows you to hire, which allows them to execute, and then you get a cycle of excellence that can really drive this forward. That's, that was our core mission for the last couple of months. And our team that includes Jeff Chen, Jeff Meisel, Laura McGorman, uh, Burton Rice, Brad Burke, they went around the department, I'm sorry, Terry uh, Elniski, went around the department with our teams to show off what we can do and actually make sure there's a good understanding of all of the services and then uh, settled uh, together and agreed with our partners on what work we'd be doing for the next year. We thought it would be helpful if we shared that with you and got input on it. How are we doing for the next year and what's the pipeline? So with that, I'll turn it over to Daniel, uh, Jeff Chan, and Jeff Meisel, who I hope will be coming up soon. Yeah. Um, we have some slides as well, but we could go with that. Is Jeff, is Jeff Meisel on? He's I don't think he's on. on. So with Jeff Chan, why don't you start if you don't mind? Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, we had him for a minute. <laughs> I think he wears a tie when he's off all the time. <laughs> oh. So why don't, why don't we, to stay on track, uh, Jeff Meisel, I'm going to have Jeff Chen start with the slides, and then maybe we can flash back over to you. Does that work? Jeff? Uh, yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, for our dev honors. Thank you. Great. You can see my screen. Can you share the screen? Um, start. Um, oh, there we go. I'm slow. Cool. Oh, there we go. Great. Um, so, uh, in this session, we'll just uh, quickly describe our year two efforts. But it makes sense first to give a very quick overview of uh, wh wh where we've gone in this first uh, first year and then wh where we're going. Um, so as you've seen from today's presentations, we've made quite a lot of headway in our efforts. Um, first year, we uh, brought in five uh, inaugural uh, bureau partners. We've uh, solicited and gotten a lot of great advice from uh, the CDAC members, and we've spent most of the time trying to figure out our sweet spot, like what is actually our role within commerce. Um, throughout this whole process, um, at the height of our, our, um, our busy season, we ended up with uh, approximately 41 people involved with the CDS's efforts in many different ways, um, with a core team of 12, nine, um, about nine people who have helped out from ESA, a residence incubator of 
uh, 15 people and five summer analysts who were awesome. And then we ended up with a lot of great projects, um, and many of which were uh, talked about today. Um, and we're continuing some of this effort into the next year. So where are we going? Well, we learned a lot from the first year. Um, our sweet spot, as it turns out, is as a commerce-wide uh, research and technology consultancy. We advise and build up to alpha, um, working in conjunction with the CIO shops and the different bureaus within commerce so that everyone's aligned, we're moving forward uh, in lockstep so that we can achieve um, the, the department's uh, mission. Our foci, we, we started to try to cluster the different types of work into key areas so that we have a theme for how we're approaching the work. Um, that includes applied data initiatives, data platforms, and more infrastructure oriented, um, growing the open data ecosystem, and education and capacity issues as you've seen with the Data Academy. We engage, we have a more standardized engagement model, um, thanks to a lot of the work from Laura McGorman and uh, Burton Reist. Uh, we, are, we have umbrella MOUs with um, every bureau within commerce. We have, uh, we're setting up statements of work with every single um, engagement uh, funding uh, bureau so that when we have this prospect list, we can just start to go through a discovery on each project so that we can understand the feasibility, the risks, the benefits of each piece of work. We can build and advise uh, depending on how, what discovery tells us and do retrospectives. Uh, we expect up to six uh, uh, partners for this uh, year too, but though we've been getting into conversations with others um, very recently, like the last week. And the team will expand from a core team of 12 to 18 uh, max. So it's a quite a quite a good expansion curve. Um, but to dive into the work, um, I'm going to turn it over briefly uh, to Jeff Meisel to take us through the next two slides. Which I guess I have to unshare. Sound? So close. So close. I put. Jeff, you're on. We can't hear you. I don't have control of that. No. Nope. I'm to the TV volume is with it. But should I? Uh, just call him. Yeah. Um, Make you a little silly to do this, but do you want to um, put this put you up to the speaker in the mic? Hold on a sec. Okay. Can you hear him? Yeah. Hey, can, can you speak? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, great. So I want to talk about applied data as our first bucket of, bucket of work, and this is really exciting. So we're going to enumerate what the different bureaus uh, will be will be working on. Uh, and if technology doesn't allow me to proceed, Jeff, just take over, and, and I'll support you uh, the best I can. So first, on the census side of things, we have an exciting project around veterans' data. Uh, we're working with our Center for Administrative Record Research and Applications and the VA to undertake research and part development for uh, end users with that end user being veterans. So the goal here is uh, we want to provide a data product that can meet a need in the field and really understand how we can better apply census data to serve, to serve our veterans. Uh, the second project uh, in this bucket is rapid prototyping. And so we want to build small pilots and a recommendation engine to support the build out of our future generation 
data dissemination platform, which is called SETSI. And so what the Commerce Data Service will be doing is allowing the SETSI R&D team to accelerate um, the understanding of new technologies, uh, new approaches that they can then experiment with as they're building out the platform. And then for, and we're switching off between census and uh, non-census. Um, so for NIST, uh, we have a number of projects uh, with our partners there, including uh, some efforts uh, to better understand wild land urban interface data. So this gets at the wildfire uh, problem. Um, NIST has a, a research program that's focused on uh, understanding the vulner wildfire vulnerabilities. So we are currently under uh, understanding how they collect data, um, providing recommendations on how to improve uh, spatial data collection so they can apply machine learning algorithms to understand vulnerabilities. Um, an extension to one of the projects from this year, we have um, also, um, we, we will be deploying um, a client identification algorithm with uh, NIST um, manufacturing, uh, Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program to reach out to companies that uh, may benefit from MEP's um, uh, client services and that's using some work that we developed in our first year. Okay, great. So under open data ecosystem, we'll jump in with, with projects that are focused on understanding the use and impact of open data and start again with census. So the first project, which is quite exciting, is with Wikipedia. And so what we're looking to do is automate how we populate census data into Wikipedia pages. The reason this is so important is because primarily users get data from census by either Googling it or going to Wikipedia. So this will be a way that we can ensure our data and the latest data is available for where our users get it. The second project is continuation around our city SDK or software development kit, which has been a developer outreach platform that allows us to go and partner with private sector organizations, universities, groups like Code for America, and go into communities and help them solve problems uh, by getting them out to speak quickly with using data from census, from commerce, and from the government more broadly. Um, going back to NIST, um, we will be working with the material, uh, the MML lab at uh, NIST, focusing on impact quantification of their standard reference data. Um, this data has, uh, it's, has a long-standing history of contributing to um, a variety of fields of research, um, and so there's a particular interest in understanding how does that data proliferate through um, downstream user uh, ecosystems, including um, from the patent side to the financial side, and how that, that data impacts uh, businesses um, and researchers around the country, if not the world. Um, with, uh, the, with PTO, we are digging in a bit more onto the strategy side initially with understanding their open data user strategies. Um, there's this overall uh, or overarching need to understand what are the, the how, what are the actual needs of uh, patent uh, data users and how we how patent um, PTO can be more user driven in their approaches. Um, from the da data platform side, uh, we're focusing on uh, figuring out how can um, the systems better provide uh, insight and utility to. Uh, users, whether it's on the developer side or uh, an actual direct-to-user project. Um, so with B uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, we are um, continuing a redesign of their um, RIMS product, so it's regional input-output data, and we're trying to improve the user experience of getting uh, the, the RIMS multiplier data. Uh, with PTO, we are uh, digging in a bit more with their API standards work. Uh, they have some great um, documentation coming out in the next month or so, and we're going to uh, work with them to uh, perhaps implement some uh, some reference API implementations. And then on the geography products for census, one of the challenges that we're aiming to address is how many of our users are unaware of the breadth and the geog geographic coverage of census products. And so what we're looking to do is improve upon the user experience such that we can provide value to our users and they can see the full breadth of our capabilities uh, depending on their geography. And then closely linked to that is a vector tiles assessment. So as you know, the Census Bureau operates several web map tile projects. We do this both for collection and dissemination purposes. 
However, with the advent of, of vector tile technology, with user behavior moving more and more mobile, it's important that we understand how we can utilize vector tiles in many of our products. And so that'll be another area where Commerce Data Service will be investigating. And lastly, our education uh, and capacity building efforts um, are uh, ongoing. Um, our successful Commerce Data Academy work um, will be going into the second year. Um, we will be looking to ex uh, do another round of the in-residence program, which has uh, seen a lot of, um, borne a lot of great fruits. Um, with uh, census, um, I, I'm serving on a computing task force to help inform um, their internal um, metadata and data uh, dissemination and data um, matching and merging uh, capabilities. Um, and that's really forward looking for uh, the Bureau's uh, long-term research activities. And lastly, um, we're going to continue to work on this data usability project, which recently won a FedScoop award. And uh, we, we have a couple of other uh, new tutorials that are gonna be um, getting out in a couple next couple of weeks. So that's essentially um, a, a selection of what we're looking at for this year. We have, we're gonna do discovery on all of them. Um, not all of them are gonna take the same time, amount of time, but we are going to take a very systematic approach to tackling these projects and doing, making sure that we do them right. Daniel, I know you're the discussion scientist. Well, I'm actually the facilitator, so that means I maybe will go first on a couple of uh, questions or remarks, but this is really meant to be an open, uh, open discussion, so if you have anything, please uh, raise it. I have a number of things here that I want to start with. Um, I guess first, uh, one of my initial reactions to this, uh, first, I mean, great great work ahead. I think we're looking forward to it. Um, one thing that I didn't see up there that has come up in some of our past discussions, especially this summer session, was around marketing these projects. And when I saw the kind of process that you have for going through the projects, I, I didn't see that there. I wonder if you can maybe talk about if you, if you are thinking about that or integrating that more into year two now that you're getting a little more institutionalized. Um, that's, that's one point. Um, a second that I wanted to raise was around Wikidata, wiki, the Wikipedia data and what you're thinking there in terms of um, the user experience on verifiability. I mean, as a, you know, kind of a researcher, you know, you're, I always tell my staff, don't use Wikipedia because you can't trust it, right? And, you know, so if, if your goal is to get that data there, um, is your goal to get that data there just so it's accurate or though, so it's a trusted source? And if it's gonna be a trusted source, how are you thinking about that? I mean, can there be some kind of seal or some kind of, um, you know, evidence that it's actually the correct data? If you have any thoughts on that, that'd be useful. Um, third is on, um, you know, you, you mentioned a number of really interesting projects like the, the Veterans Data Project and the uh, Wildfire Project. Um, to what extent does this cross-agency work outside the Department of Commerce? Um, because it is obviously in, in many of these cases you're talking about uh, DHS or uh, Department of Interior or even VA. Um, how are your interfacing with them going? I think that's a useful note. Sounds good. I'll take the first one, and then I'll put. I'll. We'll, we'll, Jeff and I will. Jeff Meisel and I will jump back and forth um, with the phone to the mic. <laughs> um, so, in terms of marketing, uh, we. So, there's. I think it can be divided into internal and external. Um, so, internally, we are um, setting up uh, standard procedures to uh, constantly push out the good news internally. Uh, meeting with uh, bureau leadership on there um, on a regular basis. Um, get through our data academy, we have a great way of uh, uh, doing and conducting outreach, and that's a, one of the easiest ways to bring uh, new support into um, the CDS family. Um, externally, uh, we are connected to the, the general federal family of d uh, data organizations, as well as um, we also speak quite a bit. Uh, externally on the, the stuff that we do internally. And of course, engaging with uh, CDAC members because you know, that, that's a no-brainer. Um, as for wiki, wiki data, I'll put it up to uh, Jeff first and I'll jump in. Yeah, you bet. So one of the things, one of the first areas where we think we have low-hanging fruit is to ensure the data that's already on Wikipedia is, is the latest and most relevant data set that's being referenced. And they have a process that goes through a bot and approval group that allows for automated changes. And so as we get into the discovery of this project, we'll be looking to work closely with their team to understand best practices of how folks are already, already using it 
and uh, most certainly develop kind of a small subset of, of problems to tackle first. But really, we want to ensure that we're getting uh, getting our data out to the public, uh, and, and it's the most relevant, up to date, um, and the correct uh, data for what they're looking for. So that's what I would add on the Wiki Wiki Data Project. And just for a moment on the external marketing, which I thought was a very good question. We, you know, we've obviously focused quite a bit on this to make sure we get the word out in a number of different channels. Burton luckily re leads our comms office and has done a terrific job with his whole team of on every single product we have a release. Uh, we brought in experts like Terry Elniski from Silicon Valley to actually teach us how do you make sure you productize train, you know, the training sessions, the releases, alpha, beta, all of the things along the chain that we needed to be doing are now part of our knowledge base. Our press team here at ESA will be here to support um, the Commerce Data Service, of course, just like we support our other agencies. And our goal is to elevate as much as we can up the chain now and into the new administration. And Jeff really has done a terrific job of being a thought leader and a speaker uh, out there, but that results in a lot of elevation and amplification. I have to tell you candidly, we, we need help. I know we ask for this every time, but you would be shocked how much one tweet, one repetition, getting it from your companies and from you, the, the knowledge, you know, sort of the connections you have, how much it matters. I mean, literally one or two things from you all and from other amplifiers in this area who have followed us. It drives applications to us, it drives usage of our data, it drives usage of our products. If it helps you for us to show you how much you're doing when you do that, we'd be happy to do it. I mean, we know and can show you. So anything you can do would be helpful, but we're also, we would take advice on where we need to be speaking, talking, and engaging with the press because we, we are proud of what we're doing and we need to find better ways to share it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, as, as for the last question about cross-agency work, um, we, so for, for, the, for instance, for the Veterans Project, uh, we are engaging uh, the VA, um, s some state, uh, local uh, veterans organizations, um, and we are also taking a lot of previous input that's been provided from VSOs, um, a lot of great work that um, Austin has um, championed in the past. Um, and where possible, we are reaching out and getting um, input into how, how to actually improve it so we're not re reinventing the wheel. And I had a great uh, discussion with uh, Bill before about um, making sure that we, we connect with um, the right people who have already done similar work so that we're not reinventing the wheel so that we can, we are already standing on the shoulders of giants so that, and p delivering on bigger and better things. I'm gonna ask, turn to Kati first this time because I think we skipped Kati on the last round. So Kati. Other round us. <laughs> First of all, um, I think um, fabulous job. Thanks so much for doing this. I think it's um, it's very good to see how many new tools you brought into your organization and how you brought um, quite different ways of doing things um, to the Department of Commerce. Um, in terms of um, now teaching the world how to do this inside of an agency. I think I had mentioned before that the AAAS conference, the annual conference that brings 5,000 together from industry, but also mostly uh, uh, government and academia, um, those which care about um, science and how it um, can be used effectively by many. Um, I think that would be a great um, venue to propose a session on how to make data more openly available to industry, but also to academia and, and across the agencies. Um, one comment I had um, to Dana's presentation was data visualization literacy. I believe truly that in today's time and age, you have to find a way that people do not only read and write text, but also read and write data. And how do you get there? And it's not done by just um, adding more um, scatter plots and other data visualizations to curricula. You also need to catch those which are already out of the um, educational formal system. You have to go into libraries, into science museums. And I think there could be all kinds of partnerships that make this very rich data available to science museums, for instance. And I'm happy to talk more about that. That was uh, very, I, I totally agree. And that would be very helpful, honestly. Alan? Um, just a quick question about 
Um, so it's a great list of projects. Um, what are your criteria for prioritizing the ones you choose to do in 2017? Uh, we ended up working with uh, uh, project champions within each bureau to understand what are the, um, their needs. And so they provided us um, initial um, like overall list of potential projects. Um, and then from that, we tried to uh, prioritize based on uh, whether or not there is a, a, a clear champion, um, if uh, it, what are the potential risks involved and what are the, the, the if there's a clear understanding of where we're going with it, um, if it's more of a consulting or advisory or build um, project, it, that, that all factors in. But ultimately, the, it's, the proof is in the pudding, so we have to end up doing discovery on everything that was brought up. So of the projects that were provided by Census, um, a num num number of them uh, will be, uh, will definitely get the lion's share of uh, the effort, um, but we will do, we'll look at all of them. Do you have a reaction to this? Um, so, <clears throat> uh, so the, the reason I asked it is uh, trying to understand the balance between how much of this is about building up the sort of data science muscle within commerce and how much of it is about solving specific problems for specific agencies and basically how you're trading off between the two of them. Because <coughs> you kind of described earlier in the day, you kind of described 2017 as kind of a, uh, an investment year, kind of like a, I forget exactly the word you used, but something like that. So just what the balance between those two things was. Okay. Uh, well, um, th there, are, there are specific problems um, and some, some more, more better defined than others. Um, so, like for instance, uh, as uh, Jeff Meisel had talked about for like rapid prototyping, there, there's a general need to help with um, the set side platform at Census, um, and that may take the form in of like the, these three or four potential um, un uh, currently um, not not previously tested um, areas, and so we would be doing that sort of work, and that adds towards and that pushes towards um, a better uh, platform. Um, in other cases, it's a very, very specific ask, like looking at wildland or written interface. Um, like, how do you improve data collection there? Um, and that's um, that's very much a, a very, very specific targeted problem that we're addressing. Um, I think at, because we are we're expanding the overall uh, portfolio, then by virtue we grow at the same time. Uh, Dan, you have the last question, comment. One, one thing that I guess as I look through your the priorities for 2017, um, the one thing that did occur did kind of jump out was the fact that I, I, you know obviously it's very tech focused as, as well it should be because I think a lot of it is about tech enablement and um, you've got pro projects that you're helping basically be a technology as you said at lunch kind of a technology consultant internally and kind of a, a repository for best practices. You've also got uh, kind of the, the, the data academy piece, which is like building up the capability, kind of teaching people to fish for themselves. Um, there were there are some problems that are kind of meta problems that are a little bit less technology focused that I'm not sure where they would lie, with, if they lie within the data service responsibility, but things like some of the things we've talked about in several meetings are things like how to coalesce the long tail of user engagement. Um, so the fact that a lot of people maybe want um, some things out of commerce they don't quite know how to interact and how do you coalesce and create communities around those things so then you have a better dialogue and you know that's more like a sociological more ethnographic kind of it's not a technical problem but it does facilitate the tech um, transfer if you have a better form of engagement with your community the other thing is we do oftentimes talk about discovery and connection problems um, which is you know data.gov which you know I think it was, is a, it's much better than what existed before, and sometimes it feels like we kind of kick it uh, and say it could be better, and you know. But the reality is that it's a lot better. It is at least one place where people can go to find stuff. But a lot of the problems we talk about is how do folks, how do we improve that ability for random communities of people to say, hmm, I wonder where I can get data on this <coughs> and find it, and then and then in that same interface find other connections of where other people have used that same type of data and code for it and everything else. So that's, again, not necessarily a technical problem. It's more of an information system problem. But, and I don't know whether they're on uh, uh, CDSs, if, if that's in their remit or not. But 
Well, we're certainly learning a lot about um, how to engage across, um, engage the public through our different uh, channels, um, a little bit more than others. Um, there, there's actually a bit of work that um, uh, I think it gets more towards the last mile type projects that Justin's been pushing on uh, data uh, equality. And um, essentially through those channels, like we're engaging with um, companies and um, figuring out ways to engage with the public directly to, so that uh, networks of innovators can um, provide their input onto different problems. Um, and we've actually been thinking through different ways of um, improving that connect connectivity directly with uh, the public. Um, but that's kind of like, that's in the works. Um, Laura McGuire might be able to speak a little bit about that later. Um, and it's, it is very much- 2017 or beyond 2017? Um, it's, it's ongoing. Um, I should go to it. Okay, so let's, um, thanks Jeff and everyone. Let's uh, take a, a short break. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, but not as bad as we've been in the past, so that's a good thing. Um, we'll take a short break and we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. And thanks to Jeff Meisel on the phone too. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are um, getting Anthony during the break. So we have him lined up and on, hearing him and everything. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I'm just letting you know we're trying to look that there's going to be technology. Always, always. But, but you know what?
We're going to come back together in about three minutes. Three minutes. All right, we should come back together. <clears throat> if folks could wrap up their discussions and come back to the table, I'd appreciate it. We'd appreciate it. We need to get rolling. All right, Justin. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the next session is a panel on democratizing data and expanding accessibility. This is a very important issue uh, to me and to our team. Um, I'm going to tell you that a lot of the work, I will let um, folks claim credit without giving, naming the names, but you know who you are and please talk, speak up if these are some of your issues. But a lot of our work has actually been inspired in this area by specific questions and issues that you all asked us right when I first came on. Uh, one of the questions was, what are the big problems? What are the issues that you're trying to solve? I mean, what, do you, what, do you, what is the Commerce Department trying to advance? Uh, another set of questions and concerns that we had raised to us was, well, are you thinking about whether your data is getting to everybody? Are you really thinking about data inequality and access and, and democratization? Um, we, we have a couple of different focuses we have been pursuing in this area. One is that we issued a public challenge a couple of months ago around data inequality. And the way we phrased it, the way I've been speaking about it, the way the Secretary's been speaking about it is, we think it's great, honestly, that uh, all of the companies, consultants, and uh, financial institutions and others, a a academic experts are taking our data and they're using it. We want more of that and we want to enable that. But we need to think about making sure that data is also getting to nonprofits and charities to enable their work, to small and medium sized entities. And I know you all think about that, but we have to think creatively about it. And most importantly, we don't know these user groups like you know them, that, that there, are, there are companies and entities that spend their entire lives focused on solving problems and improving the consumer experience, and we need you to help us actually accomplish this mission. And we've had a number of companies, and I'm hoping part of this that you'll see is we've got the flywheel going, to keep the analogy, we've got a number of companies that have really jumped on board and are helping drive some innovation. So we're gonna to talk to some of them today and I'm, I'm happy to highlight the work that they're do doing. On a separate basis, we also want to enable a dialogue that we think about sharing our own experiences around the data we have and how it can be used for other purposes and drive that, co that conversation with private sector experts around problems. What are the problems we're trying to solve? So that, those are among the, the challenges 
that we have posed to our team. Think big, what are the long-term challenges, and what can we accomplish if we leverage the private sector to, to address uh, data inequality? These are really important things to us and to me, and I'm excited with our panelists. So I've had three of our leaders here at the Commerce Department who are gonna start the conversation. Terry Elniski, uh, who we're very lucky to have join us from Silicon Valley, and who's been a real leader here. Laura McGorman, who you're hearing about in almost every presentation at this point, but has been a real uh, partner for all of us at the Commerce Data Service. And Lisa Wolfish from the Census Bureau, who's also been a terrific leader and thinker on the issues of uh, democratizing data. So I'll turn it over to our panel. Thank you so much. Um, I was considered a data evangelist at my last job, and what's really nice about being part of this community is I realize that's all of us. It's, you know, we're all part of a big community that is ever growing as far as developing a data-driven government um, and doing public good with, with data that we have to offer. Um, and so this session is about solving some of the upstream problems that Dana so eloquently outlined um, as you know, facing policymakers downstream as far as analyzing data is concerned, but we have a different set of problems within government about how to democratize the availability and accessibility of data. And I think if we all work towards that common goal, we'll, we'll hopefully make progress in the near future. Um, am I able to share my screen? an option for you. Okay, cool. So, so when we think about um, advancing data equality, I think Dana and I are very much along the same lines of, you know, there's a difference between equality and equity. And if we think about making all of our data available on APIs, that might mean that it's essentially equal in the sense that, by definition, anyone in theory could access it. But equity has a very different outcome. So do you need an advanced degree in computer science? Do you need to speak fluent NOAA or PTO to understand our API documentation? These are real problems we're facing where it's not just about about making data open, but it's about making data accessible and understandable by a wider set of actors. Um, let me think if I can get that, there we go. And uh, just to walk through some of the, the points I wanna highlight, you know, there are snapshots of data inequality that we can view today using um, under, uh, an analysis of our census API. So if we understand who's accessing this, this API, we get a pretty clear um, overview of what data equality looks like in real time. We have some lessons learned from other open source projects that we want to talk about, and then we really want to open up uh, for discussion to understand um, what the best practices that you're all hearing in the marketplace about how to partner with the public to solve this problem. So I'm gonna just start with a brief overview of a quick and dirty analysis we recently did about who uses the Census API. And my first question to you all is, how many accesses do you think uh, were made to the Census API in 2016, actually in the first nine months of 2016? How many unique accesses, yeah. Ten million. Okay, so we have a ten million. Anyone else? Three billion. Three billion. Ooh, it's like the price is right. <laughs> All right, so it's uh, Kevin was actually closer, so it's a billion. In the first yeah, yeah. So um, you actually can't see my emoji, but it's smiling in the upper right-hand corner. So that's a smiley emoji outcome, I think. So we're actually achieving a really high amount of volume of use of this, of this public data, and I think that's a great thing. But if we think about what that pie chart looks like, so of those billion accesses, um, what proportion do you think come from keys that are coming from a census.gov email? Thirty-four yeah, percent. Kevin is being bold. Going half on you're going. You're going half. Yeah. I love that we have like dueling. All right. So now Stan is uh, okay. is is in the right here. So over half. It's fifty-three percent. Um, and so we start to understand that this billion accesses to the Census API. A lot of that is being used by our internal users now. 
Lisa will tell you, this isn't always a bad thing. I mean, a lot of these calls are being used to service things like American Fact Finder or widgets that the Census Bureau has built that populate uh, local government websites. So, you know, in many ways, this is being used outside of census walls, but it's still a large amount of the data being processed in-house and being used by uh, census users. And then if we look at that orange part of the pie chart that's being uh, pulled by private companies, do you have any idea what private industries are mostly using census data? There's one in particular that has an astounding share. Stan, I'm gonna look at you. I'm gonna hope that you get this one right. Okay, it, uh, which domain is, yeah. uh, which company is the biggest part Which, like, yeah, which sector? Um, I know, Esri. <laughs> is, that a, is that a sector? So it's real estate, it's you people. It's <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so a lot of census uh, calls in terms of private sector accesses are coming from companies like Redfin, Zillow, a bunch of companies that are actually pretty niche as far as real estate advisory services. So if you're gonna, about gonna make a $10 million commercial real estate uh, investment, how do you figure out what the most optimized investment is? And there are companies that have monetized that sort of expertise. And so we've gone from like a happy smiley emoji that talks about the volume of the data that we're producing to a somewhat, you know, nervous, maybe even upset emoji that, you know, there's a large amount of uh, value being pulled from this data, but it's really being, um, you know, utilized and value being drawn by a particular niche set of industries. And that's not necessarily what we want when we think about data quality or maybe even data equity. So we're trying to solve that problem. Um, and we have a few sort of North Star guiding principles, and these come from some of the causes that we, you know, all know about in our communities and, and sort of our lived experience within the commerce data service and commerce more broadly. So we think that when a local nonprofit is developing a strategic plan or when it's fundraising, we want them to be using our income and demographic data to strategically allocate resources. So you shouldn't need to afford, you know, advanced marketing tools that you have to pay for to do fundraising and to do strategic planning in a really thoughtful way. Um, when a new exporter is planning its first shipment, we want them to be able to use our trade and export data in the same way that we know FedEx is using ITA's API. And this is um, one that is near and dear to Justin's heart. When a public defender in California is choosing a jury, we want them to have the same access to demographic data as jury consultants do when they're supporting really you know, sophisticated commercial firms and spending lots of money to do that. Um, and so we issued a call to action. Uh, and so this is, a, this is from a speech that Justin gave um, actually at the SHIFT conference. And we're, we're trying to be pretty specific about where we need help. So we need help with the last mile problem. So we know that it's our role as government to make data available via APIs, but we need more data scientists, developers, engineers, and others to build applications and business intelligence tools on top of our APIs to promote best and broadest use. So we make the data available, we improve how our APIs work, we improve the documentation around them, but we're really looking to our partners, both in the private sector and the nonprofit space, to, to make this data accessible and of broad use to, to as many uh, be beneficiaries as possible. And so we've been asked by the CDAC to more closely define what success looks like, and I think success along this domain um, actually has a number of definitions, but I'll try to be somewhat succinct in saying that, you know, if more nonprofits are using our data within the next year to make better decisions, we consider that a metric of success. If more small manufacturers are using their, our data to increase their competitiveness, that's another metric we could use to define success. And if more public defenders are using our data to provide the best services possible, then that's also a measure of success. These are some of the companies we're working with, um, and we want to thank everyone from Socrata and C Kaggle. Um, Ephesoft is here, Alexandra Walsh is another person who's working with us, and you know, these are pretty amazing partnerships that are coming out of just a series of conversations that we have been having with uh, tech companies who want to help with this particular problem, and we really want to just say thank you very much for offering your services to solve some of these problems. And then I would put it out to the group, you know, this is the beginning of a full stage of uh, a full life cycle of problems that starts with getting data out there, but you know, we want that data to advance better public policy and we want the public's input on what policies we can improve with this data. And so, you know, when we want to start an open source dialogue with the public, you know, we know that we need to collaborate around problems. We need to engage a broad set of stakeholders. We need to use public forums to engage these stakeholders. Um, but you know, that's a hard thing to do, and so we need to take it in incremental order. 
And some of the next steps that we wanted to share with you is that we want to, we want to start this dialogue within commerce. We want to, um, the part of the working group that Justin described that I'm a part of, that I'm working on with Lisa and Nancy is um, at least in-house decide on a few key problems we want to solve with, with data. Um, we also want to share the tools that Socrata, Wolfram, uh, FSOft, and others are building, and we want to share them with real users and get feedback. And then we want to prioritize this list of public problems and really pave the way on one. So before I transition to Lisa, who's going to speak about this issue specifically from sp Census's perspective, I, you know, I'll leave these up for discussion uh, towards the end, but how, how should we define success? If we want to get more specific, are there things that we should plan to measure? How should we effectively engage users and community groups and not just uh, navel gaze and, and, and define success internally? And um, pretty broadly, how, how are you all willing to help? Um, we would really appreciate some guidance and a helping hand. This is a big and tall order, but we would appreciate anything CDAC is willing to contribute in the way of advice or our helping hand. Laura, that was terrific. Um, really, and very thought provoking. I'm, I know we want to get to discussion. I want to make sure Terry, Lisa, you both get a chance. And then um, I do want to highlight some of the companies that have actually stepped up to our public call, in part because I want to inspire each of you to try and help us too and others. Uh, so I'm going to ask Anthony Goldblum, who uh, is a founder and head of uh, CEO of Kaggle, is going to join us. I hope to be able to talk about what Kaggle is doing. And of course, Kevin, I'd like you to show off what uh, Socrata is doing as well. But Terry, uh, Lisa. Hey, um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, what I would like to do is take you all on a short journey of uh, open data initiatives that have been going on at the Census Bureau and very closely tied in, as, as Laura was saying, from releasing an API to that evolution to looking at problem sets. Um, so the Census Data API launched in August of 2012 after both closed and open beta testing. User feedback was important right from day one. Um, our problem was not, do we have data to put in an API? Our problem was, what of our hundreds of data sets should we start with in the API? Um, and we launched with the decennial census and the ACS five-year data. There are now dozens and dozens of data sets available through the API from uh, several instances of the economic census, quarterly workforce indicators, um, economic indicators, population estimates, business dynamic statistics. I could go, I could go on and on with that. Um, as as um, was also mentioned, the Census Bureau is a heavy user of its API. It um, drives applications like our population clock and my congressional district. We're able to create widgets off the API. So for example, when members of Congress embed my congressional district on their house sites, it's updated as soon as that data is released. Um, it was updated, for example, September when that when that data set was refreshed. So it's really enabled us to, through the API and through these embeddable widgets, to get data far beyond census.gov. Um, it's also reduced development time in-house being able to use the API. <clears throat> we power uh, features on our website, such as our smart search feature, which pulls data for uh, queries right within our search engine. Feedback, as I mentioned, during beta testing and post-launch helped us evolve some of the features and functionality in the API. But, of course, launching the API was really just the first step in that journey. We got a lot of positive feedback, you know, thank you for getting this data out, you know, machine-readable formats that, that we can use it. But there were definitely usability issues uh, with the API, with the data itself, and especially around mapping. So we got, we, in, in talking with developers, we heard things like I'm spending hours converting uh, different geographies, um, dealing with, with shape files is really difficult. Um, th this was some feedback actually from a hackathon we did with Zillow. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about hackathons uh, in a couple minutes. Um, so it was really hard to use the API in conjunction with, with spatial data to use mapping. We've seen so many times today how important mapping is to be able to visualize, visualize data. Um, in a, this is in addition to the complexity of census data itself, which unfortunately can be very overwhelming. Uh, okay. 
Okay, so, so, sure. So what we did was we took all this feedback and worked on the city SDK project, which was a way through agile development we could pull together mapping data uh, with the demographic data and really use plain language to be able to get to that data so developers didn't have to know specific tables and whatnot. Uh, we were able to, um, and this is uh, qualitatively, reduce development time uh, down to about four hours for some apps. Teams at hackathons were able to get working prototypes in, in play uh, in a very short time. We get all this feedback and we engage at hackathons. Uh, we've been an early participant in the National Day of Civic Hacking. In uh, hackathons, we did one uh, with Amazon, their Alexa team uh, recently. We did one also just a few weeks ago down in Puerto Rico, which helped us identify some issues with the Puerto Rico data. Uh, so the hackathons, I'll just quickly wrap up, really are our, our, our best venue for live usability testing around our, our API, because we know the data itself is so difficult to use. Thanks, so thank you. Uh, Terry? the Commerce Data Services, so I'll be brief. Um, I think Laura and Lisa have done a great job um, defining the problem. Um, we're passionate about opening up data and, and having data be a resource for everyone to use to create more economic goodness, solve social problems, et cetera. Um, and we've certainly made efforts to try to make that happen, but again, we're only at the beginning of this journey. So we've done things like hackathons, we've done marketing, we're starting to engage socially with um, open source communities, uh, data communities where there's real data users, data analysts, um, we're speaking publicly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I would argue that because we're, you know, we're early stage and we're just starting to ramp now, that the next level of communication and marketing around this open data effort really needs to be much bigger than what we're doing individually or as a collective group of you know, three to five people um, in, the, in the Commerce Data Academy. I think any successful product um, at, the, at the beginning, sort of stays close to close to the uh, you know, to the, the founding group, and you sort of let it out a little bit. But the the adoption, the momentum, and the encouragement that we've seen from any group that we've been speaking to has been phenomenal, which gives me the intuition that this could be a much bigger message to the to the American public. Um, so essentially, the point I'm going to make is that there's still lots to to do. There's lots to communicate. Um, the beginning efforts that we've made have been fantastic. But if commerce um, and the government really want open data to become a thing in America, and if we really want to use commerce uh, data as well as data from any other federal agency to be a catalyst for social change or economic good, we need a much bigger public awareness program and a much bigger kind of outreach and education effort um, around it. And that means everything from like, maybe we have like the people's cloud where all the best data that could be open is put, right? And then we have um, private sector companies or other startups or entrepreneurs, whether they're social or private, work off of that cloud to develop the tools and things that, um, that really answer, uh, uh, solve problems or create the, the economic goodness that we're, we're proposing. Um, again, I think this is something that could really scale and be beneficial on a, on a, much, wider, uh, on a much wider platform that than what we're doing right now. But again, it's technology, it's market education, it's different kinds of funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so again, you know, we've started something, uh, there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, I, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I, uh, Laura, if you wouldn't go, mind going back to the slide that had the companies that have stepped forward, I just want to say a word or two about them before I turn it over to Anthony Goldblum at Kaggle and then Kevin from Socrata. I just want to highlight what these folks are doing to give you ideas. I'm trying to spur ideas for not only everybody in this room, but whoever's listening to think about how companies are taking our data and trying to help solve public problems or enable uh, insights that we can't do, honestly. We just don't have the scope to do it. So you have Looker, for example, that took a whole set of data from the American Community Survey, and they posted it in ways that can be analyzed easily on a census, I think it was called, was it ACS Looker? I can't remember. ACS Looker, but you can see insights in the data very quickly, even on the front end. They posted specific questions, answered them, and then you can see the data behind it. Uh, just the idea that you can make our data accessible, visualizable that quickly and usable is inspirational to me, and they did it free and open for the public. Effasoft has taken some of our PTO 
images that are in TIFFs and is applying their uh, OCR and uh, um, machine learning technology, and they're going to start by making the data sets that you can actually analyze, the underlying data sets, free and open for the public, which I know other companies are also doing. But then you can, they're looking at the next stage. How can we look for insights into the data and drive use of it? Uh, I'll let Anthony talk about what Kaggle is doing and Kevin talk about what uh, Socrata has done in their first one. Wolfram is posting theirs to um, their new platform and hosting some of their uh, data sets. Data.world has committed to taking a number of our census data sets, including the ACS, put them on the platform for free and open access, combine them and make them interoperable uh, on an API that people can use with other opportunity project data sets. This is, again, something we're now leading, the opportunity project, but the idea that you could combine data sets on a free and open portal that people uh, might be able to go use through an API is terrific, right? That's, uh, that's exciting. So, Anthony, I might turn it over to you on Kaggle, uh, if you don't, if we can get Anthony up. Anthony, welcome. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, excellent. We we have a joke. We have a we have a joke. Maybe solving AI, but we're nowhere near on AV. <laughs> we got you. Hey, Anthony, we can hear you. Go for it. Perfect. All right. Um, so maybe uh, just before I kick off, I'm curious: does, do, do people in the room have have you heard of Kaggle before, or is this a new introduction? I can't hear. Cool. Okay. Excellent. I can't hear, by the way, now. Um, the, the, so I'm assuming you can hear me. I'm just going to talk. But if I'm ignoring any questions, it's because I can't hear. Um, so um, what we've done with so so just for those who aren't familiar with Kaggle, we're a community. Uh, in a few days, it'll be uh, over 700,000 uh, data scientists. And originally, what they did, why they came to Kaggle, was to compete in uh, machine learning and data science competitions. Um, we have now, about two months ago, opened up an open data platform, and actually the US Census Bureau is the first uh, government agency that we partnered with to start to get uh, data sets in front of our community. And so what this looks like is, um, you can see this is the US Census Bureau page, it gives a bit of a description of the Census Bureau, and then some of the data sets uh, that have been put up. Um, now, if I go into a data set, uh, this one is the 2013 uh, uh, American Community Survey, not only does it have a description uh, of the data set, but we have a, a tool that allows people to share and collaborate on um, Jupyter Notebooks and other ways to share code and analysis publicly. And so you can see, somebody has written an analysis on should, should I do a PhD, Another one, somebody else has uh, done an analysis on working mums from the American uh, Community Survey. And if I click on one of those, this is the should I do a PhD, sort of, they've written up um, their work and they've basically got uh, the conclusions, uh, here's the code, uh, they show some charts. And so rather than uh, launching a data set, you, you know, we think data.gov was a really great sort of version one of open data. And this is kind of a version two where people can share their code, their analysis on top of the data. And so it creates much more of a vibrant ecosystem around the data. Um, and so let's say I was interested in this, um, should I do a PhD analysis? I can hit fork. And what that allows me to do is get this person's code running in an environment where I can run it. And I can just go in and I can start editing the code. And once I'm, I'm finished, I hit run and I have a, 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 an improved, potentially improved version uh, of, of that person's code. And so it, it, it means that um, somebody isn't just, the, the data isn't just um, you know, being sent out and we, we don't see what people do with it, but rather uh, it, uh, the analysis is paired with the data in a, and the code is shared in a reproducible way so that people can sort of draw ideas from each other and, and build on top of what each other uh, have done. And you can see here that this particular piece of analysis has been forked 85 times. So 85 people have taken this should I, should I do a PhD analysis uh, and forked it and, and built on top of it. Um, 
Same goes for analysis of working mums. You know, what are their, um, what what is their marital status? What is their income levels? Uh, and and so this is this was a piece of analysis actually written by a working mum that was was kind of curious about the answer to the question. And you can see it's quite a quite a nicely done analysis. Lots of charts, lots of uh, visualizations, um, lots of descriptions, uh, gra maps showing. Um, Showing uh, the, the activity in different parts of the country, and and like a you know like a nice um, piece of analysis that ends with um, with a summary. Um, so what we do, uh, so so as I said, the, we've uh, started putting up some of the most interesting um, data sets from the U.S. Department of Commerce in in, uh, in partnership with Justin, uh, Jeff, and Terry. And what we do is the most interesting data sets that that get um, that get put up on Kaggle, we feature on a featured data sets page. So you can see here the American, the 2014 American Community Survey is currently on top. No surprise, some of the U.S. presidential election data is up. We've got brainwave data, uh, crime statistics. So uh, this is like a this page is a, a very vibrant place for people looking to do um, analysis uh, to, to come and kind of find interesting data sets. And so we feature the most interesting. We featured we've got 126 featured data sets so far. We've got many more that we don't feature. Um, and the idea is that once people discover kind of some interesting data sets from the US Census Bureau, for instance, they can click around and, and see other data, data sets. And just to give you a sense, we have around about uh, 125 to 150,000 uh, people visiting this page, unique people visiting this page every single month. Um, this is only, our open data platform is only about two months old. And so the, the big thing that we're doing here is um, not just launching data sets, data.gov is a really good start, but now we're moving from launching data sets into an empty room to into a very vibrant community where people can share their analysis, build off uh, each other's analysis. Um, I can say that uh, we pushed this out as, um, just, Justin pushed this out as a Medium post yesterday and it's, it's uh, had a really good reception. I'm not sure if Joy uh, is in the room, but we're talking to now talking to San Francisco about uh, doing something similar with their data sets as well as the World Economic Forum. And so I, I think this is, um, by, by partnering with the Department of Commerce, uh, we, we sort of made it okay for other uh, government organizations uh, to do the same. And I think that um, not only uh, do I expect very interesting analysis to be done with the Department of Commerce data, but I think this this project will show, show the way for other uh, other government uh, organizations that want to release their data into a very vibrant community and, and see what's getting done. Um, so I will stop there. I'm not sure if there are questions. I don't know if, um, what the format is, if we're taking questions. If we're taking questions, I'm not sure if I'll be able to hear, but we can try. <laughs> um, so that does pose a challenge, Anthony. We are going to have a discussion. Um, that was a terrific, and we're very excited about the idea that commerce data is being highlighted in that kind of a community, really. Very, tr really thoughtful uh, presentation. And uh, Kevin, I want to turn it over to you before we actually even get to discussion. There's so much to talk about before we get there. But um, Kevin, could you, sh could you give a little bit on what um, Socrata has done? So just to give you a quick side-by-side uh, -side comparison, this is what the data looks like when you go to the Census Bureau's website. So we make it available, um, and, but it's just, you know, you click on either a bulk download or an API call. Great. I'll take it from there. Thanks, Laura. So, um, so we took the, the small area health insurance estimate data from Census, which Laura just showed you is available as a download on Census's website. And we fed this into a platform that Socrata has been running for the last couple of years called the Open Data Network. Just as a, a quick background, Socrata works with about 1,000 or 1,100 government clients and a few non-government clients like the World Bank, the UN, and the European Commission, mostly around the first and the last mile of getting data online from these organizations. And so. Um, the, the Open Data Network is an initiative that we started a couple years ago, and it has um, 
one primary objective and two kinds of data in it. Uh, the objective is to try to make data more understandable from the lens of comparison. So if you want to compare one county to another or one state to another or one, uh, ki one kind of crime to another, the open data network does that quite nicely. And the two sources of data um, in the open data network are either uh, local data sets that are concatenated by the network on the back end, so we do some machine learning and some standardization and normalization to get the data into a consistent form, or in the case of this data set, it's a national data set that has some regional characteristics to it that we are able to present uh, in this context. So let me, let me dive in real quick and show you what we're doing. So again, we're taking uh, the, the data set. I'm going to actually go back to the start so that it makes a little bit more sense. And let me just compare uh, the health insurance rates for two different states. So I'm going to go ahead and enter Massachusetts as a starting point, and it knows it as a region. So by default, it pulls up some basic demographics. This is also coming from the Department of Census. But in this case, I want to go over and I want to look at health data, because this is where the health insurance data is. And so I can see over the last uh, 10 years or so that the, um, the rate of people who are uninsured is diminishing. That's fantastic. That's great. Well, that's, that's Massachusetts in isolation. So how might that compare to another state in the country? So let's go and pick a different part of the country, and let's go down to Georgia. And I will now compare Georgia, and it should zoom the map out a little bit, and give me a comparison of Massachusetts' uninsured rate compared to Georgia. And so all of the visualization, all the text, all of the, the graphics, all the charts are automatically generated. So even these paragraphs, like at the top here, it says um, the percentile without health insurance of Georgia was 22.2% for 18 to 64 year olds for all races, both sexes, da 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 da. The percent without health insurance in Massachusetts was only 4.5%. So here again, trying to make the data more usable, more useful, narrative is appropriate for some audiences, visualizations are appropriate for some audiences, APIs are appropriate for some audiences, and as you can see over here on the left, a little hard to see on the screen, but this little green button is an API button. So if you want to get programmatic access into the data, you can. So a real simple way to compare uh, uh, data between states. If I want to change the dimensionality on it, if I want to change the different year, or maybe I'm not interested in 18 to 64-year-olds, I'm interested in 50 to 64-year-olds, I can choose that. It'll automatically regenerate the charts and the maps, and I can see that information. So last thing I'll show you real quick, and this is all at the Open Data Network, it's live, you can play with it, is let me, instead of doing it at the state level, let's go in and do it at the county level. So let me pick, uh, let's pick Cobb County here in Georgia, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick another county up in Massachusetts. Let's pick Middlesex County. And so now, just like I could at the state level, I can compare it at the, at the local level. So you can do it by county or metropolitan statistical area. And so here, if I want to look at it, instead of in a, in a visual kind of heat map form or instead of a narrative form, I can see, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the population. Let me go to health. I can, I can see the uninsured rates at the local level as well. So it tells a pretty telling story. The, the blue line is Cobb County down in Georgia where currently the percentage of people who don't have any insurance is above 20%, you know, 22.5%, in fact, and in Massachusetts, you know, a much, much uh, lower rate than what we're seeing uh, in, in Georgia. So, great way to do comparisons. You can compare a multiple number of counties, multiple number of states uh, with each other. Um, I guess the last thing I would share with you is, it, it really, this is probably seven or eight years of work that went into building the engine that you see here today. But in terms of taking this data set and making it useful in this format, it took about three or four hours. So, so now that the foundation is there, taking any kind of new data set and feeding it into this comparison engine is pretty straightforward. Kevin, again, that, that's, uh, that's terrific. And, and uh, I guess my point before I open it up to uh, discussion is you can see how excited we are, right? This is an idea where we took the data, we're trying to curate it, make it public, raise the profile of it, you know, it, and you've, you'll see we've been releasing through Modi, Medium posts and posts and blogs and tweets. Here are some interesting data sets. Help us get it out there. But then you see companies stepping up and actually trying to solve the problems with user groups that they know exist. That's exciting. So join us. Join us. Take the public challenge. Find a solution or problem you care about. We'll help try and point you to the data sets. These are open public data sets. 
And my view is it's sort of like us saying, look, we have this road. Here's the road. Use the road to go deliver you know, food to the poor. Go do good. Use our, use our public asset for some public open interest good. And we'd love to try and talk about and show off uh, examples like what uh, Socrata, Kaggle, uh, and some of the other companies, Episoft, uh, Looker, and some of these companies are really doing to try and open it up for the, for the public good. So with that, uh, I think we actually have three discussants on this one, Daniel, Alan, and Colin. So maybe you all could start. So it's amazing stuff. It's a really tough problem to try to like get this stuff out there. Um, I just wanted to share a really quick story uh, from my experience at LinkedIn, which might be instructive. Um, so back in 2004, we had released the company. We were a little tiny company. No one had any idea what to do with it. So we would go out and we would tell people, hey, so you can solve any business problem using LinkedIn. And people would go, I don't believe you. Show me. And um, <coughs> we would say, well, give us a business problem. And then they would tell us the business problem. We would type some stuff into the search engine. We would get back a list of people, two people at the top of the list who are a friend of a friend who would be able to help you solve that problem. People would go, wow, that's amazing. I'm going to use this all the time. And of course, check in a month later. They've not used it. They are not interested in actually doing it. The lesson we took away from that was that people are not simply not creative. They need guidance in terms of what they're actually going to do. Okay, so you can't just give somebody a complex tool and expect them to come away with results that you're specifically trying to drive. So what that means is that your goal is really to get nonprofits using it more. You got to focus people's attention on solving problems for nonprofits. Because if you don't, you're going to get the real estate industry who sees immediate, sorry, no offense, the real estate industry who sees immediate value, they will come in and use it. But the people who do the nonprofit stuff won't. Um, it also means that the real way you're going to get out in front of a lot of people is you're not, you can't count on lots of nonprofits using the data directly. Because again, they just don't have the technical expertise to actually do that. So if your goal is 10,000 nonprofits using it, I picked the number out of the air, 10,000 nonprofits using it, the only way you get to 10,000 nonprofits is to somehow attract two or three teams to come in and build tools which are going to be incredibly self-evident to those nonprofits. They need to go, oh wow, it's a great fundraising tool, I'm gonna to use it. And one of those teams could be, say, from somebody building on top of the Salesforce stack, because a lot of nonprofits use Salesforce as a mechanism for doing their fundraising. So they're already turning to that environment. So my recommendation on this stuff would be understand that most people don't have the, aren't going to apply the creativity necessary to really wring out the APIs. You're not even gonna get to a tenth of a percent of the, of the possible value. So then the best thing to do is to pick the areas you really wanna focus in, the problems you think you should be solving with the data, set up challenges around those things to attract two or three people who will come in and try to solve the problem. Ideally, it's a problem that a lot of nonprofits, in this case, or a lot of lawyers, it's public defenders, or a lot of small, manu small to medium manufacturers, or whatever groups you actually care about. Put it in front of them and find that out. The only caveat I would add is make sure you're measuring the outcome the way you want to. Because if you're actually, so if your goal is to serve lots of nonprofits, that's great. But know that the number of API callers is going to be three, not 10,000. So make sure you're, you're measuring the end users. That'll require you to have some way of measuring through the people who are actually providing the solution. So really thoughtful. So lots of process there, honestly. Um, Colin? I'm in a similar place to, to, to Alan in terms of democratization. Because um, where I come from, we have a similar problem. And the, the only way to get around it, which we found, is that we had to use a medium that everyone else used, right? So we had to find a way to put it in an app that you could use on an Apple or an Android. So somebody had to gamify it and then put it on that. And so we've played with things like this in terms of energy. Everyone's interested in energy, everybody's interested in things like um, if I go to solar energy and I put these things on my house, you know, is it going to be useful? So if there's data around how many people would do that or other people that are doing it a, a purpose and you have a small app that you could download and figure that out, it'll happen. So I, I like the notion of finding one or two things that are valuable to people and we could gamify to do it. We could set up a challenge and say we do a hackathon you know, based on, this is a beautiful interface that, that, you know, 
Socrata has or Kaggle has and say, let's, let's have a hackathon or some type of gamification. You do 10, the top 10 people we give something to. We will help you do that. I'll volunteer to help you do that. <laughs> and then based upon that, we try to see if we get some apps that people can use. Because people, it's very hard to use these tools unless you use these tools. You know, but I think it, it, it's something that's worth well enough for us to have to do because I think we have to get that equality going. So that's one suggestion I'll have. I think beautiful tools. I think that solves half the problem right there. Yeah, um, so we had a couple conversations about this over lunch too. And um, I think this, you know, picking up maybe on also some of what, um, you know, the conversation we had before with Dana, I think, you know, there's a, Couple of questions here. One is, you know, direct versus indirect impact, and ultimately, I think at some point you have to, as an organization, or even within maybe a specific mission, decide. You know, we're just focusing on direct impact, or we're focusing on indirect impact, or we're focusing on. Um, you know, it's this question. You know, are we are we building the highways? Or are we building the tools to build the highways? Or are we really just caring about building an economy, right? And if you know, depending on what your actual goal is, you're going to do different things, and so. There's not a right answer, but I think at some point you have to say, okay, we're, we're going to pick this. We know there's other things we could pick, but this is the one we're going to pick. And then at least you can be very focused on you know, deciding, well, okay, this is where we need feedback. Because I think on a lot of these um, challenges, you'll always, you know, I if, you, if you don't kind of commit to something, you'll end up kind of coming back to these high-level questions all the time, which is, you know, do we care about this or do we care about this one? And if you say, okay, this is the one we're going to care about, then let's just do that as well as we can and execute on it. At least in the short term, I think that will be a, a challenge for CDS is to just pick what it wants its mission to be and then you know, use that to define its mission. So the, the, uh, I, th I think that's a great point too. And so on this one, I think this is uh, part, but we're hoping smaller part of what CDS has to do and larger part of what private sector does because the data is already there. It's an asset that's already there. We're trying to highlight, elevate, and get the tools. But I, I take both of your points. And honestly, Colin, one of, the, one of the points that's inherent in what you were saying that is a really critical issue is who are we democratizing to? Are we trying to say every human being in the United States needs to be able to access and use data? Right now, that's not our goal because I don't think it's a realistic use of it. What we're trying to think about is sophistic somewhat sophisticated users that might be able to bring insights in the data that might have leverage for others. So I think the points both of you are making are kind of going to that issue, right? So in some ways, when we say, can we get small and medium-sized entities tools, scalable tools that they can actually bring insights into ACS data, for example, what I'm thinking about there, what we've been thinking about there is sophisticated Excel users, I don't mean to pick a particular company, but sophisticated Excel users in a medium-sized company who is thinking about where am I gonna be marketing, who are my client base, that kind of thing. We want them to be able to have a tool that's built on ACS data because honestly, that's what the big companies are doing, right? That's what sophisticated users of the data is doing. And we need help doing that, right? And there are companies that know how to do that and we have the data available. So we're hoping that we can get uptake on issues like that. For me, with the tools, like the, the, the real opportunity for me out of a Kaggle is that the experts will bring insight and answer questions that then gets public profile, right? Or that advocacy groups where they might not be able to see insights on how they ought to be advocating for their own uh, users that expert data scientists who are part of the Kaggle community might bring the insights to them and then they can use the insights without having to have done the work. To me, something like a tool that Socrata builds, if I have policymakers around the government or in the nonprofit or other space, the idea that when they're, I mean, health insurance is a big issue. The idea that you can easily bring insights and visualizations to that we need to market these things. We need to show what you, the insights that you can build on say he data, right? And the idea that it's accessible is exciting to me. But there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of challenges. I agree that there's a lot to do. There's also inspiration here. You know, there's real inspiration that, look, if I would have told you two years ago, we're sitting in an office, I mean, in a meeting like this, and you're seeing the tools, both internal and external, that are being inspired and driven by the private sector and inspired and driven by our team, um, we'd be giving each other high fives, right? That's great, and we have more to do, but this is a good start, and I'm hoping it inspires others to step up and help us. Are there others that wanna jump in on this conversation before we? 
Vadim and Stan, sorry. Uh, Laura, you mentioned open source, and I think you didn't pay enough attention to it. In general, when you're talking about bringing more community, bring uh, public or private company to help you, I think open source is really a great tool for you to go in forward. Uh, some caution on the open source, it's very easy to kick off and create the project on GitHub or pick whatever source. It's very hard to maintain open source community. My high recommendation would be contact people. The good part about open source, those are people who would want, who had the same inspiration and would want to help you. So a lot of people who started open source and Apache project comes into mind, <coughs> would love to help you, would love to guide you. So I would recommend to reach out maybe just speaking on Apache project to founders of Apache project and say, can you spend an hour with us trying to guide us the right way? Or reaching out to the open source community in general saying, would there be a few people who can help us maintain open source community? Not maintaining the tool, go on GitHub, there are enough open source tools, but actually the people who can maintain open source community. The same goes with Kaggle. It's great, uh, data sets are there, but you need to maintain that open source open data, open whatever, some kind of open community of the data scientists, because at the end, you will have people, same with Kaggle, uh, the data scientists want to do the data for two reasons. Number one, it's a social, they want to be socially good and they want to help whatever they believe they want to help, or they want to show off their skill to the future employee, to the future academia, to the future, I don't know, spouses, uh, how great they are. <laughs> The same goes with the open source. With us, uh, we will have the same uh, reasoning why people would write, want to write the code, but keeping that community is a lot of work. Uh, private company, hire people, hire team to keep the open source community running. Uh, there is new inner source, which is very similar, and a lot of effort spent on it, so just spend your effort. And second, just very small one, when you're talking about measures, and it was uh, mentioned, it's great that you show here number of API calls, and you pointed out that 12% of API calls were made by real estate community. But then you start talking about number of nonprofits. None of those numbers, the number of API calls does not tell you how many nonprofits actually were using it. Because it's possible that real estate community making an API call on each and every lookup of the uh, house number, whereas a nonprofit is making call twice a year when they want to do fundraising. Would be very num different number of API calls. So we can, yeah, it's great that, you know, we know a number of API calls, it doesn't tell how, you know, how many actual players are there. So having, as Colin Allen was telling, having the right measure is great, but also make sure that you're measuring the right thing. Yeah, and my, I, I'm glad you made that point, that was going to be my first point, was that indirect usage versus direct usage, that if we're half of whatever the API calls to census data, <coughs> I, I guess let's be clear, prior to 10 years ago, the commercial sector has never had any problem accessing real estate data or probably census data. They could, they have the resource to go get that. Um, the people who are primarily using our data are consumers who didn't have any access to it before, or the derivative products, once we put a, a census data point into a data set with negative equity, the people that consume that are primary consumers, are researchers, academics, government um, folks, government industry, uh, government sector, or the media. Um, so it's not other commercial users. It's, it's those communities, and those would be non-commercial uses primarily. Um, so you would think, you know, I think properly thought of you could, if you saw a dot-com consuming a uh, you know, a web key registered to a dot com consuming the data, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not making its way into a non-commercial use. It, it probably is. Um, the other thing I, I would say, just piggybacking on um, Alan's point about kind of accessing these things, I do think that, I mean, generally it's hard to presuppose, you know, all the applications that people are gonna use the data for and you can't really build for those. But I do think uh, demonstrating how it's used is really useful. And I would just say that from our perspective, because we have a lot of APIs that either service our own data or that service data that uses commerce, commerce data blended in with it. And things that have been effective for us in order to spread that word of things like, um, you know, almost every organization, nonprofits do it, journalists do it. Journalists have a rich community of kind of data journalists and they get together, you know, several times a year 
and you can get in front of those groups and say, hey, here's, you know, here's some R code or Python code that, you know, data journalists are a bunch of, you know, data scientists that work for large or small journalist communities, and you can show them, hey, here are three examples of how you pull data in to tell a story about negative equity or about home prices or about anything else that would be census-related, um, and that's really effective because then they can, you're talking directly to the people and giving them a few examples of things that were done, and then they can go from there. I think we're going to move on to our next session. Um, we're now running late, so um, why don't we start the future of CDAC discussion. Uh, Dan, I think you're going to facilitate with CJ that discussion. We're going to have to stop for open comment at our public comment at 4 o'clock. Um, and we'll, if we have comments, we'll entertain them. If not, we'll go right back into that discussion. And let, let me pause by saying thank you. Those were really all along the board, really thoughtful comments. And we, this is one on which, honestly, CDAC members, you can help, right? This is, there's actionable stuff here that you might help us amplify or think differently about, and we're going to have to figure out how we uh, actually act on some of the advice we got here today. But thank you very much. Very thoughtful. Great. Um, so the point of this last um, discussion item is really to open up um, a conversation about the future of CDAC. And so you see there's two questions here um, on the agenda. Uh, what should the composition of CDAC look like? And any concrete advice on how the Department of Commerce should interact with the CDAC? And, um, what we should be asking CDAC to do for us. So on the, that latter question, I mean, some of this is kind of feedback on the agenda. Um, also, I should, we should know at the beginning, Kim's not here, but she did provide um, quite a bit of feedback on the agenda itself, and um, it's been helpful along the way. So, I mean, we've tried to shift the agenda to have some of these, you know, the, the lightning talks to have more direct interaction. Um, you know, uh, Justin and, and Burton did a lot of legwork, and, and Tanya, um, early on to make sure that we could have these conversations ahead of time in some of these briefings. So first, uh, just some feedback on that would be useful, I think, as we plan the next meeting on what you liked about this meeting, what you didn't, what we could do better. Um, but then also this, you know, t both to this last conversation we were having about um, basically where we should have these partnerships. You know, should we be looking to invite new CDAC members, maybe particularly with companies where it makes sense to have partnerships and involve them in these conversations? Or just in general, are there certain skills on, you know, that it would be good to have the CDAC um, to have that maybe we don't have or we need more of, and maybe there's some thoughts there. Um, so that's the point of this discussion. I'll maybe stop here. See, I don't know if CJ, you want to add anything, or um, I also invited Stan to um, weigh in on this too. I'll, I'll just bring one thing up that is a good segue. I, I think the, there's really three questions there, and I think the third question is really the one that matters because it then informs the other two before that. Um, and that is, is that, um, you know, what should the a CDAC be asking, uh, uh, or uh, should we be asking the CDAC to do for us? And I think that um, you are asking. Uh, I've got a list of things today alone, and I, I think it goes to some of the work that Kim and, uh, and Daniel did earlier, um, of things that you are asking. And when looking at those things, one of the things I notice is there's uh, both high-level advisory council types of things, and then very hands-on, um, active, what I would call dive deep uh, types of things that, you know, if given the chance, um, I or potentially someone else with different skills would like to just jump in and work on. Um, we, we talked earlier about uh, security, and one of the things, that's my background, I'm a CISO type, um, and w when we were talking about that, one of the things that struck me is we're not talking necessarily about security, we're talking about one part of the pillars, there's three pillars to security, um, and the one part we're talking about is integrity. There are solutions for integrity of data that could be used in this case. Um, it's not something you sit here and advise on, it's actually you go and you know, look at the use cases and do actual work on that. Um, so I think in um, deciding the future of CDAC or the types of members, whether it's in CDAC or some uh, you know, uh, other part of uh, the group, um, we may look at uh, trying to make sure that we're able to um, dive a little deeper, get, get our hands uh, dirty, roll up our sleeves, if you will. This carries on to a lot of the other things we talked about. I mean, marketing, sharing our social networks, that's a high-level thing, it's easy. Uh, when I say easy, it's uh, a lot easier for us than rolling up our sleeves. Um, I think uh, hiring engineering staff was one of the, one of the asks. Um, and from that standpoint, uh, it's both high and low level. It's one of those things where we can assist from the standpoint of trying to send the right people this way. 
And there's the other side of that where maybe a little bit more diving deep. Um, there are reserve-like programs. I know it's a little bit of a stretch, but um, many companies have, you know, if you go on reserve duty for the military, they continue to pay you and you will work for the military. Um, leaves of absences and things like that are possibilities in many companies. And that's something that we should open up or start to, uh, to look at is possibilities of means by which to get the roll up your sleeves, do more than what you can do in a day or two, uh, once a quarter, um, whether from us or from other uh, members that, uh, that we bring on. Um, so these are just some of the things that I looked at. Uh, metrics is another one. You can dive deep into metrics. Right now, um, some of the challenges that we have in uh, being able to deal with metrics is that you lose visibility at certain points, mostly because of privacy issues, at least from a, uh, a data um, from a provider like AWS. Uh, we, you know, if a company is storing data on our platform, um, we're not going to, uh, to look at the data. And therefore, I don't know if you've made changes and then passed it on and what the ecosystem is doing with it. That doesn't mean that if you have a, uh, a piece of data or some data that you're actually placing on the platform that's uh, part of a free data sets program and one of your terms of service to use that data isn't to then get feedback from that user that takes it. This is something I think that from a high level we could work to come up with those agreements to put those in place so it's a re requirement of, of using the data that you provide this information. So there is some, some things that can be done in that space. So those are just things that, you know, that I was tracking throughout the day. So. Um, yeah, I, um, I had a little less time to think about kind of the overall thoughts here, but I guess some things that do occur to me are um, particularly kind of thinking about CDAC itself and kind of the future um, is, I, I mean, I guess it seems like the CDAC has primarily thus far been used kind of in three different ways. One is um, to help with marketing itself of kind of what the, what's available from, from commerce different data sets and help getting the word out about that and um, raising visibility in an area that needs more visibility um, given to it. I think the other is helping to um, inform, uh, you know, bring outside thoughts about what people should be doing in this space and particularly perhaps there has been a lot of focus on the CDS itself um, and how what might you know what role it could serve um, and then I think the kind of the third component has been um, out of the things that commerce writ large or CDS needs help on are there ways that we can kind of help um, provide you know assistance or insight into those particular areas um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that seems really, uh, those three functions seem like they're really important and they seem like they should be going forward as well. And uh, I don't think, um, I guess I'm, I'm not sure there needs to be a different allocation across those three areas. Um, both are very important. I do think maybe, um, you know, in the extension of CDAC, it might be useful to think about it more along those three lines and think about it more like almost you would think about corporate governance where you know, the board has a very similar uh, board of directors for a corporation has a very similar function where its job is to kind of bring stuff into management that it might not be thinking about and kind of review kind of strategic priorities and see whether give insight and feedback on that. And also, the purpose of the board is to um, you know, assist the company, the management of the company when problems come up, how do you resolve those problems and can, can the board use their networks to help resolve those problems? So, um, you know, for example, kind of looking at, you know, Jeff and Jeff, the, you know, the 2017 priorities, you know, there, I could imagine a firmer attachment between what's happening internally about, you know, to Alan's point or question about, you know, how did you determine those priorities? It would be perhaps interesting to have seen, uh, you know, the full list of things you could be doing and for us to provide some assistance for things that maybe this is an under-invested area um, and to be more helpful to you guys. Although, you know, again, if you don't need that type of help, then you shouldn't have us do it. Um, and I, I guess I, I do think, you know, this is probably a question for Justin Moore, I, I do think that it does feel like there's a pretty decent flow of information from areas where you need our help. Um, I feel like that's an, an open area where, you you know, Justin's very um, transparent about we could really use your help in these different areas and that's really helpful. 
Um, so I will, you know, I already mentioned, I think, during the, during your, the 2017 presentation, Jeff, kind of a couple areas where it does feel like we could, there's a bit more meta stuff that either CDS or CDAC or commerce itself could help with, and those are kind of areas around discovery and search problems. And by search, I mean the economic sense of search, not search engine, but the problem that you, we've got a, you've got a multiplex problem. You've got a bunch of providers providing data and you've got a bunch of people looking for data and there's not yet uh, become a marketplace where those people can find each other very easily. Um, and solving that would be, you know, really useful. And I do think that if, and there have been a lot of attempts at that, but if we could solve that, then that's fantastic. And that's a really, really weighty problem that's been solved. Um, and the other one is um, kind of this, how to harness long tail communities. I was very interested in, um, uh, in Anthony's presentation about you know, his web, the, what they're doing there on Kaggle, where that does introduce the prospect of providing some place where long tail communities, and, and what Kevin's doing as well with Open Data Network, where you know, does that create some kind of campfire around which people can gather for people who use you know, some fisheries API, and then they get their community now form where they can say, hey, you know, I, I'd love this extra data point, or could you, you know, expose this that way? And that's the kind of thing where I feel like um, commerce has done a really good job on these large user groups for, you know, things like census data products overall, but there's probably a long tail where they can't capture that as effectively, and I'd love to try to figure out a way to make more traction there. So I, I do want to react to one of the points, but I think I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause so that Burton can call right. for the public. That's comments. right, and, and uh, we have no formal sign-ups. I will ask if anyone in the room wants to say anything. Um, I'm not seeing anyone, and I think on Twitter we haven't seen a lot of or any specific comments or questions. So we're going to just say that we're open for the next 15 minutes. If somebody wants to comment, stand up and let us know one way or another. But I think we can just go plow ahead with the discussion. Uh, I just want to react to one point because to, to your question, Stan, I would tell you, I think all of us feel when we've asked for help or a reaction, we're getting help and reactions. I mean, the fact that Dan uh, and Kim were able to get you all that have very busy schedules to listen to these pre-briefs, which I hope were helpful. We were trying to give deeper dives and more information because you can tell our, our schedule's packed. Uh, and by the way, I did none of the wrangling. It was really, I, I, my goal was to have that done and it was really Burton and Tanja that drove that process. But, um, but I feel, we feel supported when we need it, really. Um, I, I would tell you, because we, while we have talent and folks focused on the marketing piece, I mean, literally, you all probably know people that have a million or two million or 20 million LinkedIn followers. I, I be believe at least one member of this table is able to do that. And uh, we have other folks that know uh, people that have 20 million Twitter followers and others, right? I, I need, we need to leverage those networks. I mean, I'm being quite transparent, which is I have 5,000 and the secretary and others have quite a bit more than I do, but 20 million, we need visibility on that level. And I need advice from people who know how to leverage those networks, right? So. Um, we're trying to be pretty operational about it. It doesn't need to be for everything, but when we, for example, are branding a particular part of what we're doing and trying to elevate data sets, for example, that we're doing that, or the hiring efforts, you know, you, got, you all have the ability to pump it out to networks and it matters, it crazily matters. We get reactions every time one of you guys uh, actually like or forward it. Believe it or not, it's really, it matters. So. Uh, we're pretty operational about it. I would tell you that would be a place that if you guys can help us get to the people that have all the uh, all of the things and they just look at it. They don't have to like it if they don't like it, but most of the people that we show what we're doing are interested in it and think it's an interesting approach, And but they just don't notice it right now. So that would be a, a particular, very operational thing that we could use help on, you know, on, on that front. I wonder uh, if we can go um, out of order a little bit. Uh, I saw Ian, you were up first, but Phil, maybe we can go to you, and then I also want to ask Jeff. Jeff, since you're kind of, in, in some ways, the, the transition guy, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about our next meeting. You're going to be one of the kind of key continuity points here. Maybe you can give also a little bit of a reaction of what would be useful from your perspective, what you would like to see um, coming out of CDAC. Um, and then I'd like to ask that same question of 
of Ian and Justin, your kind of maybe outgoing advice. But I'd like Jeff to go first. Uh, so <laughs> in case there's a disagreement there. But Bill, why don't we start with you? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I, you know, we've, we've talked on a number of occasions about the concept of an ecosystem. And I, I noticed it doesn't, didn't end up in the memorandum for Secretary Pritzker as one of the key items. And yet it seems to flow more and more through all of our discussions. And Stan just commented, I took your comments as building an ecosystem, the long tail of the, that ecosystem. And I'm just wondering if we need to somehow raise the prominence or codify that in some better way than just sort of letting it flow um, sort of diffusely through all of our discussions. And I want to I want to add, uh, Alan. I, I took some notes here. So Alan made a comment earlier where he gave three perfect examples of things you can do to actually implement that, not just kind of a, a broad brush. And I could go back and find those, and maybe you remember them. Uh, yep. <laughs> I think I wrote them down. Yeah, I, I I thought he had some great specific um, in, ter in terms of in terms of marketing, in terms, in, of, in terms of things you would actually do to accomplish that. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm happy to follow up on yeah. that. Yeah. All that. Um, well, I think um, from CDAC, uh, I, I do agree that there is this meta layer effort that, that's absolutely necessary. And as I'm moving fr uh, away from day to day t technical management to more of like how all the modules fit together in uh, this enterprise, um, I, I do believe that um, it would be good to have more governance advice on. Um, for all matters of governance, from data, like data governance issues to um, project governance, um, how to, like, what are appropriate ways of thinking about how a project will move in the long term uh, and how it fits in to the greater scheme of things. Um, gut, gut checking would be great. Uh, so I, I would probably follow up with a lot more of you to get advice like Kati with, um, with a visualization and engineering to issues. Um, Colin and uh, the DM on, on uh, machine learning with what weather certainly uh, as we uh, partner with Ed Kearns down the few, uh, down the line, um, economic data. So like, you you name it like there's there's a lot of opportunities to gut check and I I will um, make it a personal note and also to put it into my, my calendar to um, make sure to check in uh, more regularly uh, so that when we move along towards something that is really a um, an ongoing uh, organic partnership. Great, thanks. Ian. Sure. Uh, this is a bit of a farewell, and it's a, in a way a, an elephant in the room that it hasn't been discussed more readily in my opinion. Um, I have always treated the CDAC in my own personal mind as a board of advisors that to uh, Stan and uh, CJ's point. That's my background, and so I've always had that instinct, a bit of that fingerprint, I think, on the agenda over the past few sessions. Uh, and if this was a, a, a real board meeting, uh, probably the headline would have been, you're going to have a new CEO in a few months. Probably would have dominated the entire discussion. That's not necessarily me or Justin or Austin, who almost certainly will not be at this table next time. Uh, Jeff, Br uh, Brad, and Burton will, uh, but also the new Secretary of Commerce, which in a way is, I mean, legally on some level, the direct advisor to this council, a recipient of the, the advice from this council. And so um, I would say that um, the most important given that that's one of the most challenging risks that would come up if I was with a company presenting to my board. Um, I think that is also your greatest, ooh, greatest opportunity uh, for how the CDAC can have an impact on data going forward uh, is uh, we've set up enough of the institutional structures to, uh, to continue on, carry on, but it's really gonna be how well are you gonna connect with the next batch of folks that take these seats? And it is a chicken and the egg conversation. Uh, I mean, hypothetically, the next Secretary of Commerce could not care about data, it's kind of absurd, but, uh, and we've done some things, by the way, to even, even on that hypothetical, uh, ensure the data is elevated appropriately, um, but it's possible. So that kind of impacts our mission, right? It's possible to, to define what the priorities would be for advice, operational strategy, and so forth. Um, and again, I don't expect a massive disruption. Uh, we have acting roles and, you know, folks within the, the bureaus and institutions are really, I think, really well cemented. Um, but to some extent, leadership matters, right? To, on some level, whoever's at the helm can drive the prioritization and direction. That's what we want in this democratic transition of political leadership. That's the structure. And so the, the re reflection I would share, given that this is probably the last time I will uh, be at a table like this, 
uh, is one of thank you, uh, one of uh, uh, immense gratitude, uh, of, of deep and sincere um, just recognition of your support and how we wouldn't be here without you all, uh, and also a just the real uh, beg and challenge uh, that you can continue uh, your fantastic service with whoever is going to be here next. Uh, I will also just end with a little side point. I'm not quite done yet. Um, and as uh, uh, Penny Pritzker talks about running through the tape, which is a triathlon athlete, right? So of course, just running through the tape. Uh, for the time that remains for me, uh, I will be, one of the things I'll be focused on with uh, my own few months is to recruit more folks into the Commerce Data Service, NTIS, the career staff, to again, just build up our capacity so that folks like Jeff and Brad and Burton and all the great innovators here can continue carrying through this great activity regardless of the political transition, almost ignoring it in a way. Um, but uh, you know, that being my own focus, I will, after a brief call, if you know any folks that want to uh, you know, do a tour of duty, we're talking about some of those fellowships, I will be following up here very shortly uh, to, uh, to explore a bit of what that can actually mean and with our fantastic hiring and procurement mechanisms and partnering mechanisms that we've explored at these councils, I'm very excited for our ability to leverage those and make some stuff happen before my own clock expires. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks so much for this fantastic opportunity to work together. Justin, you want to? So I'll <clears throat> let me let me say from coming in, uh, you know, a little less than a year ago, and I, I had the opportunity to work with other advisory councils in some prior roles I've had. This is this is one of those groups that I I can tell you has been really meaningful in a terrific way, and and in a lot of operational ways, I don't think you uh, you could have visibility to how much your advice has mattered. Really, it's guided the strategic vision. It's helped us operationally. We can come in and get very specific feedback. I, we, when we've asked for help, people respond. It, it really matters. It has mattered to where we are. So all I can say is the same, which is thank you. I'm in a different place, I think, because of when, when you have something that's succeeding, it's self-evident that it should continue in a meaningful way. That's the way I see it. And I think you will hear around the building how meaningful this, this particular council has been. And so I, I feel like we've got real wind in our sails for what you're going to have no matter who is here, period. Because you have a career team all across the board that is very engaged with you and feels like they can call you. That's what I want, right? That you have Jeff and Brad and Burton and we're making sure, my goal in life is to make sure they are in every process that I can imagine, elevated and ready to go. And I've got career team leaders that also know you, like uh, Ed and Tom, you know them by name, okay? And the goal of having lunches where you feel connectivity is that it's irrelevant at this point that I'm here. That's my goal. Before I leave, you should feel like we're, we're off and running. So I'm, I'm, I feel good that we have done the right Thing by this council. I hope you feel inspired. And there are a lot of people that are not here who have also, I mean, who are members of the council who have been incredibly helpful to us as we've been getting this going. Um, if you ask me what do we need to change, it's really, I mean, I'm, I'm a person that's pretty upfront, like this is meaningful or that is not. We get through these agendas and I feel like we haven't had enough time and most of them to cover it. That's usually a pretty good sign. Like I feel like we could add a few more levels of conversation. Um, and I think we need to do better at trying to ask for help more specifically, more regularly, so that it's not, if I were to tell you the one thing we could do to really, I think, leverage us better is to ask more regularly for input and help and give you better knowledge. I mean, I think we're trying to send you our medium posts, our blogs, give you visibility into the things. We, we'll always do briefings, but I think a lot of it becomes more meaningful mutually where it's specific and actionable and I need help with this. And I think if we can set that up with our teams, which yeah. I have every confidence we will, um, this will even be better, you know, in the iteration you afterwards. Know, so. Justin, I'd like to speak to that point and touch on something Jeff said too. Um, I know we tried this. I want to come back and try it again. The possibility of pulling smaller groups of people within the CDAC together virtually to explore one question, one project, one idea, so that we, we don't have to, I mean, we'll still have the meetings for sure, but we could also, you know, on, on November 13th, come together for an hour virtually and, and have a conversation about a particular issue or challenge that Jeff and his team are facing or that, that Ed Kearns is, is struggling with at NOAA, you know, and bring 
people who want to come, the right people together, to have that conversation and do that more periodically so that we're engaging you on a rolling basis in between the meetings. We will come back and, and, and try to make that process work effectively. One of the things that I mentioned, I think, to a couple people during the day today was just, I think we've gotten to know each other really well over the last months of working together. And I think we're just, yeah, the, we've got the wind in our sails. And I think it's really good for us to be able to now, we, we understand what's going on better. We, and we can, we're in a better position to help. We're in a better position to help each other understand what's going on. And I think it would be great for us to be able to take on, the, you know, it, a rolling agenda. Austin. Oh. Sorry, Austin. Just one, one quick thing. Uh, oh, yeah, two quick things. One, uh, I agree with Justin uh, in terms of we've got a lot of momentum on what we're doing. But to Ian's point, it will be helpful if you guys can uh, figure out the appropriate way right, with our career staff when the new team comes in to, to have conversations with them so they hear from, directly from you because you guys bring a lot of weight to those discussions. So I think that's great. I just want to take a real quick uh, point of privilege. Um, as, as everyone knows, a good leader lifts up those kind of beneath them. But I want to turn the spotlight to our leader, Justin, um, who I think has really just played such a, a major role uh, running the three ring circus that is ESA. And this meeting, I think, has been the tightest of the five that we've done. And it's because of the touch that he puts on it. And, uh, you know, he drives us really hard. And uh, he expects a lot, but he's, he's a great boss and a nice guy. And so I just wanted to give him a little, little clap for. Is this good? No, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll take my comment. It's pretty tactical, but I'll talk to Burton afterwards. So it's just about communication. And uh, to Justin's point about how we could help you guys more with leveraging our network. So I'll talk to you afterwards about that. Anyone else? Otherwise, we'll do the first meeting and end early. <laughs> we did a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> we, you want more on the agenda for the next one? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. I think before, we can. You, before you adjourn, oh. I just want to say thank you again. Absolutely terrific session. I appreciate the help. We all appreciate the help. I can tell you the secretary really values this and has talked about it. I can, you can tell how engaged she is, but I, I think we've also set this particular line of action up for something you guys are gonna be proud to be involved in. So, you know, please keep helping. It's, it's important. Yeah, we're gonna keep this moving forward. So um, thank you all very much and let's formally adjourn the meeting. And thank you all, have a good safe trip home and a good weekend. Thank you. You know what's funny?